chapter twenty of a popular history of the art of music from the earliest times until the present by w s b matthews this librivox recording is in the public domain the progress of oratorio part one as already noticed in the previous chapter the oratorio had its origin at the same time as opera both being phases of the stilo rappresentativo or the effort to afford musical utterance to dramatic poetry at first merely a solemn and impressive utterance later as the possibilities of the new phase of art unfolded themselves a descriptive utterance in which the music colored and emphasized the moods of the text and the situation the idea of oratorio was not new all through the middle ages they seem to have had miracle plays in the church as accessories of the less solemn services and as means of instruction in biblical history the medieval plays had very plain music which followed entirely the cadences of the plain song and made no attempt at representing the dramatic situation or the feelings growing out of it all that the music sought to do was to afford a decorous utterance having in it from association with the cadence of the music of the church something impressive yet not in any manner growing out of the drama to which it was set the florentine music drama was something entirely different from this or soon became so and in oratorio this was just as apparent as in opera although the opportunities of vocal display were not made so much of the modern oratorio exists in two types the dramatic cantata of which the form and general idea were established by carissimi and the church cantata which differed from the italian type chiefly in being of a more exclusively religious character and of having occasional opportunities for the congregation to join in a chorale the former of these types was established by giacomo carissimi sixteen o four sixteen seventy four who was born near rome and held his first musical position as director at assisi but presently obtained the directorship at the church of st apollinaris in rome where he served all the remainder of his long and active life without having been a genius of the first order it was carissimi's good fortune to exercise an important influence upon the course of musical progress particularly in the direction of oratorio in which all the more attractive elements came from his innovations carissimi was a prolific composer having constant occasion for new and pleasing attractions for the musical service of the rich and important jesuit church where he held his appointment these compositions are of every sort but cantatas form the larger portion consisting of passages of scripture set in consecutive form with due alternation of solo and chorus in a style at once pleasing and dramatically appropriate the majority of his compositions have been lost many of them going to the waste-paper baskets when the jesuits were suppressed enough remain however to indicate the interest and importance of his work moreover there is another curious commentary upon the value of his music in the fact that handel took twelve measures well nigh bodily out of one of the choruses in carissimis jephtha and incorporated them in here jacob's god in his own samson mr hula gives an excellent aria from this work but it is too long for insertion here the more important of carissimi's innovations were in the direction of pleasing qualities in the accompaniments and agreeable rhythms he was teacher of several of the most important italian musicians of the following generation among them being bassani cesti bononcini and alessandro scarlatti part two the other type of oratorio received important assistance toward full realization in germany at the hands of matheson as already noticed and from those of heinrich schutz fifteen eighty five sixteen seventy two who after preliminary studies in italy where he acquired the italian representative style from gabrielli in venice in sixteen o nine three years later returned to germany and in sixteen fifteen was appointed chapel master 
to the elector of saxony a position which he held with slight interruptions until his death at the advanced age already indicated notice has already been taken in a former chapter of his appearance in the field of opera composition in setting new music to rinuccini's daphne on account of german words being incapable of adaptation to the music of peri but before this he had demonstrated his versatility and talent in the production of certain settings of the psalms of david in the form of motets for eight and more voices in his second work an oratorio upon the resurrection he shows the same striving after a freer dramatic expression his great work symphonie sacre consists of cantatas for voices with instrumental accompaniments in which the instrumental part shows serious effort after dramatic coloration the first of his works in this style was the last seven words sixteen forty five which contained the distinguishing marks of all the later passion music it consisted of a narrative reflections chorales and the words of the lord himself many years later he produced his great passions sixteen sixty five sixteen sixty six and in these he accomplishes as much of the dramatic expression as possible by means of choruses which are highly dramatic in style and very spirited the voluminous works of this master have now been reprinted and some of them possess a degree of interest warranting their occasional presentation schutz occupies an intermediate position between the masters of the old school with whom the traditions of ecclesiastical modes governed everything and those who have passed entirely beyond them and polyphony into modern monody the music of schutz is always polyphonic but there is much of dramatic feeling in it nevertheless he was one of those clear-headed practical masters who without being geniuses in the intuitive sense nevertheless contrived to impress themselves upon the subsequent activity in their province chiefly through their sagacity in seizing new forms and bringing them into practicable perfection into the forms of the passion as schutz created it bach poured the wealth of his devotion and his inspiration so later beethoven put into the symphony form created to his hand by the somewhat mechanical haydn the amplitude of his musical imagination which but for this preparatory work of the lesser master would have been driven to the creation of entirely new forms for his thoughts not only hampering the composer but which would have been equally unfavorable to his success depriving him of an audience prepared to appreciate the greatness of the new genius through their previous training in the same general style end of chapter twenty chapter twenty one of a popular history of the art of music from the earliest times until the present by w s b matthews this librivox recording is in the public domain beginnings of instrumental music the beginning of instrumental music apart from vocal is to be found in the latter part of the sixteenth century but the main advances toward freedom of style and spontaneous expression were made during the seventeenth and as we might expect originally in italy where the art of music was more prosperous and incitations to advance were more numerous and diversified upon all accounts the honor of the first place in the account of this part of the development of modern music is to be given to andreas gabrielli fifteen ten fifteen eighty six who from a singing boy in the choir of st mark's under the direction of adrian villert succeeded in fifteen sixty six to the position of second organist where his fame attracted many pupils among the numberless compositions emanating from his pen were masses madrigals and a considerable variety of pieces for organ alone bearing the names of canzone ricerari concerte and five voice sonatas the later printed in fifteen eighty six being perhaps the earliest application of this now celebrated name to instrumental compositions the pieces of gabrielli were mostly imitations of compositions for the voice fugal in style and with never among them a melody fully carried out 
among the pupils of andreas gabrelli were hans leo hassler the celebrated dresden composer and svelink the equally celebrated netherlandish organist of whom there is more to be said the beginning of organ composition and the higher art of organ playing made by andreas gabrielli was carried much further by his nephew and pupil giovanni gabrielli fifteen fifty seven to sixteen twelve who born and trained at venice early entered the service of its great cathedral and in fifteen eighty five succeeded claudio merulo as first organist of the same as a composer giovanni gabrielli continued the double chorus effects which had been such a feature of the st mark's liturgy since the time of villert but especially he distinguished himself in improving the style of organ playing and in giving it a freedom and almost secular character somewhat surprising for the times a large number of his compositions of all sorts are in print very many for voices or instruments the alternative affords a good idea of the subordinate position still occupied by instrumental music but a beginning had been made which later was to lead to great things the art of organ playing found its next great exponents in holland and germany all of them having been pupils of the venetian master the most celebrated of these considered purely as an organist was jean pieter schwelling fifteen sixty sixteen twenty one who was born at deventer in holland and died at amsterdam he was more celebrated as a performer and improviser than for the instrumental pieces he published among his pupils was the celebrated samuel scheidt fifteen eighty seven sixteen fifty four organist at hall who is memorable as the first who made artistic use of the chorale scheidt is also famous as the author of a book upon organ tabulature or the notation for organ which in germany at this period was different from that of the piano and in fact much resembled the tabulature for the lute from which it was derived it consists of a combination of lines and signs by the aid of which the organist was supposed to be capable of deciphering the intentions of the composer no especial importance appears to have been attached to the difference of notation for instruments and voices in this period and in fact until our own times certain instruments the viola for example have had their own notation different from the voices and different from that of other instruments another celebrated german organist of this period was johann hermann schein who with scheidt and schwelling constituted the three great german musical s's of the sixteenth century schein fifteen eighty six sixteen thirty was appointed cantor of the leipzig st thomas school in sixteen fifteen and worked there as above his numberless compositions are more free in style than the average of the century and a number of them are distinctly secular nevertheless in the development of instrumental music he had but small part not being one of the highly gifted original geniuses who impressed themselves upon following generations the great german master of this period was schutz chapel master at dresden whose career forms part of the story of the oratorio a form of music which he had so large a share in shaping into its present form part two in order to come once more into the path of musical empire we must return again to italy where there was an organist at st peter's who had in him the elements of greatness and originality girolamo frescobaldi fifteen eighty seven sixteen forty was organist of st peter's at rome from sixteen fifteen his education had been in part acquired in italy and in part in the netherlands as a virtuoso he attained an extraordinary success and one of his recitals is reputed to have been attended by as many as thirty thousand people he distinguished himself as composer no less than as organist and particularly by his compositions in free style his ricerari concertos and canzones were all protests against the bondage of instrumental music to the fetters of vocal forms it was the compositions of this master together with those of froberger that sebastian bach desired to have and which in fact he stole out of his brother's bookcase and copied in the moonlight nights 
it would take us too far were we to enumerate all the composers who distinguished themselves in this century no one of them succeeding in composing anything satisfactory to this later generation but all contributing something toward the liberation of instrumental music and all adding something to its limited resources among these names were those of johann kasper Kerl organist at st stephen's church in vienna who after having served with distinction at munich returned later and died at vienna in sixteen ninety another of these german masters also one of those whose compositions bach wished to study was johann pachelbel of nuremberg sixteen thirty five seventeen o six in sixteen seventy four he was assistant organist at vienna in sixteen seventy seven organist at eisenach and soon back to nuremberg a few years later his multifarious works for organ among which we find a variety of forms were perhaps the chief model upon which sebastian bach formed his style he especially excelled in improvising choral variations and in fanciful and musicianly treatment of themes proposed by the hearer yet another name of this epoch that of georges muffat is now almost forgotten he studied in france and formed his style upon that of the french a later master also very influential in the style of sebastian bach was dietrich buxtehude sixteen thirty seven seventeen o seven for nearly forty years he was organist at the church of st mary at lubeck where he was so celebrated that the young sebastian bach made a journey on foot there in order to hear and master the principles of his art buxtehude wrote a great number of pieces in free style for the organ and while his works have little value to modern ears there is no doubt that this master was an important influence upon the enfranchisement of instrumental music among all these netherlandish organists few are better known by name at the present day than johann adam reinken sixteen twenty three seventeen twenty two who was born at deventer holland and after the proper elementary and finishing studies succeeded his master scheidemann as organist at hamburg here his fame was so great that the young bach made two journeys there on foot in order to hear him he was a virtuoso of a high order and his style exercised considerable influence over that of bach part three return we now to italy where the violin led also to an important development of instrumental music having in it the promise of the best that we have had since in fusignano near imola was born in sixteen fifty three arcangelo corelli who became the first of violin virtuosi and the first of composers for the instrument and for violins in combination with other members of the same family and so of our string quartet he died in seventeen thirteen at rome of his boyhood there is little known about sixteen eighty he appears in high favor at the court of munich in sixteen eighty one he was again in rome where he appears to have found a friend in cardinal ottoboni in whose palace he died his period of creative activity extended from sixteen eighty three when he began the publication of his forty-eight three-voice sonatas for two violins in four numbers of twelve sonatas each he also composed many other sonatas for the violin for violin and piano and for other instruments these epoch-marking works are held in high esteem at the present time and are in constant use for purposes of instruction meanwhile the orchestra had been steadily enriched through the competition of successive operatic composers each exerting himself to produce more effect than the preceding in this way new combinations of tone color were contrived and now and then introduced in a fortunate manner and effects of greater sonority were attained through the greater number of instruments and the more expert use of those they had in the present state of knowledge it would be very difficult if not impossible to trace the successive steps of this progress and to give proper credit to each composer for his own contribution to the general stock 
at best the orchestra at the end of this century was somewhat meager the violin and the other members of its family had taken their places somewhat as we now have them but the number of basses and tenors was much less than at present their place being filled by the arch lute and the harpsichord the trumpet was occasionally employed the flute the oboe and very rarely the trombone the conductor at the harpsichord playing from a figured bass filled in chords according to his own judgment of the effect required nothing approaching the smoothness and discreet coloration of the orchestra of the present day or even of the haydn orchestra existed at this time the violin players were very cautious about using the second and third positions but played continually with their hands in the first position this part of the music therefore wholly lacked the freedom which it now has and the whole progress of this century was purely apprentice work in instrumental music its value lying in its establishing the principle first that instrumental music might exist independently of vocal and second that it might enhance the expressiveness of vocal music when associated with it the groundwork of the two great forms of the period next ensuing the fugue and the sonata had been laid and a certain amount of precedent established in favor of free composition in dance and fantasia form meanwhile the pianoforte of the day the clavicembalo as the italians called it had been considerably improved the present scale of music had been demonstrated by zarlino and the ground prepared for the great geniuses whose coming made the eighteenth century forever memorable as the blossoming time of musical art upon the whole perhaps the most important part of the actual accomplishment of this century was in musical theory while musicians for centuries had been employing the major and minor thirds and the triads as we now have them the fact had remained unacknowledged in musical theory and the supposed authority of the greeks still remained binding upon all zarlino however made a new departure he not only assigned the true intervals of the major scale according to perfect intonation but argued strongly for equal temperament and demonstrated the impossibility of chromatic music upon any other basis purists may still continue to doubt whether this was an absolute advantage to the art of music since it carries with it the necessity of having all harmonic relations something short of perfection but the immediate benefit to musical progress was unquestionable and according to all appearance the art of music is irrevocably committed to the tempered scale of twelve tones in the octave End of chapter 21chapter twenty two of a popular history of the art of music from the earliest times until the present by w s b matthews this librivox recording is in the public domain book fourth the flowering time of modern music bach handel haydn mozart beethoven the fugue and the sonata chapter twenty two general view of music in the eighteenth century it is not easy to characterize simply and clearly the nature of the musical development which took place during the eighteenth century the blossoming of music was so manifold so diversified so irrepressible in every direction that there was not one single province of it wherein new and masterly creations were not brought out the central figures of this period were those of the two colossi bach and handel after them haydn the master of genial proportion and taste mozart the melodist of ineffable sweetness and finally at the end of the century the great master beethoven in opera we have the entire work of that great reformer the chevalier gluck and a succession of italian composers who enlarged the boundaries of the italian music drama in every direction but especially in the direction of the impassioned and sensational 
add to these influences already sufficiently diversified that of a succession of brilliant virtuosi upon the leading instruments whereby the resources of all the effective musical apparatuses were more fully explored and illustrated with the final result of affording the poetic composer additional means of bringing his ideas to a more effective expression and we have the general features of a period in music so luxuriant that in it we might easily lose ourselves nor can we easily form a clear idea of the entire movement as the expression of a single underlying spiritual impulse yet such in its inner apprehension it most assuredly was upon the whole all the improvements of the time arranged themselves into two categories namely the better proportion contrast and more agreeable succession of moments in art works and second the more ample means for intense expression in the department of form indeed there was a very important transition made between the first half of the century and the last the typical form of the first part of this division was the fugue which came to a perfection under the hands of bach and handel far beyond anything to be found in the form previously the fugue was the creation of this epoch and while based upon the general idea of canonic imitation after the netherlandish ideal it differed from their productions in several highly significant respects while all of a fugue is contained within the original subject and the counter subject which accompanies it at every repetition it has an element of tonality in it which places it upon an immensely higher plane of musical art than any form known or possible before the obsolescence of the ecclesiastical modes moreover the fugue has opportunities for episode which enable it to acquire variety to a degree impossible for any form developed earlier and which when these opportunities were fresh afforded composers a field for the display of fancy which was practically free this one may still realize by comparing the different fugues in bach's well-tempered clavier with each other and with those of any other collection it is impossible to detect anywhere the point where the inspiration of the composer felt itself bound by the restrictions of this form it was for bach and handel practically a free form and the few other contemporaneous geniuses of a high order either experienced the same freedom in it or found ways of evading its strictness by the production of various styles of fancy pieces which while conforming to the fugue form in their main features were nevertheless free enough to be received by the musical public of that day with substantially the same satisfaction as a fantasia would have been received a century later roughly speaking bach and handel exhausted the fugue while bach displayed his mental activity in almost every province of music and like some one since of whom it has been much less truthfully said Quote, touched nothing which he did not adorn close quotes he was all his life a writer of fugues his preludes are not fugues and their number almost equals that of fugues but the operative principles were not essentially different merely the applications of thematic development were different yet strange as it may seem within thirty years from his death it became impossible to write fugues and at the same time be free why was this a new element came into music incompatible with fugue requiring a different form of expression and incapable of combination with fugue that element was the people's song with its symmetrical cadences and its universal intelligibility let the reader take any one of the mozart sonatas and play the first melody he finds he will immediately see that here is something for which no place could have been found in a fugue nor yet in its complement the prelude of bach's days the same is true of many similar passages in the sonatas of haydn music had now found the missing half of its dual nature 
for we must know that in the same manner as the thematic or fugal element in music represents the play of musical fantasy turning over musical ideas intellectually or seriously there is a spontaneous melody into which no thought of developing an idea enters the melody flows or soars like the song of a bird because it is the free expression not of musical fantasy as such the unconscious play of tonal fancy but the flow of melody song the soaring of spirit in some one particular direction floating upon buoyant pinions and in directions well conceived and sure the symmetry of the people's song follows as a natural part of the progress the spontaneous element of the music of the northern harpers now found its way into the musical productions of the highest geniuses henceforth the fugue subsides from its preeminence and remains possible only as a highly specialized department of the general art of musical composition useful and necessary at times but never more the expression of the unfettered fancy of the musical mind the discovery of the secret of musical contrast in the types of development the thematic and the lyric led to the creation of a new form in which they mutually contrast with and help each other that form was the sonata which having been begun earlier was developed further by the sons of bach but which received its characteristic touches from the hands of haydn and mozart this was the crowning glory of the eighteenth century the sonata a form had been created into which the greatest of masters was even then beginning to breathe his mighty soul producing thereby a succession of masterworks which stand without parallel in the realm of music End of chapter twenty two chapter twenty three of a popular history of the art of music from the earliest times until the present by w s b matthews this librivox recording is in the public domain john sebastian bach all things considered the most remarkable figure of this period was that of the great john sebastian bach who was born at eisenach in prussia in sixteen eighty five and died at leipzig in seventeen fifty it is scarcely too much to say that this great man has exercised more influence upon the development of music than any other composer who has ever lived in his own day he led a quiet uneventful life at first as a student then as court musician at weimar where he played the violin later as organist at anstadt a small village near weimar and still later as director of music in the st thomas church and school at leipzig in the sixty-five years of his life bach produced an enormous number of compositions of which about half were in fugue form a form which was at its prime at the beginning of this century and which bach carried to the farthest point in the direction of freedom and spontaneity which it ever reached it is the remarkable glory of bach to have rendered his compositions indispensable to thorough mastery in three different provinces of musical effort the modern art of violin playing rests upon two works the six sonatas of bach for violin solo and the caprices of paganini the former contain everything that belongs to the classical the latter everything that belongs to the sensational in organ playing the foundation is bach and bach alone nine-tenths of organ playing is comprised in the bach works upon the piano his influence has been little less while it is true that at least four works are necessary for making a pianist of the modern school viz the well-tempered clavier of bach the gradus ad parnassum of clementi the studies of chopin and the rhapsodies of liszt the works of bach form on the whole considerably more than one-third of this preparation 
nor has the influence of bach been confined to the province of technical instruction alone on the contrary all composers since his time have felt the stimulus of his great tone poems and mendelssohn schumann chopin and wagner found him the most productive of great masters the life of bach need not long detain us a musician of the tenth generation member of a family which occupies a liberal space in german encyclopedias of music art and literature sebastian bach led the life of a teacher productive artist and virtuoso mainly within the limits of the comparatively unimportant provincial city of leipzig his three wives in succession and his twenty-one children were the domestic incidents which bound him to his home here he trained his choir taught his pupils composed those masterworks which modern musicians try in vain to equal and the even tenor of his life was broken in upon by very few incidents of a sensational kind we do not understand that bach was a virtuoso upon the violin although no other master has required more of that greatest of musical instruments upon the piano and organ the case is different bach's piano was the clavier upon which he was the greatest virtuoso of his time his touch was clear and liquid his technique unbounded and his musical fantasy absolutely without limit hence in improvisation or in the performance of previously arranged numbers he never failed to delight his audience it was the same upon the organ the art of obligato pedal playing he brought to a point which it had never before reached and scarcely afterward surpassed he comprehended the full extent of organ technique and with the exception of a few tricks of quasi-orchestral imitation made possible in modern organs he covered the entire ground of organ playing in a manner at once solid and brilliant many stories are told of his capacity in this direction but the general characterization already given is sufficient he was a master of the first order the common impression that he played habitually upon the full organ is undoubtedly erroneous he made ample use of registration to the fullest extent practicable on the organs of his day the most remarkable feature of the career of bach is his productivity in the line of choral works as leader of the music in the st thomas church he had under his control two organs two choirs the children of the school and an orchestra for these resources he composed a succession of cantatas every feast day in the ecclesiastical year being represented by from one to five separate works the total number of these cantatas reaches more than two hundred thirty some of them are short ten or fifteen minutes long but most of them are from thirty to forty minutes and some of them reach an hour their treasures have been but imperfectly explored although most of them are now in print in the course of his ministrations at leipzig he produced five great passion oratorios for good friday and holy week the greatest of these was the passion of st matthew so named from the source of its text this work occupies about two hours in performance it is in two parts and the sermon was supposed to intervene it consists of recitative arias and choruses some of which are extremely elaborate and highly dramatic the other passions are less fortunate nevertheless they contain many beautiful and highly dramatic moments bach's oratorios belong to the category of church works as distinguished from those intended for concert purposes this is seen especially in the treatment of the chorale in which he expects the congregation to cooperate in one direction bach was subject to serious limitation his knowledge of the voice and his consideration for its convenience were far below the standard of composers of the same time educated in italy 
in his works while many passages are very impressive and while the melody and harmony are always appropriate to the matter in hand the intervals and especially the convenience of the different registers of the voice are very imperfectly considered for which reason his works have not been performed to anything like the extent to which their musical interest would otherwise have carried them this is especially true of the greatest of all the passion according to st matthew it was first performed on good friday seventeen twenty nine in the st thomas church at leipzig and it does not appear to have been given again until eighteen twenty nine when mendelssohn brought it out since that time it has been given almost every year in leipzig and more or less frequently in all the musical centers of the world but its elaboration is very great and its vocal treatment unsatisfactory to solo voices for which reason it succeeds only under the inspiration of an artistic and enthusiastic leader in fact all the great works of bach are more or less in the category of classics which are well spoken of and seldom consulted while in beethoven's time the whole of the well-tempered clavier was not thought too much for an ambitious youngster at the present time there are few pianists who play half a dozen of these pieces the easier inventions for two parts some of the suites several gavottes modernized from his violin and chamber music and a very few of his other pieces for the clavier are habitually played it would be unjust to close the account of this great artist without mentioning what we might call the prophetic element in his works the great bulk of bach's compositions are in two forms the prelude and the fugue the fugue came to perfection in his hands it was an application of the netherlandish art of canonic imitation combined with modern tonality in a fugue the first voice gives the subject in the tonic the second voice answers in the dominant the third voice comes again in the tonic and the fourth voice if there be one again in the dominant then ensues a digression into some key upon what theorists call the dominant side when one or two voices give out the subject and answer it again always in the tonic and dominant of the new key then more or less modulating matter thematically developed out of some leading motive of the subject and again the principal material of the theme with one or more answers the final close is preceded by a more or less elaborate pedal point upon the dominant of the principal key after which the subject comes in with very few exceptions the fugues of bach are in modern tonality the major key of the modern minor with their usual relatives the prelude is a less closely organized composition sometimes it is purely harmonic in its interest like the first of the well-tempered clavier at other times it is highly melodic like the preludes in c sharp major and minor of the first book of the clavier and as a rule the prelude either treats its motives in a somewhat lyric manner or dispenses with the melodic material altogether thus the prelude and fugue mutually complete each other but it is a great mistake to regard bach as a writer of fugues alone he was also very free in fantasies and one of his pianoforte works concerning the origin of which nothing whatever is known the chromatic fantasia and fugue is one of the four or five greatest compositions that exist for this instrument the remarkable thing about this fantasia is the freedom of its treatment and the facility with which it lends itself to virtuoso handling as distinguished from the rather limited treatment of the piano usual in bach's works the second part of the fantasia is occupied by a succession of recitatives of an extremely graphic and poetic character melodically and harmonically these recitatives are thoroughly modern and dramatic the latter element being very forcibly represented by the succession of diminished sevenths on which the phrases of the recitative end the fugue following is long and highly diversified and extremely climactic in its interest 
in other parts of his work bach has left fantasies of a more descriptive character he has for instance a hunting scene with various incidents of a realistic character and in general he shows himself in his piano works a man of wide range of mind and extremely vigorous musical fantasy in the department of concertos for solo instruments and orchestra his works are very rich there are a large number for piano quite a number for organ several for two and three pianos with orchestra and various other combinations of instruments such as two violins and cellos and so on in these each solo player has an equal chance with the other and solos and accompaniment work together understandingly for mutual ends the most noticeable feature of his elaborate works is the rhythm which is vigorous highly organized and extremely effective in the department of harmony it is believed by almost all close observers that no combination of tones since made by any writer is without a precedent in the works of bach the strange chords of schumann and wagner find their prototypes in the works of this great leipzig master melodically considered bach was a genius of the highest order not only did he make this impression upon his own time and upon the great masters of the next two generations but many of his airs have attained genuine popularity within the present generation and are played with more real satisfaction than most other works that we have this is the more remarkable because from the time of his first residence in leipzig when he was only twenty-four years old he went out of that city but a few times and heard very little music but his own he was three times married and had twenty-one children many of whom were musical three of his sons became eminent and the principal episode of his later life was his visit to potsdam where his son karl philip emmanuel was musician to frederick the great here he was received with the utmost informality by the king and made to play and improvise upon all the pianos and organs in the palace and the adjacent churches as a reminiscence of this visit he produced a fugue upon a subject given by frederick himself written for six real parts this work was called the musical offering and was dedicated to frederick the great in his later years bach became blind from having overexerted his eyes in childhood and in later life he died on good friday in seventeen fifty end of chapter twenty three chapter twenty four of a popular history of the art of music from the earliest times until the present by w s b matthews this librivox recording is in the public domain george frederick handel the companion figure to bach in this epoch was that of george frederick handel who was born at the little town of halle in the same year as bach sixteen eighty five and died in london in seventeen fifty nine handel's father was a physician and although the boy showed considerable aptitude for music his father did not think favorably of his pursuing it as a vocation but the fates were too strong for him when george frederick was about eight years old he managed to go with his father to the court of the duke of saxe weissenfels some distance away where an older brother was in service here he obtained access to the organ in the chapel and was overheard by the duke who recognized the boy's talent and with the authority inherent in princely rank admonished the father that on no account was he to thwart so gifted an inclination accordingly the youngster had lessons in music upon the clavier the organ and the violin the three standard instruments of the time the older handel died and before he was nineteen george frederick made his way to hamburg which was then one of the musical centres of germany here he obtained an engagement in the theatre orchestra as ripieno violin a sort of fifth wheel in the orchestral chariot its duty being that of filling in missing parts 
the boy was then rather more than six feet high heavy and awkward he was an indifferent violinist and the other players were disposed to make a butt of him although he was known to be an accomplished harpsichordist it happened presently however that the leader of the orchestra who presided at the harpsichord fell sick and handel being at the same time the best harpsichordist and the poorest violinist of all was placed at the head he carried the rehearsals and the performances through with such spirit that it resulted in his being made assistant director and two works of his were presently performed almira and nero the first made a great hit and was retained in performance for several weeks the italian ambassador immediately recognized the talent of the young man and offered to take him to italy in his suite but handel declined preferring to go with his own money which after the production of nero and its successful run of several weeks he was able to do accordingly we find him in italy in seventeen ten first at naples where he made the acquaintance of the greatest harpsichord player of that time domenico scarlatti the style of the young german was so charming and so different from that of the great italian player that he immediately became a favorite and was called il caro sassone the dear saxon he produced an opera in naples with good success afterward he produced others at rome and venice in a few years he was back at hanover where he was made musical director to the elector george who afterward became george i of england here presently he took a vacation in order to visit london where he found things so much to his liking that he remained having good employment under queen anne and a public anxious to hear his italian operas presently queen anne died and george i came over to reign as king this was altogether a different matter for handel had his unsettled account with the elector of hanover upon whom he had so cavalierly turned his back the piece was finally made however by a set of compositions very celebrated in england under the name of the water music when king george was going from whitehall to westminster in his barge handel followed with a company of musicians playing a succession of pieces which the king knew well enough for a production of his truant kapellmeister accordingly he received him once more into favor and handel went on with his work for upwards of twenty years handel pursued his course in london as a composer of italian operas of which the number reached about forty during the greater part of his time he had his own theatre and employed the singers from italy and elsewhere producing his works in the best manner of his time his operas were somewhat conventional in their treatment but every one of them contained good points here and there a chorus occasionally a recitative now and then an aria always something to repay a careful hearing and occasionally a master effect such as only genius of the first order could produce his education during this period was exactly opposite to that of bach bach lived in leipzig all his life and being in a position from which only a decided fault of his own could discharge him he consulted no one's taste but his own writing his music from within and adapting it to his forces in hand or not adapting it as it pleased him handel on the other hand had always the public he commenced as an operatic composer as an operatic composer he succeeded in hamburg and as an opera composer he succeeded in italy the same career held him in london there was always an audience to be moved to be affected to be pleased and there were always singers of high talents to carry out his conceptions hence his whole training was in the direction of smoothness facility pleasing quality nevertheless there came an end to the popularity of handel 
a most shabby pasticcio called the beggar's opera was the immediate cause of his downfall this queer compilation was made up of old ballad tunes with hastily improvised words and the merest thread of a story and included some tunes of handel's own this being produced at an opposition house took the town the result was that handel was bankrupted for the second time owing more than seventy five thousand pounds some time before this he had held the position of private musical director to the earl of chandos who had a chapel in connection with his palace a short distance out of london as it then was in this place handel had already produced a number of elaborate anthems and one oratorio esther in the stress of his present circumstances after a few weeks he remembered the oratorio of esther and immediately brought it out in an enlarged form the effect was enormous whatever the english taste might be for opera for oratorio their recognition was irrepressible esther brought him a great deal of money and he presently wrote other oratorios with such good effect that in a few years he had completely paid up the enormous indebtedness of his operatic ventures at length in seventeen forty one he composed his masterwork the messiah this epoch marking composition was improvised in less than a fortnight at a rate of speed calling for about three numbers per day the work was produced in dublin for charitable purposes it had the advantage of a text containing the most beautiful and impressive passages of scripture relating to the messiah a circumstance which no doubt inspired the beauty of the music and added to the early popularity of the work in later times it is perhaps not too much to say that the music has been equally useful to the text in keeping its place in the consciousness of successive generations of christians in this beautiful masterwork we have the result of the whole of handel's training the work is very cleverly arranged in a succession of recitatives arias and choruses following each other in a highly dramatic and effective manner there are certain passages in the messiah which have never been surpassed for tender and poetic expression among these are the behold and see if there be any sorrow like his sorrow come unto him and he was despised in the direction of sublimity nothing grander can be found than the hallelujah worthy is the lamb lift up your heads nor anything more dramatically impressive than the splendid burst at the words wonderful counsellor the work as a whole while containing mannerisms in the roulades of such courses as he shall purify and for unto us marks the highest point reached in the direction of oratorio for while handel himself surpasses its sublimity in israel in egypt and bach its dramatic qualities in the thunder and lightning chorus in the st matthew passion and mendelssohn its melodiousness in his elijah for a balance of good quality and for even and sustained inspiration throughout the messiah is justly entitled to the rank which by common consent it holds as the most complete masterwork which oratorio can show in the israel in egypt handel illustrates a different phase of his talent this curious work is composed almost entirely of choruses the most of which are for two choirs very elaborately treated among them all the two which perhaps stand out preeminent are the horse and his rider and the hailstone two colossal works as dramatic as they are imposing the masterly effect of the handelian chorus rests upon the combination of good qualities such as no other master has accomplished to the same extent they are extremely well written for the voice with an accurate appreciation of the effect of different registers and masses the melodic ideas are smooth and vigorous and the harmonic treatment as forcible as possible without ever controlling the composer further than it suited his artistic purpose to go bach very often commences a fugue which he feels obliged to finish losing thereby the opportunity of a dramatic effect handel perfects his fugue only when the dramatic effect will be improved by so doing 
and in this respect he makes a distinct gain over his great contemporary at leipzig the total list of the handel works comprises the following two italian oratorios nineteen english oratorios five te deums six psalms twenty anthems three german operas one english opera thirty-nine italian operas two italian serenatas two english serenatas one italian intermezzo terpsichore four odes twenty-four chamber duets ninety-four cantatas seven french songs thirty-three concertos nineteen english songs sixteen italian airs twenty-four sonatas handel was never married nor so far as we know ever in love he had among his friends some of the most eminent writers of his day such as addison pope dean swift and others his later years were so successful that when he died his fortune of above fifty thousand pounds was left for charitable purposes this was after he had paid all of the indebtedness incurred in his earlier bankruptcy it would be a mistake to dismiss this great master without some notice of his harpsichord and organ playing as a teacher of the princesses of the royal family he produced many suites and lessons for the harpsichord in one of which as an unnoticed incident occur the air and variations since so universally popular under the name of the harmonious blacksmith it is not known to whom the composer was indebted for the name generally applied to this extremely broad air and clever variations very likely some music publisher was the unknown poet as an organist handel was both great and popular in the middle of his oratorios he used to play an organ concerto with orchestra of these compositions he wrote a very large number they are always fresh and hardy in style well written for organ and with a very flowing pedal part handel appears to have played the pedals upon a somewhat different plan from that of bach bach is generally supposed to have used his toes for the most part employing the heel only for an occasional note where the toes were insufficient handel seems to have used toe and heel habitually in almost equal proportion it is a curious feature of the later part of handel's career that he brought out his oratorios in costume several of the original bills are extant in which an oratorio is promised with new clothes esther is said to have been given with complete stage appointment at chandos like an opera but the lord chamberlain prohibited future representations of the kind on account of the supposed sacredness of the subject afterward the characters were costumed and the stage set but there was no action while handel was german by birth his long residence in england and his habitual writing for the last ten or fifteen years of his life oratorios in the english language made him to all intents and purposes an english composer for nearly a century he stood to the english school as a model of everything that was good and great to such an extent that very little of original value was accomplished in that country and when by lapse of time and a deeper self-consciousness on the part of english musicians this influence had begun to wane a new german composer came in the person of felix mendelssohn bartholdi who in turn became a popular idol and for many years a barrier to original effort the influence of handel upon the later course of music is by no means so marked as that of bach nevertheless he was one of the great tone poets of all times and his works form an indispensable part of the literature of music it was his good fortune to embody certain types of melody and harmony with a clearness and effectiveness that no other composer has equaled the oratorio in particular not only fulfilled itself in handel but we might almost say completed itself there for very little of decided originality has been produced in this department since 
the handelian operas have been mostly forgotten for many years but they contain gems of melody in the solo and chorus parts which have still a future his first opera almira was revived at hamburg a few years ago with remarkable effect and it is not at all unlikely that extracts from many of the other works will eventually find their way into the current repertory of the singer as many of the arias already have End of chapter 24chapter twenty five of a popular history of the art of music from the earliest times until the present by w s b matthews this librivox recording is in the public domain emmanuel bach haydn the sonata part one none of the sons of bach inherited the commanding genius of their father although four of them showed talent above the average of musicians of their day and one of them distinguished himself and exercised an important influence upon the subsequent course of pianoforte music the most gifted of bach's sons was wilhelm friedmann the eldest seventeen ten seventeen eighty four who was especially educated by his father for a musician he turned out badly however his enormous talents not being able to save him from the natural consequences of a dissolute life he died in berlin in the greatest degradation and want this bach wrote comparatively few compositions owing to his invincible repugnance to the labor of putting them upon paper he was famous as an improviser and certain pieces of his in the berlin library are considered to manifest musical gifts of a high order johann christian seventeen thirty five seventeen eighty two the eleventh son known as the milanese or london bach devoted himself to the lighter forms of music and after having served some years as organist of the cathedral at milan and having distinguished himself by certain operas successfully produced in italy he removed to london where he led an easy and enjoyable life he was an elegant and fluent writer for the pianoforte the one son of bach who is commonly regarded as having left a mark upon the later course of music was karl philip emmanuel seventeen fourteen seventeen eighty eight the third son commonly known as the berlin or hamburg bach his father intended him for a philosopher and had him educated accordingly in the leipzig and frankfurt universities but his love for music and the thorough grounding in it he had at home eventually determined him in this direction while in the frankfurt university he conducted a singing society which naturally led to his exercising himself in composition presently he gave up law for music and going to berlin he obtained an appointment as kammermusiker to frederick the great his especial business being that of accompanying the king in his flute concertos the seven years war having put an end to these duties he migrated to hamburg where he held honorable appointments as organist and conductor until his death he wrote in a tasteful and free but somewhat superficial style and while his compositions bear favorable comparison with those of other musicians of his time they are by no means of a commanding nature like those of his father there were however two reasons for this wholly aside from the question of less ability in the younger composer one of these is to be found in the free form which emmanuel bach began to develop sebastian bach had the advantage of writing his greatest works in a form which had been prepared for him without having been exhausted the technique of fugue had been created before his time but its possibilities in the direction of freedom and spontaneity had never been illustrated bach proceeded to do this for the fugue form and it may be added did it with such amplitude that no composer has been able to write a free and original fugue since the son recognizing both that the fugue had been exhausted as a free art form and feeling no doubt that something more intuitively intelligible than fugue was possible addressed himself to composition in the free style in which the means of producing effects had not yet been mastered 
the thematic use of material had been acquired or was easily inferable from the fugue but the proper manner of contrasting that material with other calculated to relieve the attention and at the same time intensify the interest remained for later explorers the missing contrast was the lyric element but it was not until the next generation of composers that it came into pianoforte music in satisfactory form accordingly the sonatas of emmanuel bach sound dry and superficial and while they are interesting as the remote models upon which beethoven occasionally built they do not repay study for the purposes of public performance there is little heart in them as a literary musician bach deserves to be remembered for his work upon the true art of playing the piano this was the first systematic instruction book for the instrument of which we have a record and it still is the main dependence for information concerning the method of bach's playing and the way in which he intended the embellishments in his works to be performed part two in the little village of rorau in austria was born to a master wheelwright's wife in seventeen thirty two a little son dark-skinned not large of frame nor handsome but gifted with that most imperishable of endowments a genius for melody and tonal symmetry the baby was named francis joseph and he grew to the age of about six in the family of his parents in a little house which although twice somewhat rebuilt still stands in its original form hither people come from many lands in order to see the birthplace of the great composer haydn the indefatigable and simple-hearted tone poet of many symphonies sonatas and the two favorite cantatas or oratorios the creation and the seasons in his earliest childhood the boy showed a talent for music which as his parents both sang and played a little he had often an opportunity of hearing before he was quite six years old he was able to stand up in the choir of the village church and lead in solos with his sweet and true if not strong voice it was his delight at length george reuter the director of the music in the cathedral of st stephen at vienna heard him and offered the boy a place in his choir now indeed his fortune seemed made and he embraced the offer with gratitude as a choir boy he ought to have been taught music in a thorough manner but as reuter was rather a careless man this did not happen in haydn's case but the boy grew up in his own devices he composed constantly without having had the slightest regular training one day reuter saw one of his pieces a mass movement for twelve parts he offered the passing advice that the composer would have done better to have taken two voices and that the best exercise for him would be to write divisions variations upon the airs he sang in the service but no instruction at length the boy's voice began to break and at the age of fourteen or fifteen he was turned out to shift for himself he found an asylum in the house of a wig-maker keller with whom he lived for several years earning small sums by lessons playing the organ at one of the churches the violin at another singing at another and so on in all managing to place himself upon the road to fortune that of industry and sobriety this part of his career lasted from seventeen forty eight when he left the choir of the cathedral to seventeen fifty two when he became accompanist to the italian master porpora who was then living in vienna in the house of an italian lady whose daughter's education he was superintending with porpora he learned the art of singing and the proper manner of accompanying the voice he also got many hints in regard to the correct manner of composing he had already produced a number of works in various styles in seventeen fifty nine he was appointed conductor of the music at the palace of count mortzen where he had a small number of musicians under his direction only sixteen in all here he began his life work 
two years later he was invited to assume the assistant directorship of the private orchestra and choir of prince esterhazy who lived in magnificent style and for many years had maintained a private musical chapel very soon the old prince died and his son reigned in his place the new master was the one named the magnificent and greatly enlarged the musical appointment of his predecessor he built a great palace at esterhaz where there was a theater in which opera was given and a smaller one where there was a marionette company the machinery of which had been brought to great perfection there were frequent concerts the prince was a great amateur of the peculiar viol called the baritone and it was one of haydn's duties to provide new compositions for this instrument here for thirty years he continued in service with few interruptions and always on the very best of terms with his prince and with the men under him the players called haydn papa owing to its situation remote from town and to the prince's constantly increasing aversion to living in vienna haydn scarcely left the vicinity for years together here wholly from within his own resources he evolved a succession of works in every style and for almost every possible combination of instruments from operas for the large theater to marionette music for the small place orchestral compositions among which the one hundred seventy five symphonies form a not inconsiderable portion there are also concertos for many kinds of instruments and songs masses divertissements and the like in short there is scarcely any form of music which haydn did not have to make at some time or other in his long service in the esterhazy establishment being his own orchestral director he had the opportunity of trying and experimenting and of realizing what would be effective and what would not the motive mainly operative in his work necessarily was that of pleasing and amusing nobler intentions were not wanting but the pleasing element had to be considered in most that he did thus he developed a style of his own original becoming with a certain taste and symmetry and with a melodious element which never loses its charm withal he became very clever in his treatment of themes it was a saying of his that the idea did not matter at all treatment is everything from this standpoint it is impossible to deny haydn the credit of having accomplished his ideal he commenced his musical career as a violinist and a singer his orchestral symphonies were for violins for strings with occasional seasoning from the brass and woodwind the constant study of the violin led to modifications in his style and evolved first the string quartet in the form which has always remained standard the symphonies are only larger string quartets for in the order of the themes the general manner of treating them and the principles of contrast or relief which actuated them the quartets are sonatas as also are the symphonies haydn gave the sonata form its present shape the insertion of a second theme in the first movement and the principle of contrasting this second theme with the first in such a way that the second theme is generally lyric in style or at least tending in that direction was haydn's he also developed the middle part of the sonata into what is known as the elaboration durchführungsatz the cantabile slow movement modeled somewhat after the italian cantilena was his mozart and beethoven did wonders with it later but the suggestion was haydn's the endless productivity the constant succession of new pieces demanded led to a somewhat systematic proceeding in their production and so the form and the method of the sonata became stereotyped all the instrumental movements of this time whenever there was any serious intention assumed the form of sonatas i e 
of the instrumental sonatas the symphony and the quartet at length haydn's master died and he accepted an invitation from solomon the publisher to london where he produced several new symphonies conducted many concerts and returned to vienna richer by about six thousand dollars than when he had left his home a few months before he had become a great master known all over the world without himself knowing it if any man ever woke up and found himself famous haydn was that man although he had been in the way of having his compositions played and sung before most of the important personages in europe for years prince esterhazy being a royal entertainer it was for madrid that haydn composed his first passion oratorio the last seven words this work by a curious chance he made over into an instrumental piece for his london concerts the prejudice against popery preventing its being given there in its original form in seventeen ninety four he was again in london upon the first visit to london he took the journey down the rhine and at bonn in going or coming the young beethoven showed him a new cantata in seventeen ninety four he was again in london where the same success attended him as before he produced many new works and was royally entertained again he went home richer by many thousands of dollars than when he set out with his savings he purchased a house in the suburbs of vienna where he lived the remainder of his life dying in eighteen o nine it was during these last years that he wrote his two oratorios already mentioned that by which he is best known is the creation which is a masterwork indeed if only we do not look in it for too much of the distinctly religious or sublime it belongs to the pleasing in art and certain of its numbers are worthy of italian opera so sweetly melodious are they yet ever refined and beautiful of this kind are the solo arias o mighty pens the famous with verdure clad the lovely trio most beautiful appear several choruses in this work are really splendid at the head of the list i would place the two choruses achieved is the glorious work with the beautiful trio between on thee each living soul awaits the development of the fugue in the second chorus is masterly and effective indeed everybody knows the heavens are telling which however has rather more reputation than it deserves the english have made much of haydn's descriptive music in the accompanied recitatives this part of his work however was but clever when first written and now through the enormous development which this part of musical composition has since reached is little more than childish withal the creation is not difficult it can be rendered effectively with moderate resources this fact added to its many charming and engaging qualities has ensured its popularity in all parts of the musical world it bids fair to remain for amateur societies for many years yet as a tone poet haydn belonged by no means to the first rank at least in so far as the inherent weight and range of his ideas is concerned his one claim to musical fame rests upon his graceful manner of treating a musical idea and upon the readiness of his invention in contrasting his themes to which may be added the sweet and genial flavor of his music which in every line shows a pure and childlike spirit simple unaffected yet deep and true it was his good fortune to stand to mozart and beethoven in the role of master both were in many ways his superiors yet both revered him the one until his own life went out in the freshness of his youth the other until when an old man having stood upon the very pisgah tops of the tone world full of honors he spoke of the old master haydn with affection in his very last days higher testimony than this it would be impossible to quote 
for in the nature of the case the composer haydn can never be judged again by musicians and poets who know so well his aims and the value of what he accomplished as the two vienna masters mozart and beethoven who were younger than he yet not too young to understand the condition of the musical world into which haydn had been born and the musical world as it had become from his living in it End of chapter 25chapter twenty six of a popular history of the art of music from the earliest times until the present by w s b matthews this librivox recording is in the public domain mozart and his genius one of the most engaging personalities and at the same time one of the most highly gifted versatile and richly endowed geniuses who ever adorned the art of music was that of wolfgang amadeus mozart seventeen fifty six seventeen ninety one he was a son of the violin player and musician leopold mozart living at salzburg at an extremely early age he showed his love for music by listening to the lessons of his sister by the time he was four his father commenced to give him lessons and when he was less than five years old he was discovered one day making marks upon music paper which he stoutly maintained belonged to a concerto the statement was received with incredulity but upon carefully examining the manuscript it was found correctly written and sensible but so difficult as to be impossible to play upon the boy's attention being called to this he replied i call it a concerto because it is so difficult they should practice it until they can play it in childhood and indeed through all his life his ear was very sensitive he could not bear to hear the sound of a trumpet and upon his father seeking to overcome his nervousness by having a trumpet blown in the room it threw him into convulsions the boy was of a most active mind interested in everything that went on about him and eager to learn in every direction nothing came amiss arithmetic grammar and language he was immediately at home in any subject which he took up music was intuitive to him so remarkable was his progress that when he was yet but six years old his father began to travel with him their first journey was to munich where the elector received them kindly the programmes consisted of improvisations by the youthful mozart upon themes assigned by the audience pieces for violin and piano the father taking the violin part and the sister in turn played piano pieces the father was a good violinist and the author of an excellent school for that instrument he also composed many ambitious works which rise above the kapellmeister average highly gratified with their reception at munich they went on to vienna where again they were cordially received the emperor especially being highly delighted with the little magician as he called the promising boy even at this early age mozart had a distinct idea of his own authority in music although no one could be freer than he from the charge of self-conceit in vienna he asked expressly for wagenseil the court composer that he might be sure of having a real connoisseur among his hearers i am playing a concerto of yours he said you must turn over for me the ladies of the aristocracy went wild over the fascinating young fellow but presently he had an attack of scarlet fever which brought the tour to an end after the return to salzburg the practice went on every day and regular lessons in books as they had during the journey and when he was still less than nine years of age the family undertook a longer tour to paris playing at all the important towns on the way in several of the cities wolfgang played the violin and also the organ in the churches at paris they had a remarkable success playing before the court at versailles and in many of the houses of the nobility here the father had four of the boys sonatas for piano and violin engraved and published the stay at paris lasted five months until november tenth seventeen sixty four when they departed for london here they met a favorable reception at court the king george third taking a great interest in the wonderful young master 
he put before him pieces of bach wagenseil and handel which he played at sight on the fifth of june they gave a concert in spring gardens where their receipts were as much as one hundred guineas his next appearance was as an organist for the benefit of a charity the father having taken cold was ill for some time during which time as the boy was unable to play on the piano he wrote his first symphony and the year following three others before leaving london they visited the british museum and in memory of his visit wolfgang composed a four-part quartet and presented the autograph to the museum without pausing to trace the concert career of the young virtuoso it must suffice to say that by the time he was twelve years old he had become favorably known in every court of southern europe his talent had been illustrated in many different ways and tested by the most severe masters one of the most celebrated cases of this kind happened at bologna where the philharmonic academy received him as a member after his passing the usual severe test over which the famous master padre martini presided the conditions of membership required the candidate to write an elaborate motet in six parts founded upon a melody assigned from the roman antiphonarium the work to conform to the strictest rules with double counterpoint and fugue in consequence of the nervous feeling due to the limit of time allowed candidates very often failed mozart however took his paper in the cheerful frame of mind which everywhere distinguished him and was duly locked up in less than three-quarters of an hour he rapped at his door and asked to be let out the authorities sent him word not to be discouraged but to keep on trying as he had yet three hours and might accomplish it they were greatly astonished on finding that he had already finished having produced a complete masterwork abundantly up to all requirements the whole written in his peculiarly neat and accurate manner his compositions had already reached the number of eighty including a number of symphonies it was now late in the year seventeen seventy one and at milan wolfgang set seriously to work upon his opera which was produced december twenty sixth and repeated to full houses twenty times the author himself conducting it this was mitridate re di ponto the year following he composed two other operas for italy and several symphonies so that when his new opera of lucio silla was performed in milan october twenty fourth seventeen seventy two the number of his works had reached a hundred and thirty five from seventeen seventy three to seventeen seventy seven mozart remained at salzburg with occasional journeys to vienna and other cities always pursuing a life of unflagging industry the number of his works had increased by the end of this period to upwards of two hundred fifty including an immense variety of pieces of chamber music symphonies two or three operas a number of masses and the like he was now twenty-one years old and since the age of fourteen he had been assistant conductor at salzburg in the service of the prince archbishop who was a small-souled man wholly unworthy the service which mozart rendered him there is at least a small satisfaction in remembering that the archbishop himself had a distinct impression of the disesteem in which he was held by his talented young musical conductor with the attainment of his majority the second period in the life of this great genius began unable to obtain permission from the shabby prelate for father and son to go together upon an artistic tour the father at length decided to send the young man out with his mother and in september seventeen seventy seven the two started for paris traveling in their own carriage with post horses their plan was to give a concert at every promising town taking whatever time might be necessary for working it up in due form in this way their journey was considerably prolonged by delays at munich mannheim and ausburg at mannheim especially the incidents of the tour were varied by mozart's falling in love with the charming daughter of the theatrical prompter and copyist a promising singer who afterward married happily in quite a different quarter 
at paris things did not turn out quite so favorably as the father had anticipated most afflicting of all the mother fell sick there and died so that the son left paris in september for home with a far heavier heart than when he entered it during most of seventeen seventy nine and seventeen eighty he remained at salzburg fulfilling his duties as assistant conductor then came his first opera in germany idomeneo re di creta produced at munich january twenty nine seventeen eighty one the success of this work was so decided that it determined mozart's career as an operatic composer a few months later he quarrelled with the archbishop and the unpleasant connection came to an end his second opera the entführung aus dem serail the elopement from the seraglio was produced at vienna july sixteenth seventeen eighty two this was his first opera in german in august of this year he was married to constance weber younger sister of her who had first enchanted him the marriage was congenial in many ways but as the wife was incapable in money matters and administration and mozart himself careless as a business man and in receipt of a small and irregular income they soon found themselves in a sea of little troubles from which the struggling artist was never more free only at the last moment when indeed his life was all but extinct did the clouds disappear and a prospect open before him which if he had lived to enjoy it would have placed his remaining days in easy circumstances in seventeen eighty five the father visited his son in vienna and upon one of the first days of his stay there was a little dinner party at mozart's house with haydn and the two barons todi in his letter home leopold mozart says that haydn said to him i declare to you before god as a man of honor that your son is the greatest composer that i know either personally or by reputation he has taste and beyond that the most consummate knowledge of composition in return for this compliment mozart dedicated to haydn six string quartets with a laudatory preface in which he says that it was but his due for from haydn i first learned to compose a quartet mozart was an enthusiastic freemason and through his influence his father who had always previously opposed the order became a member during this visit at vienna soon afterward the father died for the lodge mozart wrote much music both of a liturgical character and for concerts and special entertainments and in the magic flute there are many reminiscences of the order a year later he made the acquaintance of the celebrated librettist lorenzo da ponte who proposed to adapt beaumarchais's comedy the marriage of figaro which after some difficulty in obtaining the consent of the emperor on account of the objectionable character of the story was done and the work produced at vienna may the first seventeen eighty six the theatre was crowded and many airs were repeated until at later performances the emperor prohibited encores a pleasing scene took place at the last dress rehearsal kelly who took the parts of don basilio and of don curzio writes never was anything more complete than the triumph of mozart and his marriage of figaro to which numerous overflowing audiences bore witness even at the first full band rehearsal all present were roused to enthusiasm and when benucci came to the fine passage cherubino alla vittoria alla gloria militar which he gave with stentorian lungs the effect was electric for the whole of the performers on the stage and those in the orchestra as if actuated by one feeling of delight vociferated bravo bravo maestro viva viva grande mozart those in the orchestra i thought would never have ceased applauding by beating the bows of their violins against their music desks and mozart i never shall forget his little animated countenance when lighted up with glowing rays of genius it is as impossible to describe it as it would be to paint sunbeams yet the success did not improve his position in money affairs soon afterward however he was invited to prague to see the success his beautiful work was making there 
he was entertained handsomely and found the town wild with delight at the novelty the spontaneity and charming quality of his music he also gave two concerts there which were brilliantly successful and having been many times recalled he sat down at the piano and improvised for half an hour the audience resisting every effort he made to stop after returning to vienna he obtained another libretto from da ponte that of don giovanni which was produced at prague october twenty ninth seventeen eighty seven it is told as a characteristic incident of mozart's method of working that the overture of this opera had not been written until the night before the performance at every suggestion mozart answered tapping his forehead i have it all here but not a line had been written late at night he set about writing it his wife made him some punch of which he was very fond and sat with him telling him fairy stories in order to keep him awake early in the morning the overture was finished and after being copied it was played prima vista at night with grand success in response to repeated appeals for court recognition mozart was made chamber composer with a salary of about four hundred dollars which he pronounced too much for what i produce too little for what i might produce don giovanni was not given in vienna until may seventeen eighty eight his pecuniary circumstances continued desperate but there were certain incidents of an artistic kind which afforded the struggling genius a meagre consolation one van swieten director of the royal library who was a great amateur of classical chamber music held meetings every sunday for the rehearsal of works of this class mozart sat at the piano for these occasions he arranged several of the fugues of bach's well-tempered clavier for string quartet the year following the practices took on larger proportions a subscription having been made to provide for giving oratorios with chorus and orchestra mozart conducted and weigel took the pianoforte it was for performances of this club that mozart added the wind parts to certain works of handel they gave assis and galatea november seventeen seventy eight the messiah march seventeen seventy nine ode to st cecilia's day and alexander's feast july seventeen ninety space forbids our following his later career beyond mentioning the chief incidents in a life where sadness had larger and larger place when nevertheless the great master was pouring out his most noble and beautiful strains of melody and tonal delight a visit to berlin resulted in receptions at court at potsdam where the truthful composer replied to the king's questions how he liked his band that it contains great virtuosi but if the gentlemen would play together they would make a better effect a remark which has been appropriate to many later orchestras the king apparently laid the remark to heart and offered mozart the post of director with a salary of three thousand thalers almost equal to the same number of our dollars it would have been well for mozart if he had accepted this liberal offer but his answer was how can i abandon my good emperor certainly an affection most misplaced the list of the mozart operas was closed with the magic flute produced september thirtieth seventeen eighty three which at first was not so successful as most of his previous works but which continued to improve upon hearing until at length it reached the estimation which it has ever since held as one of the most characteristic and interesting of all his works he had already begun upon his requiem which had been mysteriously ordered of him by a messenger who declined to state the object for which the work was intended it is now ascertained that the unknown patron was a count walzek an amateur desirous of being thought a great composer it was his intention to have performed the work as his own mozart was now in low spirits worn out with work late hours and financial worry the mystery of the requiem preyed on his imagination none the less that he felt that in it he was writing something of his noblest and best thoughts he said i am sure that this will be my own requiem nothing could dissuade him from the idea 
it returned again and again at length he fell ill poisoned as he thought by some envious rival no one knows whether there was anything in the notion that actual poison had been administered although there were rivals who had been heard to wish that he were out of the way without having quite finished the requiem he breathed his last december fifth seventeen ninety one his premonition proved correct the requiem was given at his own funeral this account of the life of mozart has hardly the merit of an outline for within the short thirty-five years of his earthly existence this great master produced a variety of works in every province of music greater than that produced by any other of the great masters scarcely excepting the indefatigable and long-lived handel it is extremely difficult to assign mozart a definite place in the musical pantheon without praising him too highly on the one hand or of going to the other extreme and belittling his genius by pointing out the evident fact that noble beautiful sprightly sweet and charming as were his compositions he has not left so large an influence upon the later course of music as quite a number of artists apparently his inferiors his influence in music was largely temporary but none the less indispensable to musical progress to the neat and symmetrical periods of the haydn symphony and sonata with their fresh thematic treatment mozart added a tender grace and sweetness like the conceptions of a raphael in painting he was the apostle of melody if he had never written the art of music would have remained something quite different from what we know it and wherever there are lovers of refined noble melody there will the music of mozart be loved moreover in his best symphonies such as the one in g minor and the jupiter in c there is a boldness and freedom of flight which beethoven scarcely surpassed he was at his best as a composer of operas he was one of the fathers of the artistic song with music for every stanza differing according to the sentiment of the words and while the dramatic coloration is not forgotten in his operas they are a constant flow of charming inexhaustible melody which sings most divinely in short taking his works through and through mozart was what in the words of mr matthew arnold we might call the composer of sweet and light his music glows with the radiance of immortal beauty end of chapter twenty six chapter twenty seven of a popular history of the art of music from the earliest times until the present by w s b matthews this librivox recording is in the public domain beethoven and his works the labors of haydn and mozart in the rich field of instrumental music were followed immediately by those of ludwig van beethoven who was born at the little town of bonn on the rhine about twenty miles above cologne in seventeen seventy he died at vienna eighteen twenty seven the years between these dates were filled with labor and inspiration beyond those of any other master beethoven's place in music is at the head whether he or bach ought to be reckoned the very greatest of all the great geniuses who have appeared in music is a question which might be discussed eternally without ever being settled considered merely as an artist capable of transforming musical material in an endless variety of ways he would perhaps be placed somewhat lower than bach but considered as a tone poet gifted with the faculty of making hearers feel as he felt and see as he saw with the inner eyes of tonal sense no master ought to be placed above him this is the general opinion now of all the world taine the french critic in his work on art names four great souls belonging to the highest order of genius dante shakespeare michelangelo and beethoven the company is a good one and beethoven rightfully belongs in it his early life was wholly different from that of the gifted mozart he was the son of a dissipated tenor singer and his mother was rather an incapable person when the boy was about eleven years old he began to play the viola in the orchestra he was already a good pianist and it was said of him that he was able to play nearly the whole of the well-tempered clavier by heart 
and at the age of eleven and a half he was left in charge during nefa's absence as deputy organist his improvisations had already attracted attention and when he was a little past twelve he was made assistant musical conductor cymbalist having to prepare the operas adapt them to the orchestra and the players of the theatre and sometimes to train the whole company for several months together while nefa the director was away all this without salary in this practical school of adversity the boy grew up arranging continually training the orchestra adapting music and composing for he began this very soon in fact we have certain sonatinas of his composed while he was but ten years old he was direct in his speech almost to rudeness not like mozart attractive in his personal appearance and rather awkward in society where he was continually breaking things upsetting the water the ink or whatever liquid was in his way nevertheless there must have been something attractive about this young man of independent manners for very early in life and all the way through it he made friends with the aristocracy count waldstein a few years his senior to whom he afterward dedicated the so-called waldstein sonata opus fifty three in c early became interested in him hired a piano for him and sent it to his room that he might have opportunity to practice there was a family of von breunings in bonn consisting of the mother three boys and a daughter where the young beethoven often stayed for several days together this was one of the most refined families in town and it was here that the unfortunate young beethoven got his first glimpses of a true home life and his first realization of the refining influence of woman's society he learned english in order that he might be able to read shakespeare in the original he also learned a little italian and french in short the boy appears at good advantage from every point of view except from that of mere appearance this life of labor and responsibility was broken in upon when he was about seventeen in seventeen eighty seven he was sent to vienna and there is a tradition that he played there before mozart who is reported to have prophesied favorably concerning him there is very little left us concerning his first visit to the great austrian capital then as ever since the home of music he was soon back again in bonn and there for yet another year and a half he went on with his work his mother dying he had no longer any responsibility to retain him there so when he was about twenty-one he set out again for vienna where all the remainder of his life was spent at vienna he immediately began to give concerts in which his piano playing was the main feature and his improvising upon themes presented by the audience this art always remained one of his great distinctions the surest proof of genius the possession of musical fantasy in which every thought immediately suggests something else he devoted himself to serious study of counterpoint and composition under the instruction of haydn at first but later with albrechtsberger his two great elements of power at this period were his playing and his improvising cerny says his improvisation was most brilliant and striking in whatever company he might chance to be he knew how to produce such an effect upon every hearer that frequently not an eye remained dry while many would break out into loud sobs for there was something wonderful about his expression in addition to the beauty and originality of his ideas and his spirited manner of rendering them the limits of the present work do not admit of following the career of this great master in the detail which would otherwise be desirable it must suffice to mention the more salient features contrary to the precedent established by mozart beethoven was in no hurry to appear as a composer of ambitious pieces after the early practical experiences above described 
and the further advantage of studies in vienna under the best teachers at that time living it was not until seventeen ninety five that he appeared as composer of his first concerto for pianoforte and orchestra a mozart-like work but with an adagio of true beethovenish flavor a year later he published his first three sonatas for pianoforte dedicated to haydn these three works are in styles totally unlike each other and there is little or no doubt that each one of them was modeled after some existing work which at that time was highly esteemed in vienna the first in f minor is plainly after one by emmanuel bach in the same key the adagio of this is especially interesting not only because it shows a freedom and a pure lyric quality totally foreign to emmanuel bach and beyond mozart even but because it was taken out of a quartet which he had written when he was fifteen years old this shows that even at that early age beethoven had arrived at the conception of his peculiar style of slow movements which differed from those of mozart in having a more song-like quality and a deeper and more serious expression the impression of a deep soul is very marked in the largo of the first concerto and there are few of his later works which carry it more plainly in all some sixty works precede this opus two which is the modest mark affixed to these three sonatas the third in c is still different from the other two and was fashioned apparently after some composition of clementi or dussek the adagio takes a direction which must have been regarded as not entirely successful for nowhere else does the composer follow it out then followed a succession of pieces of every sort not rapidly like mozart's compositions as if they represented the overflowing of an inexhaustible spring but deliberately as if the world were not ready for them too rapidly one after another each in succession carrying the treatment of the pianoforte to a finer point and each different from its predecessor whether of contemporaneous publication or of a former year until by the end of the century he had reached the sonata patatique a work which marked a prodigious advance in expression and boldness over anything that can be shown from any other master of the period mention having been made of the slow movements in these works in which point they were perhaps more strikingly differentiated from those of the composers previous the largo of the sonata in d major opus ten may be mentioned as an example of a peculiarly broad and dramatic almost speaking rhapsody or reverie for piano which not only calls for true feeling in the interpreter but also for technical qualities of touch and breadth of tone such as must have been distinctly in advance of the instruments of the day meanwhile a variety of chamber pieces had been composed many of them of decided merit this was a great period of activity with the young composer he had found his voice within two years from the sonata pathetique he had composed all the sonatas up to the two numbered opus twenty seven in which the so-called moonlight stands second and between these a variety of variations and several important chamber pieces not forgetting the oratorio christ on the mount of olives a work which although not fully successful nevertheless contained many beautiful ideas and one chorus which must be ranked among the best which the repertory of oratorio can show hallelujah to the father the year eighteen hundred also saw the first performance of the beautiful and romantic third concerto for pianoforte and orchestra the first symphony had been performed in eighteen hundred and by eighteen o four we have the great heroic symphony the kreutzer sonata and the appassionata with all that lie between never did tone poet give out great inspirations like these so freely each is an advance upon the previous distancing all works of similar composers and each one surpassing his own previous efforts 
this activity continued with little or no interruption until eighteen twelve after which there is quite a break beethoven occupying himself with pot boilers for the english market in the way of arrangements of songs for instrumental accompaniment of these there are many scotch and other besides masses canons for voices and the like in eighteen fourteen we have the lovely sonata in e minor for piano opus ninety and in eighteen eighteen the great sonata for hammer clavier opus one o six then in eighteen twenty one and eighteen twenty two the last of the sonatas which carry this form of pianoforte writing to a point which it had never previously reached if since and then the Mess Solonel and the ninth symphony the latter having been composed in eighteen twenty two to eighteen twenty three after this came the last quartet for strings compositions which have been much written about but which time has shown to be among the most beautiful and understandable of all that the great master produced meanwhile as a man beethoven had been subject to his vicissitudes but upon the whole while no longer the popular composer of the day his seriousness prevented that he was in comfortable circumstances but annoyed by the care of a nephew of irregular habits and reprehensible character for many years now beethoven had been getting deaf and for the past ten or twelve he had been unable to hear ordinary conversation so that communication had to be carried on with him by writing superficial observers inferred from this fact that the inability to hear his compositions must have reacted unfavorably upon them and probably accounted for many passages which were unlike his early works and unintelligible or unlovely to the critics aforesaid it is true that between the early and the latest compositions of beethoven there is a greater difference in intelligibility than between the early and the late compositions of any other master but the difference is not one of judgment on his part but purely one of different conception different melodic structure and deeper effect the ninth symphony which the first players called impossible has lived to be counted not simply the greatest of all of beethoven's works but the greatest of all instrumental music it has been named as an impassable barrier beyond which no later composer might pass and compose an instrumental symphony nothing could be more unjust or mistaken every composition of beethoven is a fantasia which in his early work indeed has the form of the sonata the accepted serious form of the day but in the works of the middle period the limits of the sonata form were crossed in many directions and in the latest the sonata is forsaken entirely but this is not to say that beethoven had gone beyond the sonata form beethoven was an improviser in music quite as surely as his wildest successor schumann and he wrote as he felt at the time he lost nothing in being deaf his inner tonal sense was as acute as ever and had been trained as the tonal sense of few composers ever was in point of fact the compositions of the later period are as sweet as those of any former period whatever the last sonata for the pianoforte is one of the most advanced compositions that exist for the instrument it is a tone poem which will outlast most other things that beethoven wrote for this instrument in fact the accuracy with which the capacity of the instrument is gauged is one of the most striking peculiarities of the last sonatas and other late works of this master meanwhile piano technique has advanced to a point where these great works no longer present the insurmountable difficulties that they did when first composed their general acceptance has been delayed by the foolish notion that there was about them something sacred and secluded from the apprehension of ordinary readers this is not the case they are within reach and repay study beethoven's last days were not pleasant he lived the life of a bachelor and his nephew was a source of trouble it is thought by many that the neglect of his nephew to order a physician in time when requested to do so by his uncle was the immediate occasion of the death of the great man beethoven died march twenty seventh eighteen twenty seven after a serious illness in which dropsical symptoms were among the most troublesome 
there was a grand funeral in which impressive exercises were held and the body was deposited in consecrated ground in the cemetery at waring near vienna the allusions to the compositions of this composer in the preceding pages are very fragmentary and in fact are expected merely to direct attention to those mentioned there are many others almost equally worthy of attention but upon the whole the reputation of beethoven as a tone poet must rest first upon the nine symphonies then upon the string quartets the other chamber music next upon the concertos of which the third and fourth for pleasing beauty and the fifth for deep poetical meaning have never been equaled by those of any other composer there remain the sonatas for pianoforte and for piano and violin three large volumes containing a multitude of exquisite strains which the world would be poor indeed to lose in personal appearance beethoven was rugged rather than pleasing he was rather short five feet five inches but very wide across the shoulders and strong his ruddy face had high cheekbones and was crowned by very thick hair which originally was brown but in later life perfectly white his eyes were black and rather small but very bright and piercing his natural expression was grave almost severe but his smile was extremely winning and he was jovial in humor he was very fond of the country walking in the fields where under a tree he would lie for half a day together humming the melodies which occurred to him and making notes in the bits of blank paper which he always carried these pocket notebooks have been preserved and we find in them themes in crude form which he used for some important movement or other often several years later among the works produced while this habit was strongest were the sixth and seventh symphonies than which no works in music are more charming End of chapter twenty seven chapter twenty eight of a popular history of the art of music from the earliest times until the present by w s b matthews this librivox recording is in the public domain haydn mozart and beethoven compared the three masters haydn mozart and beethoven in relation to the symphony stand upon a plane of substantial equality whether we estimate their merits according to the absolute worth of the compositions they produced in this form or in the value of the additions which each in turn made to the ideal of his predecessor naturally as the latest of the three though so far contemporaneous with them as to form part of a single movement in the progress of art the symphonies of beethoven are greater in certain respects and as also was to have been expected from his general depth of mind and seriousness of purpose they are perhaps somewhat more severe or elevated in style and sentiment nevertheless the ideal of the three writers was but slightly different all alike sought to weave tones into a succession of agreeable and beautiful combinations related as representing a continued flight of spirit a reverie of the beautiful haydn has the honor of having created the form his fortunate innovation upon the traditions of his predecessors by adding the second and contrasting theme and his happy faculty of working out the middle part of the first movement thematically in a style of free fantasy based upon the various devices of counterpoint and canonic imitation not only suggested to the later composers a way in which an endless variety of pleasing tone pictures might be created but established and demonstrated by the clearness with which he did it and the ever fresh variety and charm of his works that this was the way in which symphonic material must be put together for further particulars relating to the sonata form as such the student is referred to my primer of musical forms arthur p schmidt boston eighteen ninety one the form thus established by haydn mozart accepted and followed in all his symphonies with few and unimportant variations his additions to the general idea of orchestral effect were in the direction of a sweeter cantilena a vocal and song-like quality which pervades every movement and which in the slow movement rises to a height of refined and exquisite song never surpassed by any composer 
beethoven is often more impassioned at times more forcible but it is never possible to say of the pure spirit of mozart that this refined and gentle soul might not have broken mountains and shaken the hills if he had chosen to do so his refinement is like that of a seraph as we see it illustrated in the feminine-looking faces of the greek apollos and the saint michaels and archangels of guido reni and raphael it is free from passion and toil but no man dares set a limit to the strength therein concealed in the slow movements of the pianoforte sonatas of mozart we do not find this quality so plainly manifested the instrument was still too imperfect and did not invite it moreover the greater portion of these compositions bear the appearance of having been written for the use of amateurs but in the string quartet and the symphonies it is different here the spirit of mozart has free course and he goes from one beauty to another with the sure instinct of a master before whom all tonal kingdoms are wide open this can be seen even in the pianoforte arrangements of the greater symphonies the melodies apparently so simple and diatonic are susceptible of being sung with heartfelt fervor under the fingers of the violinist or by the voice of the great singer and when so sung they become transfigured with beauty luminous from within like lovely angel faces glowing with radiance from the higher realms of bliss without this idea of singing and more than this of a pure spirit singing the mozart adagios are open to the charge often made against them in these later days by the unthinking who find in them only the external peculiarities of simplicity and diatonic quality with the unsensationalism which technical reserve implies nor is it true that beethoven is incapable of this elevated soaring in the higher realms of the merely beautiful in song there is generally an undercurrent of deeper pathos in all his sustained slow movements but in the early symphonies especially in the second there is a long slow movement of heavenly depth and quality indeed without pausing to individualize we may say once for all that the slow movements of beethoven are nearly as sweet and as forgetful as rapturous as those of mozart even when he takes the lower key of the minor with its implication of suffering and pain there is still a sweetness which once heard can never be forgotten think of the lovely allegretto of the seventh symphony with its persistent motive of a quarter and two eighths even in an arrangement for the pianoforte this is still impressive upon the organ yet more so but how much more so when given by the orchestra with the lovely changing colors of beethoven's instrumentation the progress from haydn's slow movement to that of beethoven's is in the direction of depth self-forgetfulness and elevated reverie having in it a quality distinctly church-like devotional worshipful and reposeful in the heavenly sense the finest example of this is in the slow movement of the ninth symphony of beethoven where the composer has one of those lofty moods which even in his younger times mrs von breuning used to call his raptus rapture of song in a technical point of view the handling of the themes becomes more masterly in beethoven than even in mozart mainly perhaps because the symphonies of beethoven represent a more mature point in his mental and artistic career than do those of mozart the third symphony of beethoven was written in eighteen o three the composer being thirty-three years old the fourth waited until he was thirty-five or six mozart died at the age of thirty-five and whatever we have from his lofty pen came to the young mozart not yet having reached middle life observe also the rapidity with which these great works followed one another from the pen of beethoven when once he had found his voice the fifth symphony was written in eighteen o eight in the same year he wrote also the sixth four years later in eighteen twelve the next two symphonies the seventh and eighth then a long pause filled up with other works and at length when the composer was fifty-three years of age in eighteen twenty three the mighty ninth if mozart's life had been spared to enter into the more comfortable and dignified openings which his death prevented what might we not have had from him 
in one sense there is a distinct difference between the symphonies of mozart and those of beethoven the passionate ideal the picture of a deep soul tossed yet triumphant is nearer to the latter whatever mozart may have experienced in the way of contradiction of sinners as st paul calls it he never allows the fact to find entrance into his music and especially into his symphonies whether he felt that these moments did not belong to a high ideal of orchestral pieces or whether he was glad to find in the tone world forgetfulness of sorrows and troubles we do not know but beethoven came nearer to the great time of the romantic the inherent interest of whatever belongs to the human soul was an idea of his time and unconsciously to himself perhaps it entered into and colored his work the ninth symphony belongs to the period when hegel was delivering his lectures upon the deepest questions of philosophy and laying it down as a fundamental principle that it is the place of art to represent everything whatever which sinks or swells in the human spirit not alone all the noble and lovely but also the ignoble the vicious the unworthy and particularly the tragic to the end that the soul may learn to know itself and awaken to a deeper and better self-consciousness beethoven felt the mental movement of his day while his acquaintance with other prominent literary men of his time made little headway owing in part to his deafness and in part to his very strong self-consciousness he read and thought and felt himself akin with the whole human race he was a socialist and a republican by instinct man stands upon that which he really is was a form of self-assertiveness which if not actually enunciated by him at least represents his attitude toward the conventionalities and superficialities of the courts the social orders and the general movement of mind into which he entered moreover this was the time when the romantic poets of germany had already set the world thinking their new ideas close by the great composer in the same city in fact worked a young man worshipping almost the very ground upon which beethoven walked but for the most part unknown to him franz schubert who in the symphony was classic to the very highest degree and a tone poet gifted lyrically not less than mozart himself a composer whose ideas have equal refinement and grace with those of mozart together with a certain charm peculiarly their own and an instinct for musical coloration which has never found its superior this obscure young man whose lofty genius was recognized only after his soul had taken its flight from earth was the founder of the modern romantic school of music the musical commentator upon the productions of all the best of german poets a composer of such inexhaustible fertility and melodic inspiration that schumann said of him that if he had lived he would have set to music the whole german literature thus by the combined efforts of all these composers of schubert no less than the three great masters of whom we are more particularly speaking the symphony came to its full expression in their relation to the sonata these three great masters do not stand in the same position of quasi-equality haydn is here the first as already in the symphony but in his sonatas he is always rather hampered and never attains the flow of his slow melodies for the violin mozart also while a beautiful player upon the piano forte of his day did not possess the prescience of beethoven who was able to see over the piano forte of his time and write as if he felt the assurance of the nobler and yet nobler instruments of these later times here he stands with bach who in his great chromatic fantasia and fugue requires and confidently expects the breadth of tone and the power of the modern piano it was beethoven's fortune to live during the early days of the modern instrument just after his death the era of virtuoso piano playing began the first appearances of thalberg having been made as early as about eighteen thirty he was himself a great pianist as we see in the concertos which he wrote always intending to play them at some concert or other in near prospect 
occasionally indeed he overshot his mark as notably in the fifth which being finished just before his concert in eighteen o nine he found too difficult for his fingers whereupon he was obliged to fall back on the third moreover the pianists hummel and dussek were already before the public and clementi had made his concert tours and established the lines of the classical technique upon its brilliant side all these influences find their illustration in the music of beethoven and especially find illustration in the last and greatest of his pianoforte sonatas these beautiful tone poems were long regarded as impossible but the genius of schumann and liszt came to their rescue by introducing a new style of touch and technique which when once found proved to be the link missing for the proper interpretation of these till then obscure works moreover beethoven occupied a different attitude toward the sonata form from that which he held to the symphony he deviated from the sonata form in every direction and this not alone in his later works when we might suppose he had become wearied with the repetition of his ideas in the same order but in his works of middle life when as yet he might apparently have gone on writing sonatas indefinitely so fresh so novel and so varied were the tone pictures which he gave the world under this name he seems to have regarded music as an improvisation not to be held to some one fixed type of expression but free to go wherever the fancy of the poet took him to the end that the entire heavens of the tone world might in time be visited he expects of his readers an element of the devotee it is not for amateurs that he writes still less for the votaries of fashionable society with its emptiness and repeated insincerities there is a suggestion of entering into the closet of shutting the door as a prerequisite to the full enjoyment of these ineffable pictures and images which come from his revelation in the present full-grown faith in the doctrine of the capacity of man for a development continually progressive it would be presumptuous to say that the three composers haydn mozart and beethoven have reached the limit of art so far as instrumental music goes in the nature of the case there is not nor can there be an ultima thule in art whatever the splendor of color the nobility of conception or the sincerity and loyalty of purpose and however resplendent the works created by these exceptional talents there is reason to hope that better works still may yet be in store stronger and yet stronger imaginations more perfect technique of expression and finer inspiration may yet be the lot of fortunate individuals of the twentieth century inheriting the richly diversified musical experiences of the present time but in one direction there is little doubt that these three great masters did carry the art of instrumental music to a pinnacle beyond which no one as yet has been able to soar they represent the climax of classical art in the nature of the case the term classical itself is subject to an element of uncertainty according to the philosopher hegel the classical is that art in which the form is beautiful and wholly satisfactory in symmetry while the content exactly matches it in fullness and beauty or in ordinary usage the classical is the first class the superior the highly finished the standard and since music is a matter of sense perception and the impressions resulting from it are in some degree dependent upon the ability of the hearer to find the principles of unity in other words the sense of it every generation extends the list of the classical and includes much which the preceding one found imperfect and strained so far as our knowledge and experience have yet gone however there is a sense in which the productions of these great masters are likely to remain long unmatched in beauty and worth nothing has been done since that surpasses the sustained beauty of the beethoven adagios of which we find the most beautiful specimens naturally among the orchestral pieces and in the chamber music where he could depend upon the long phrases and sustained tones of the violins 
but in the sonatas for pianoforte he is equally at home he seems to have foreseen the possibilities of the modern piano in his latest sonatas there are passages which foresee the modern technique and suggest effects which only the pianoforte of the past thirty years has been capable of attaining this is the prophetic element in the writings of this great master the same difference in the sweep of mind shows itself in the lighter movements in the minuets haydn is playful mozart is occasionally tender and arch beethoven alone is vigorous and humoristic in the modern sense and in the finales of the sonatas there is a movement in those of beethoven which we look for in vain in those of the older composers it was not in haydn nor yet in mozart to play with tones in this masterly spirit hence the true relation of these great masters might be summed up without intending to be disrespectful to either as the following haydn provided the form the order of keys and the general character of the contrasts between the two subjects mozart invented a myriad of tender nuances which illustrated the fine points of music and imparted to the works a sweetness and pleasing quality which everybody recognized as irresistible beethoven added to these ingredients of popular music a depth a soulful quality an earnestness and a universal intelligibility to spirits of the necessary depth which have stood to all the world ever since as models such in general are the points of relation and of contrast it is not to be overlooked however that the tendency of musical taste is to leave the works of mozart behind haydn is gaining ground relatively through the admiration of musicians for the cleverness with which he treats themes beethoven holds his own by reason of his vigorous personality which is to be felt in every page of his music mozart however appeals less to the taste of the present time and his pianoforte works are now cultivated chiefly for technical purposes in the earlier stages of study End of chapter twenty eight chapter twenty nine of a popular history of the art of music from the earliest times until the present by w s b matthews this librivox recording is in the public domain opera in the eighteenth century part one upon the musical side and in one instance upon the dramatic side as well there were three great forces in opera during this century the first of these in order of time was karl heinrich graun seventeen o one to seventeen fifty nine a native of dresden he was educated there and having early a beautiful voice became treble singer to the town council a curious name for a position in the leading church he profited by the instruction of the official directors of the choir and the church petzold and schmidt and very early he was an enthusiastic student of the compositions of the hamburg director kaiser whose style influenced his own in his later work lotti the italian composer who conducted a series of performances in dresden with a picked company of italian singers was another force operative in his development he early commenced to write cantatas and motets for the seminary of which he was a member all of which show traces of the italian influences in particular his biographer speaks of a passion cantata in which an opening chorus lasset uns auf sehen auf jesum is singularly forcible for the work of a boy of fifteen his first entrance upon operatic work was as tenor when he was scarcely twenty-four years of age being dissatisfied with the music of his part written by one schurman a local director he substituted other airs of his own composition which were so popular that he was commissioned to write an opera and was appointed assistant director his first opera poliodoro was successful and he was commissioned to write five others some in italian some in german besides these he composed several cantatas for church use and several instrumental pieces in seventeen thirty five he was invited to the residence of the crown prince of prussia afterward frederick the great 
this powerful potentate remained ground's friend and patron until his death here among other works he composed fifty italian cantatas usually consisting of two airs with recitative in seventeen forty frederick came to the throne and gave graun the post of musical director with a salary of two thousand dollars selecting his singers in italy where his singing was very highly appreciated he returned to berlin and assumed the duties of his position here he composed no less than twenty-seven operas the last being in seventeen fifty six all in the italian style and so far as a german might master it and all making the singer the prime person of consideration and the listener next the poet took whatever of opportunity these two might not have needed his best talent both as singer and as composer lay in his power of expressing emotion in adagios in this respect he had no doubt more influence upon the development of the lyric's slow movement than he has generally been credited with later in his life he turned once more to church music and in his cantatas and especially in his oratorio der tod jesu the death of jesus a passion oratorio he made a distinct impression upon the practices of his successors in germany this work is held in nearly the same affection as the messiah of handel in england graun's influence upon the later course of opera besides the adagio aria already mentioned lay principally in his accompaniments which were often strong and highly dramatic the great operatic mind of this century and one of the greatest of all time was that of christopher willibald von gluck seventeen fourteen seventeen eighty five by the middle of the eighteenth century the influence of the italian composers helped out by the superficial german composers such as graun and hasse had reduced the italian opera to a collection of mere showpieces of singing the arias having indeed an excuse in the story but the action of the drama had been lost entirely owing to the long stretches of time needed for these elaborate arias and the recalls to which they inevitably gave rise during these pauses the action ceased entirely as we see at the present day in many italian operas still current as in the mad scene from lucia for instance in that scene where everything ought to be wild excitement the chorus singers representing the relatives and friends of poor lucia stand around while she sings long cadenzas with the flute in such trying relationships as would test the vocal technique of a sane person in the time of gluck this abuse had reached about the same height and to make the matter less bearable the italian composers had not yet attained the art of expressing sentiment simply and directly but were intent upon sweet-sounding trivialities calculated to please the groundlings but of little or no relation to the drama gluck sought to restore the ideal of the original inventors of opera with such unconscious modification as had been made meanwhile but before undertaking this he had to undergo the usual long and severe apprenticeship of reformers in his time the rules for a composer had become well settled every personage must have his or her aria immediately upon their first entrance the character of the arias had been well settled there was the aria cantabile a flowing melody very lightly accompanied affording opportunity for embellishments the aria di portamento introducing long swelling notes affording the singer opportunity for illustrating his length of breath and sustaining power and so on with several other forms of aria the part of hero whether male or female was assigned to a man an artificial soprano although it might be a hero like hercules for example the subject had to be classical and the denouement happy 
there were invariably six principal characters three men and three women the first woman was always a high soprano the second or third a contralto the first man always the hero of the piece an artificial soprano the second man might be an artificial soprano or a contralto the third man might be a bass or tenor but it was not at all unusual to confide all the male parts to artificial sopranos each principal character claimed the right to sing an aria in each of the three acts of the drama each scene ended with an aria of some one of the classes already mentioned but no two arias of the same class were permitted to follow each other gluck was the reformer destined by the fates to rectify some of these artificial traditions he was educated at the jesuit seminary in komotau and later in prague he was engaged in the musical forces of prince melzi who took him to italy where he became a pupil of the famous italian composer and teacher sammartini to this fact no doubt is due his early attachment to the italian opera here he wrote several operas all more or less in the italian style as he had been taught it and as he heard it upon every hand his first work artaserse the book by metastasio was produced with such success in milan in seventeen forty one that he presently wrote several others for other italian theatres for venice in seventeen forty one demetrio and ipermestra for cremona artamene seventeen forty three for turin alessandro nelle indie seventeen forty five for milan demofonte siface and fedra seventeen forty two seventeen forty four in all eight operas in five years none of these works in their complete form are now in existence fragments alone have been preserved if any inference is justified from these extracts the style throughout was that of the italian opera of the day the fame of gluck had now extended to england and in seventeen forty five he was invited to london to compose operas for the haymarket theatre he came and wrote the year following seventeen forty six la caduta dei giganti after which he produced the cremona opera handel assisted at the production of these two operas and is reported to have said that the author knew no more of counterpoint than a pig naumann thinks that gluck learned much from hearing handel's oratorios in england and that his subsequent deeper and nobler dramatic style was formed upon these great models the two operas produced in london made but a moderate success and gluck was commissioned to write a pasticcio or medley of styles he did so imitating all styles according to the best of his ability but it made no better effect than the works before it this was the turning point in his career the failure mortified him deeply and led him to reflect concerning the nature of dramatic music on his way back to vienna he passed through paris where he heard certain operas of rameau which also influenced his style later the declamation and the dramatic treatment of the recitative were the points upon which his attention principally dwelt upon reaching vienna he wrote a number of instrumental pieces bearing the name of symphonies pieces which in no way differed from the conventional music of the day the haydn symphony had not yet been invented and the form was wholly indeterminate there was an opera in this year also a love affair gluck was deeply in love with the beautiful and charming daughter of a rich merchant who upon no account would consent to her marriage with a musician so gluck went back to italy and there he wrote another opera rather better in quality than his previous ones early in seventeen fifty the inexorable parent died and late in the year gluck married the woman of his choice who made him a model wife being educated above the average of her times and entering into his ideals and aspirations with ever-ready sympathy 
her wealth also placed the composer in an easy position as regarded the world and permitted him to devote himself to study for nearly ten years following gluck produced occasionally an opera but as yet the man had not arrived all these were early and apprentice works at length in seventeen sixty two was produced his first masterwork orpheus and eurydice the libretto having been written by the imperial councillor calzabigi the novelty of this great work was not above the appreciation of the viennese public of the day orpheus made a decided success its principal innovations consisted in its more powerful instrumentation the introduction of a chorus having an integral part in the movement of the piece and in the highly dramatic treatment of the second act where orpheus descends into the lower world to seek his lost love nevertheless the composer had not reached true self-consciousness a retrogression followed he went back to metastasio and in conjunction with him produced three or four small operas all in his earlier style but in seventeen sixty seven he returned to calzabigi and upon a libretto of his wrote alceste which was produced at the vienna opera house in seventeen sixty seven with vastly more success than orpheus the story is that of the tragedy of euripides and the music is exclusively severe and tragic the public was divided concerning the merit of the new work already the notion of a music of the future had been conceived and the notion suggested that only in a more self-forgetful future would a work of such severity and of such lofty aim find acceptance in the dedicatory epistle to the duke of tuscany prefixed to the score gluck defines his intentions he says i seek to put music in its true purpose that is to support the poem and thus to strengthen the expression of the feelings and the interest of the situation without interrupting the action i have therefore refrained from interrupting the actor in the fervor of his dialogue by introducing the accustomed tedious ritournelle nor have i broken his phrase at an opportune vowel that the flexibility of his voice might be exhibited in a lengthy flourish nor have i written phrases for the orchestra to afford the singer opportunity to take a long breath preparatory to the accepted flourish nor have i dared to hurry over the second part of an aria when such contained the passion and the most important matter to find myself in accord with the conventional repeat of the same phrase four times as little have i permitted myself to close an aria where the sense was incomplete solely to afford the singer an opportunity of introducing a cadenza in short i have striven to abolish all these bad habits against which sound reasoning and true taste have been struggling now for so long in vain there were several numbers in alceste which exercised an influence upon subsequent composers among the more notable being the speech of the oracle which mozart must have had in mind in writing the commandatore's reply to don giovanni and the sacrificial march which probably influenced the priest's march in the magic flute gluck was forty-eight when he wrote orpheus and fifty-three when alceste appeared galled by the criticisms of his countrymen and encouraged by the friendship of the french ambassador gluck now went to paris where his operas were presently brought out but with the same varying favor as at home marie antoinette who had been his pupil befriended him and granted him a pension of six thousand francs thus supported he brought out still another grand opera in the french language iphigenie en olide produced at paris in seventeen seventy four in this work classical severity was scrupulously observed and the opera is full of telling points of dramatic musical coloration 
in armide 1777 he endeavored to show that he was equally at home in richly conceived sensuous music and succeeded so well that the famous controversy was precipitated with the italian composer piccini who had just arrived in paris preparatory to bringing out his opera of roland volumes were written in praise of italian music and in disparagement of the roughness of that of gluck on the other hand the friends of gluck stood up for him manfully and the contest raged fiercely with the usual result of thoroughly advertising the music of both gluck's last opera for paris was iphigenie en tauride seventeen seventy nine the same subject already having been treated by his rival piccini the superiority of gluck's was incontestable he died at vienna of apoplexy november fifteenth seventeen eighty seven gluck's place in art has been well summed up by padre martini and the opinion is all the more worthy of attention from the general charge of gluck's enemies that his music had overturned the traditions of pure italian art he says all the finest qualities of italian and many of those of french music with the great beauties of the german orchestra are united in his work this is tantamount to crediting gluck with having created a cosmopolitan music which is precisely the position which posterity has assigned him for the time when he wrote his music is wonderfully fine it still retains its vitality as has been vividly shown in several revivals of his orpheus within recent years in two of which in america and in italy the american prima donna madame helene hastreiter has nobly distinguished herself the third force alluded to at the outset of the chapter as having been mainly influential in german opera during the eighteenth century and until our own time it might be added was mozart whose works have already received attention in former pages of the narrative it must suffice here to remind the reader of the successes and qualities of his operas in order that he may be remembered in this connection for like gluck his art was cosmopolitan having in it the sweetness of the italian the richness of the german and occasional traces of the declamation of the french part two after lully the next great name in the history of french opera was that of jean philippe rameau sixteen eighty three seventeen sixty five this great master was one of the most versatile men of whom we have a record in music he was a mathematician physicist a profound theorist and a virtuoso upon the piano and harpsichord he is one of the four great names in music of the period of bach and handel the fourth being scarlatti his education in music began while he was very young and it is said of him that such was his talent that he could improvise a fugue upon any theme assigned when he was but fourteen years of age his father wished him to be trained for the law but music had greater charms for him and the margins of his books were marked over with crochets and quavers having become desperately in love with a fascinating young widow whom his father was opposed to his marrying he was sent at the age of seventeen to italy ostensibly to study he came therefore to milan about seventeen o one a few years before handel came there italian music was little to his taste the dignified declamation of the lully operas seemed to him better worthy of the attention of men than the tunes of the italians accordingly he took service as a violinist with a traveling operatic troupe and in this capacity visited the south of france in paris he became a pupil of the court organist marchand of whom we hear again in connection with certain tests of proficiency with handel marchand was at first delighted with his new pupil but presently dropped him when he discovered how talented he was and liable to prove a dangerous rival accordingly he left paris and took service as organist at lille which post he exchanged afterward for one at clermont in this quiet town he devoted himself to the study of harmony and to reflection upon the principles of music he read there the works of zarlino and other italian theorists 
in seventeen twenty one he returned to paris and published his treatise on harmony in which he propounded the theory of inversions his second treatise on harmony new system of musical theory was published in seventeen twenty five these works excited a great deal of attention and brought the author renown but his soul yearned for recognition as a composer and in seventeen thirty he obtained from voltaire a libretto samson this work was declined at the national opera on the grounds that the public was not attracted by biblical subjects three years later however he composed another hippolyte et arcy which was performed with moderate success he had now reached the age of fifty and entered upon the second stage of his artistic career and the second period of the french opera the admirers of rameau invited appreciation of the new works upon the ground of their being better than those of lully and all paris was divided into two opposite camps rameau is entitled to having developed his operas more musically than those of lully and the later ones became still richer upon the orchestral side the entire list of operas by rameau numbers about thirty that they did not preserve their popularity so long as those of lully is due to their deficiency upon the dramatic side especially to the inherent inexpressiveness of the music itself the treatment of the orchestra is clever in many places showing a manifest improvement over that of lully especially in the freedom of thematic work he also ventures occasionally on inharmonic changes contemporaneous with him was that remarkable genius jean-jacques rousseau seventeen twelve seventeen seventy eight the father of the kindergarten idea and of many other humanitarian and educational novelties rousseau's importance in the history of music is not sufficient to justify an account of his early days with a great fondness for music he found it extremely difficult to read by note as he was almost entirely self-taught this led him to devise a simpler notation which he did about seventeen forty publishing an account of it in seventeen forty three his system was substantially that of the tonic sol fa except that he used figures in place of letters he presented a memorial to the academy of sciences upon this subject in seventeen forty two but his plan was so vigorously opposed by rameau that nothing came of it nevertheless the idea was afterward worked out by m paris in the present century and has proven very useful among the orpheonists in seventeen fifty two rameau produced his first opera le divin du village a very light affair somewhat on the order of what uh, germans called a zingspiel the most remarkable piece that he produced was his comedy pygmalion in seventeen seventy five there is no song in this opera the only music in it is that for orchestral interludes in the intervals between the phrases of declamation the continuation of french opera was due to philidor the celebrated chess player seventeen twenty six seventeen ninety five he was very talented in many directions and from the production of his first opera in seventeen fifty nine to his last belisaire finished by his friend berton and produced in seventeen ninety six he enjoyed an uninterrupted popularity having brought out in that time about twenty-one operas some of them comic one or two of them serious his music is light and pleasing and he is credited with having been the first to produce descriptive airs le Maréchal, and the unaccompanied quartet tom jones seventeen sixty four the great merit of his works was their clever construction for the stage contemporaneous with him was pierre alexander monsigny seventeen twenty nine eighteen seventeen not having been intended for the profession of music he had a classical education and upon the death of his father obtained a clerkship in paris he belonged to a noble family and at first pursued music as a recreation his first opera was produced after five months tuition in harmony and theory in seventeen fifty nine this was followed by about thirty other works his greatest skill was melody and ease of treatment 
in eighteen twelve he was appointed inspector of the conservatory and in eighteen thirteen he succeeded Gretry in the institute and in eighteen sixteen he received the cross of the legion of honor upon the appearance of andre ernest modeste gretry seventeen forty one eighteen thirteen we come to a real genius although not of the first order he was the son of a poor violinist of liege belgium and when about sixteen years of age he composed six small symphonies and a mass the latter gained him the protection of the canon of the cathedral who sent him to rome where he pursued his studies with very little credit after producing one small work in rome he made his way to paris and his first opera le huron was successfully produced in seventeen sixty eight this was followed by more than fifty operas of all sorts some of which still survive gretry was a very charming man and wrote upon music and other subjects in a pleasing manner his importance in the history of music is due more to the number of works by him than to their striking musical qualities another remarkable musician of this period in france was francois joseph gossec seventeen thirty three eighteen twenty nine who also was a belgian from Enol. his early training was obtained in the cathedral at antwerp he came to paris in seventeen fifty one and became a pupil of rameau he conceived the idea of writing orchestral symphonies and produced some pieces of this kind in seventeen fifty four five years before the date of haydn's first in seventeen fifty nine he published some quartets in seventeen sixty he produced his best messe des morts in which he made a sensation by writing the tuba mirum for two orchestras one of wind instruments concealed outside berlioz probably derived an idea from this he wrote twelve operas which were successfully produced twenty-six symphonies and a variety of other works he founded his amateur concerts in seventeen seventy and his sacred concerts in seventeen seventy three in seventeen eighty four he organized his school of singing out of which the conservatory of music was afterward developed upon the foundation of the conservatory in seventeen ninety five he was appointed inspector with cherubini and Meul. his influence upon the general development of music is local to paris where he did more to enrich opera on the instrumental side than any other composer of the eighteenth century etienne henri Meul seventeen sixty three eighteen seventeen was another of these prolific composers of light operas son of a cook at givet he had passion for music and soon became a good organist at fourteen he was deputy organist and in seventeen seventy eight he arrived in paris and at once commenced to study and teach the next year he was so fortunate as to listen to gluck's iphigenie en torride which made a great impression upon him he called upon gluck himself in order to express his admiration and in consequence of the encouragement received from the eminent composer he proceeded to write three operas one after another which are now lost his fourth was accepted at the academy but not performed finally his euphrosine et coradien was produced at the opera comique in seventeen ninety the public immediately recognized a force a sincerity of accent a dramatic truth and a gift of accurately expressing the meaning of words which always remained the main characteristics of Meul within the next seventeen years he produced twenty-four operas besides a large number of cantatas and other works upon the whole this sincere master must be regarded as one of the most eminent in the history of french opera somewhat later in the operatic field was jean francois le sueur seventeen sixty three eighteen thirty seven after serving as a boy chorister at abbeville and amiens he came to paris where in seventeen eighty six he was appointed musical director at notre dame and distinguished himself by giving magnificent performances of motets and solemn masses with a large orchestra in addition to the usual forces his first opera la caverne was produced in seventeen ninety three after which he wrote four others as well as three which were never performed 
in the line of church music he was much more productive and one might say more at home his music is marked by grand simplicity as a teacher in later life he was very celebrated among his pupils being the greatest of french masters berlioz the most gifted of the french composers of light opera at the end of the eighteenth century and in the part of the nineteenth was francois adrien boileau seventeen seventy five eighteen thirty four this talented musician was born at rouen where his father was secretary to the archbishop the boy was educated in the ecclesiastical schools having begun as a choir boy in the cathedral his first little work for the stage was performed at rouen when he was about seventeen la fille coupable with such success that the author was encouraged to go and seek his fortune in paris here for a long time he met with little encouragement and was obliged to make a living at first as a piano tuner later he was fortunate enough to have certain romances of his sung by popular singers and thus his name became somewhat known for these songs he received the munificent compensation of two dollars and a half each presently he secured a libretto la do de suzette which was composed and performed at the opera comique with so much encouragement that he soon after produced his one-act opera la famille suisse his popularity was not fully established however until zorem et zulnar in seventeen ninety eight this work possesses a vein of tenderness a refined orchestration and singularly clear and pleasing forms in eighteen hundred his world-wide favorite le caliph de bagdad was produced and its taking overture was played from one end of europe to the other upon all possible instruments and combinations of them his other two successful operas were jean de paris eighteen twelve and la dame blanche eighteen twenty five both these made as much reputation outside of france as in it and are still produced in germany in eighteen o three boileau received an appointment in st petersburg and lived there six years but he returned to paris later and in eighteen seventeen became mayu's successor as teacher of composition at the conservatory of the french stage during this epoch it is to be observed that nothing of a large and serious character was produced upon it except the operas of gluck which of course were not indigenous to france what progress was made by the composers before mentioned and others of less importance consisted in acquiring fluency ease and effective construction the ground had been prepared from which the century following would reap a harvest part three in italy during the eighteenth century opera continued to be cultivated by a succession of gifted and prolific composers at the beginning of the century the great alexander scarlatti was at the height of his career as also were lotti and the younger masters mentioned in the former chapter all these composers followed in the style established by scarlatti and porpora the most talented of the italians of this period was giovanni battista pergolesi seventeen ten seventeen thirty seven this gifted genius was born at yezin in the roman states but when a mere child was admitted to the conservatory of the poor in jesus christ at naples where his education was completed he commenced as a violin player and attracted attention while a mere child by his original passages chromatics new harmonies and modulations a report of his performances of this kind being made to his teacher mateis he desired to hear them for himself which he did with much surprise and asked the boy whether he could write them down the next day the youngster presented himself with a sonata for the violin as a specimen of his power this led to his receiving regular instruction in counterpoint the first composition of his was a sacred drama called la conversione di san guglielmo written while he was still a student it was performed with comic intermezzi parentheses s i c exclamation point close parentheses in the summer of seventeen thirty one at the cloister of st agnello the dramatic element in this work is very pronounced and the violin is treated with considerable feeling 
his first opera la salustia was produced in seventeen thirty one it is notable for improvement in the orchestration in the winter of this same year he wrote his comic intermezzo la serva padrona a sprightly operetta which had a moderate success at the time but afterward for nearly a hundred years was played in all parts of europe he wrote several other operas which had but moderate success although many of them were performed with considerable applause after his death by general consent the most beautiful work of pergolesi was his stabat mater which was written to order for a religious confraternity for use on good friday in place of a stabat by scarlatti the price paid being ten ducats about nine dollars it is for two voices a soprano and contralto and is excellently written no sooner was he dead than his music immediately became the object of admiration his operas and lighter pieces being played in all parts of italy he died at the age of twenty-six being the youngest master who has ever left a permanent impression in musical history one of the most prolific composers of this period was niccolo iomelli seventeen fourteen seventeen seventy four iomelli represents the neapolitan school having been educated first at the conservatory of san onofrio and later at that of la pieta dei turchini his earlier inclination was church music and in order to perfect himself he went to rome this was in seventeen forty and two of his operas were there produced he afterward visited vienna where he produced several operas and in seventeen forty nine he was appointed assistant musical director at st peter's in rome a position which he held for five years after which he went to stuttgart as musical director while in germany he had a very great reputation as an opera composer in seventeen seventy mozart wrote from naples the opera here is by Iomelli. it is beautiful but the style is too elevated as well as too antique for the theatre his later life was spent in naples besides many operas he wrote a number of compositions for the church it perhaps gives a good idea of the estimation in which he was held while living that a critic highly esteemed in his day said that it would be a sorry day for the world when the operas of Iomelli were forgotten at the same time pronouncing them superior to those of mozart not a single line of Iomelli is performed at the present time nor is likely ever to be but the works of mozart still retain their popularity another prolific composer of the neapolitan school was antonio maria gasparo zacchini seventeen twenty four seventeen eighty six this clever composer was very successful in his lifetime his operas being produced in all parts of europe nevertheless they are monotonous in character and have little depth he has very little importance for the history of music still another also from the neapolitan school was piccini seventeen twenty eight eighteen hundred his first operas were produced in seventeen fifty four and from that time on for about forty years he was a very popular composer his works being produced in every theatre and in seventeen seventy eight he was set up as an idol by his admirers in opposition to gluck he was highly honored by napoleon who took pleasure in distinguishing him for the sake of humbling several much more deserving musicians the complete list of his works in fetis contains eighty operas his biographer credits him with one hundred and thirty three yet another composer of the neapolitan school was giovanni paisello seventeen forty one eighteen fifteen from the time of his first operas to his death he was highly esteemed as a composer in seventeen seventy six he was invited by the empress catherine to st petersburg where he lived for eighty years and among other operas which he composed while there was il barbiere di siviglia in seventeen ninety nine he was called to paris where napoleon greatly distinguished him upon leaving paris in eighteen o three napoleon desired him to name his successor when he performed the creditable act of nominating le sueur who was at that time unknown 
the list of his works embraces ninety-four operas and one hundred three masses his music was melodious and pleasing but rather feeble he is regarded however as the inventor of the concerted finale which has since been so largely developed in opera perhaps the best of all the neapolitan composers of this half century was zingarelli seventeen fifty two eighteen twenty seven zingarelli was not only a good musician and a good composer but a man of ability and principle he was an associate pupil with cimarosa after leaving the conservatory he took lessons upon the violin and in seventeen seventy nine produced a cantata at the san carlo theater two years later his first opera was produced at the same theater with great applause montezuma he then went to milan where most of his later works were produced he was an extremely rapid worker his librettist stating it as a fact that all the music of his successful opera of alzinda was composed in seven days although the composer was in ill health at the time another of his best works his giulietta e romeo was composed in about eight days it is said that this astonishing facility was acquired through the discipline of his teacher speranza who obliged his pupils to write the same composition many times over with change of time and signature but without any change in the fundamental ideas while busily engaged as a popular opera composer zingarelli found time to compose much church music his most important works being masses and cantatas of the former there still exist a very large number of the latter about twenty he made a trip to france in seventeen eighty nine where he brought out a new opera l'antigone he was appointed musical director at the cathedral at milan in seventeen ninety two and two years later at loreto naples thence he was transferred to the sistine chapel at rome and finally in eighteen thirteen he was appointed director of the royal college of music at naples in which position he spent the remainder of his long and active life he produced about thirty-two operas twenty-one oratorios and cantatas and there are about five hundred manuscripts of his in the annuale di loreto as a composer of comic operas zingarelli became popular all over europe but he was nevertheless a serious even a devout composer he was extremely abstemious rose early worked hard all day and after a piece of bread and a glass of wine for supper retired early to rest he was never married but found his satisfaction in the successes of his musical children among whom were bellini mercadante ricci sir michael costa florimo etc part four in this as in the preceding century there was very little activity in england in the realm of opera music beyond that of foreign composers imported for special engagements in the last part of the seventeenth century however there was a real genius in english music who if he had lived longer would in all probability have made a mark distinguishable even across the channel and upon the chart of the world's activity in music that composer was henry purcell sixteen fifty eight sixteen ninety five born in london of a musical family his father having died while the boy was a mere infant he was presently admitted as a choir boy in the chapel royale the musical director being captain cook and later pelham humphrey in sixteen seventy five when yet only seventeen years of age purcell composed an opera dido and aeneas which is grand opera in all respects there being no spoken dialogue but recitative the first work of the kind in english it contains some very spirited numbers after this he composed music to a large number of dramatic pieces many anthems held the position of master of the chapel royal and in many ways occupied an honored and distinguished position he was one of the earliest composers to furnish music to some of shakespeare's plays and his full fathom five and come unto these yellow sands from the tempest have held the stage until the present time 
he was in all respects the most vigorous and original of english composers he died in the fullness of his powers and was buried in westminster abbey the portrait here given was painted by john klosterman and originally engraved for his orpheus britannicus it is impossible not to wonder whether the future of english music might not have been better if the powerful figure of the great master handel had not dwarfed all native effort in britain after purcell in the eighteenth century the most notable english composer was dr thomas arne seventeen ten seventeen seventy eight who enjoyed a well-deserved reputation as an excellent dramatic composer the author of many songs still reckoned among english classics and the composer of the national hymn rule britannia which occurred as an incident in his mask of alfred seventeen forty dr arne has all the characteristics of a genuine national composer his music was immediately popular and held the stage for many years his first piece was fielding's opera of operas produced in seventeen thirty three the full list of his pieces reached upwards of forty-one operas and plays to which he furnished the music two oratorios abel and judith and a variety of occasional music his style is somewhat like that of handel a remark which was true of all english composers for more than a hundred years after handel's death but it is forcible melodious and direct his music was not known outside of england End of chapter 29chapter thirty of a popular history of the art of music from the earliest times until the present by w s b matthews this librivox recording is in the public domain piano playing and virtuosi the violin tartini and spohr part one it was during the eighteenth century that the pianoforte definitely established itself in the estimation of musicians artists and the common people as the handiest and most useful of domestic and solo instruments the progress was very slow at first the musicians such as bach handel scarlatti and rameau the four great virtuosi of the beginning of this century generally preferred the older forms of the instrument the clavier or the harpsichord both on account of their more agreeable touch and the sweetness of their tones nevertheless the style of playing and of writing for these instruments underwent a gradual change at the hands of these very masters of such a character that when the pianoforte became generally recognized as superior to its predecessors about the middle of the century the compositions of bach and scarlatti were found well adapted to the newer and more powerful instrument the pianoforte itself underwent several modifications from the primitive forms of action devised by cristofori in seventeen eleven rendering it more responsive to the touch all this relating to the mechanical perfection of the instrument although appropriate in part to the present moment of the narrative is deferred until a later chapter when the entire history of this instrument will be considered in detail from that it will be seen by comparing dates that every important mechanical step in advance was followed by immediate modifications of the style of writing and playing whereby the progress toward fullness and manifold suggestiveness of music for this instrument has been steady and great the first of the great virtuosi was domenico scarlatti sixteen eighty three seventeen fifty seven son of the great alessandro scarlatti and a pupil of his father and of other masters whose names are now uncertain he was a moderately successful composer of operas and works for the church but his distinguishing merit was that of a virtuoso upon the harpsichord the pianoforte of that time he was the first of the writers upon the harpsichord who introduced difficulties for the pleasure of overcoming them and who in his own country was without peer as performer until handel came there and surpassed him in seventeen o eight 
scarlatti was also a performer upon the organ but upon this instrument he unhesitatingly confessed handel to be his superior in seventeen fifteen scarlatti succeeded by as chapel master at st peter's in rome where he composed much church music his operas were successful in their own day but were soon forgotten his pianoforte compositions still remain as a necessary part of the education of the modern virtuoso they are free in form brilliant in execution and melodious after the italian manner many of them are still excessively difficult to play in spite of the progress in technique which has been made since there were many other composers in the early part of this century who exercised a local and temporary influence in the direction of popularizing the pianoforte and its music through the attractiveness of their own playing as well as by the compositions they produced among these must not be forgotten matheson the hamburg composer of operas who published many works for piano including suites sonatas and other pieces in the free style johann kunau predecessor of bach as cantor at leipzig published a variety of sonatas and other compositions in free style about the beginning of the eighteenth century of still greater importance than the last named was rameau the french theorist and operatic composer his compositions were attractive and very original and in addition to the charm of his own playing and that of his works he placed later musicians under lasting obligations by his treatise upon the art of accompanying upon the clavecin and organ in which his theories of chords were applied to valuable practical use the work of these and of many others who might be mentioned not forgetting several english writers such as dr blow dr john bull and the gifted artist purcell must be regarded as merely preparatory for the advance made during the last part of the eighteenth century it was haydn who began to demand of the pianoforte more of breadth and a certain coloration of touch which he must have needed in his elaborative passages in the middle of the sonata piece this kind of free fantasia upon the leading motives of the work was planned after the style of thematic discussion of leading motives by the orchestra and the obvious cue of the player is to impart to the different sequences and changes of the motives as characteristic tone colors as possible for the sake of rendering them more interesting to the hearers and possibly of affording them more expression haydn's work was followed by that of mozart who gave the world the adagio upon the piano then in the fullness of time came beethoven who after all must be regarded as the great improver of piano playing of this century as well as that of the next following beethoven improved the piano style in the surest and most influential manner possible in his own playing he was far in advance of the virtuosi of the eighteenth century and in his foresight of farther possibilities in the direction of tone sustaining and coloration he went still farther this is seen in all his concertos especially in the fourth and fifth in the piano trios and the quartet but still more in the later pianoforte sonatas here the piano is treated with a boldness and at the same time a delicacy and poetic quality which taxes the great players of the present time to accomplish the most advanced virtuoso works of chopin schumann and liszt the three great masters of the pianoforte of the nineteenth century are but slightly beyond the demands of these later sonatas of the great vienna master in the later part of the eighteenth century there were a number of pianoforte virtuosi whose merits claim our attention at this point at the head in point of time was the great italian master muzio clementi seventeen fifty two eighteen thirty two born at about the same time as mozart he outlived beethoven 
his early studies were pursued at rome with so much enthusiasm that at the age of fourteen he had produced several important compositions of a contrapuntal character these being successfully performed attracted the attention of an english amateur living in rome who offered to take charge of the boy carry him to england and see that his career was opened under favorable auspices until seventeen seventy therefore the year of beethoven's birth clementi pursued his studies near london then in the full force of his remarkable virtuosity he burst upon the town he carried everything before him and had a most unprecedented success his command of the instrument surpassed everything previously seen after three years as cembalist and conductor at the italian opera in london he set out upon a tour as virtuoso in seventeen eighty one he appeared in paris and so on toward munich strasbourg and at length vienna where he met haydn and where at the instigation of the emperor joseph the second he had a sort of musical contest with the young mozart clementi after a short prelude introduced his sonata in b flat the opening motive of which was afterward employed by mozart in the introduction to the overture to the magic flute and followed it up with a toccata abounding in runs in diatonic thirds and other double stops for the right hand at that time esteemed very difficult the victory was regarded as doubtful mozart compensating for his less brilliant execution by his beautiful singing touch of which clementi ever afterward spoke with admiration moreover from this meeting he himself endeavored to put more music and less show into his own compositions clementi was soon back in england where he remained until eighteen o two when he took his promising pupil john field inventor of the nocturne upon a tour of europe as far as st petersburg where they were received with unbounded enthusiasm in eighteen ten he returned to london and gave up concert playing in public he wrote symphonies for the london philharmonic society published very many sonatas for piano about a hundred in all and in eighteen seventeen published his master work a set of one hundred studies for the piano in all styles the gradus ad parnassum upon which to a considerable extent the entire modern art of piano playing depends clementi's idea in the work was to provide for the entire training of the pupil by means of it not alone upon the technical but upon the artistic side as well and the majority of the pieces have artistic purpose no less than technical the wide range taken by piano literature since clementi's day however reduces the teacher to the alternative of confining the pupil to the works of one writer in case the entire work is used or of employing only the purely technical part of the gradus accomplishing the other side of the development by means of compositions of more poetic and older masters the latter is the course now generally pursued by the great teachers and this was the reason influencing the selection of studies from the gradus made by the virtuoso tausig clementi's compositions exercised considerable influence upon beethoven who esteemed his sonatas better than those of mozart the opinion was undoubtedly based upon the freedom with which clementi treated the piano as distinguished from the gentle and somewhat tame manner of mozart the element of manly strength was that which attracted beethoven himself a virtuoso another of the first virtuosi to gain distinction upon the pianoforte in the latter part of this century and the first part of the nineteenth was j l dusek seventeen sixty one eighteen twelve this highly gifted musician was born in saslau in bohemia and his early musical studies were made upon the organ upon which he attained distinction holding one prominent position after another his last being at berg op zom 
he next went to amsterdam and presently after to the hague still later in 1788 to london where he lived twelve years it was there that haydn met him and wrote to dussek's father in high terms of his son's talents and good qualities afterward he was back again upon the continent living for some years with prince louis ferdinand and having right good times with him both musically and festively he died in france he made many concert tours in different periods of his life and his playing was highly esteemed from one end of europe to the other a contemporary writer says of him quote, as a virtuoso he is unanimously placed in the very first rank in rapidity and sureness of execution in a mastery of the greatest difficulties it would be hard to find a pianist who surpasses him in neatness and precision of execution possibly one john cramer of london in soul expression and delicacy certainly none Close quotes the brilliant pianist and teacher tomaschek said of him quote, there was in fact something magical in the manner in which dussek with all his charming grace of manner through his wonderful touch extorted from the instrument delicious and at the same time emphatic tones his fingers were like a company of ten singers endowed with equal executive powers and able to produce with the utmost perfection whatever their director could require i never saw the prague public so enchanted as they were on this occasion by dussek's splendid playing his fine declamatory style especially in cantabile phrases stands as the ideal for every artistic performance something which no other pianist has since reached he was the first of the virtuosi who placed the piano sideways upon the platform although the later ones may not have had an interesting profile to exhibit Close quotes the published works of this fine musician and credible composer number nearly one hundred and the sonata cuts a leading figure among them he treated the piano with much more freedom and breadth than mozart though this is not so much to his credit as if he had not lived many years after mozart died his earliest compositions falling very near the last years of that great genius he was distinctly a virtuoso loving his instrument and its tonal powers he was the first of all the players whose public performances called attention to the quality of tone and its singing power this also points not alone to the fact of his career falling in with the increased powers of the pianoforte as a result of the inventions of erard collard and broadwood but is to his personal credit since it was genius in him enabling him to recognize these possibilities at a time when most players were still in ignorance of them as a composer he wrote many things of more than average excellence and some of his lighter compositions still have vitality it is altogether likely that beethoven was influenced by dussek's playing in the direction of tone color indeed the third sonata of beethoven can hardly be accounted for without recognizing dussek as the composer upon some one of whose works its general style and form were modeled another pianist of considerable importance a disciple of mozart yet with originality of his own was j b cramer seventeen seventy one eighteen fifty eight this talented and deserving musician was the son of a musician living in mannheim who removed to london when the young cramer was but one year old there the boy grew up receiving his education from several reputable masters clementi being among them his taste was formed by the diligent study of the works of emmanuel bach haydn and mozart in spirit cramer was a disciple of the last named but from living to a good old age he naturally surpassed his ideal in the treatment of the pianoforte in the latter part of the eighteenth century there were few musical compositions sold over the music counters in vienna and the musical world generally but those of dussek cramer and Pleyel while those of beethoven were comparatively neglected cramer's compositions were slight in real merit his fame resting upon his studies for the piano of which about thirty out of the entire one hundred are very good music 
the second and last book of these were published in eighteen ten they do not form a necessary part of the training of a virtuoso but they have decided merits and are generally included to this day in the list of pianistic indispensables kramer's style of playing was quiet and elegant moscheles gives an idea of it in his diary and regrets that he should allow the snuff which he took incessantly to get upon the keys kramer's studies preceded those of clementi and very likely may have inspired them through a desire of illustrating a bolder and more masterly style of pianism among the many talented pupils of clementi was ludwig berger seventeen seventy seven eighteen thirty eight of berlin whose unmistakable gifts for the piano attracted the master's attention when he was in berlin in eighteen o two and he took him along with him to st petersburg after living some years in that city and later in london he returned to berlin where he was held in the highest esteem as teacher until his death among the distinguished who studied with him were mendelssohn taubert henselt fanny hensel herzberg and others he was an indefatigable composer of decided originality but few of his works were published a set of his studies is highly esteemed by many in further illustration of the mozart principles of piano playing and with a reputation as composer which in his lifetime was curiously beyond his merits was j m hummel seventeen seventy eight eighteen thirty seven he was born at presburg and had the good luck to attract the favorable notice of mozart he was received into the house of the master and was regarded as the best representative of mozart's ideas he made his early appearances as a child pianist under the care of his father in most parts of germany and holland in eighteen o four he succeeded haydn as musical director to the esterhazy establishment he afterward held several other appointments of credit and played much in all parts of europe he was a pleasant player with a light smooth touch suited to the viennese pianofortes of the time the latest of the virtuosi representing the classical traditions of the pianoforte uninfluenced by the new methods which came in with talberg and liszt was ignaz moscheles he was born at prague his father being a cloth merchant and israelite he had the usual childhood of promising musicians playing everything he could lay his hands upon including beethoven's sonata pathetique and at the age of seven he was taken to dionys weber whose verdict is worth remembering he said quote, candidly speaking the boy is on the wrong road for he makes hash of great works which he does not understand and to which he is entirely unequal but he has talent and i could make something of him if you were to hand him over to me for three years and follow out my plan to the letter the first year he must play nothing but mozart the second clementi the third bach but only that not a note as yet of beethoven and if he persists in using the circulating musical libraries i have done with him forever Close quotes having completed his studies after this severe regime moscheles began his concert appearances which were everywhere successful he continued his studies in vienna with salieri and beethoven thought so well of him that he engaged him to make the pianoforte arrangement of fidelio this was in eighteen fourteen in eighteen fifteen he produced his famous variations upon the alexander march opus thirty two from which his reputation as virtuoso dates his active concert service began about eighteen twenty and extended throughout europe in eighteen twenty six he settled in london where he was held in the highest esteem both as man and musician he became a fast friend of mendelssohn who had been his pupil in berlin and in eighteen forty six joined him at leipzig where he continued until his death moscheles was originally a solid and brilliant player later he became famous as one of the best living representatives of the true style and interpretation of beethoven's sonatas he never advanced beyond the clementi principles of piano playing the works of chopin and liszt remaining sealed books to his fingers to the very last 
as a teacher he was painstaking and patient and he was honored by all who knew him all his life he kept a diary from which a very readable volume has been compiled with many glimpses of other eminent musicians it is called recent music and musicians part two the art of violin playing also made great progress during this century its most eminent representative being giuseppe tartini sixteen ninety two seventeen seventy he was born in pirano in istria and was intended for the church but upon coming of age he fell in love with a lady somewhat above him in rank and was secretly married to her when this fact was discovered by her relatives he was obliged to fly and having taken refuge in a monastery he remained there two years during which he diligently devoted himself to music being his own instructor upon the violin but a pupil of the college organist in counterpoint and composition later being united to his wife he made still further studies on the violin and by seventeen twenty one had returned to padua where he evermore resided his reputation bringing him a sufficient number of pupils to assist his rather meagre salary as solo violinist of the cathedral he was a virtuoso violinist greater than any one before him besides employing the higher positions more freely than had previously been the case he appears to have made great improvements in the art of bowing and his playing was characterized by great purity and depth of sentiment and at times with most astonishing passion he was a composer of extraordinary merit several of his pieces for the violin still forming part of the concert repertory of artists his famous trio del diavolo is well known he dreamed that he had sold his soul to the devil and on the whole was well pleased with the behavior of that gentlemanly personage but it occurred to him to ask his strange associate to play something for him on the violin cheerfully satan took the instrument and immediately improvised a sonata of astonishing force and wild passion concluding it with a great passage of trills of superhuman power and beauty tartini awoke in an ecstasy of admiration whereupon he sought after every manner to reduce to paper the wonderful composition of his dream fine as was the work thus produced tartini always maintained that it fell far short of the glorious virtuoso piece which he had heard tartini was in some sort a forerunner of the modern romantic school he was accustomed to take a poem as the basis of an instrumental piece he wrote the words along the score and conducted the music wherever the spirit of the words took it he was also in the habit of affixing to his published works mottoes indicative of their poetic intention with this general characterization his music well agrees for in dreamy moods it has a mystical beauty till then unknown in music he is also entitled to lasting memory on account of his having first discovered the phenomenon of combination tones the under resultant which is produced when two tones are sounded together upon the violin especially in the higher parts of the compass these tones are the roots of the consonances sounding and tartini directed the attention of his pupils to them as a guide to correct intonation in double stops since they do not occur unless the intonation is pure he made this important discovery about seventeen fourteen and in seventeen fifty four he published a treatise on the harmony embodying the combination tones as a basis of a system of harmony this having been violently attacked his second work of this kind on the principles of musical harmony contained in the diatonic genus was published in seventeen sixty seven tartini therefore must be reckoned among the great masters who have contributed to a true doctrine of the tonal system copies of his theoretical writings are in the newberry library at chicago in the latter part of the eighteenth century and the first of the next following the art of violin playing was best illustrated by german artist louis spohr seventeen eighty four eighteen fifty nine 
who was almost or quite as great as a composer as in his early career of a virtuoso in his own specialty he was one of the most eminent masters who has ever appeared his technique was founded upon that of his predecessors of the school of viotti and rode but his own individuality was so decided that he soon found out a style original with himself its distinguishing quality was the singing tone he never reconciled himself to the light bow introduced by paganini and all his work is distinguished by sweetness singing quality and a flowing melodiousness he was fond of chromatic harmonies and double stops which imparted great sonority to his playing he was born at brunswick and early commenced to study music at the age of fifteen he played in the orchestra of the duke of brunswick at a yearly salary of about a hundred dollars later he studied and traveled with eck a great player of the day and upon his return to brunswick he became leader of the orchestra his virtuoso career commenced about eighteen o three two years later he became musical director at gotha where he married a charming harp player dorette scheidler who invariably afterward appeared with him in all their concerts they traveled in their own carriage having suitable boxes for the harp and the violin in eighteen thirteen he was musical director at the theater an der wein at vienna where among his violinists was moritz hauptmann afterward so celebrated as theorist soon after his arrival in vienna spohr received a singular proposition from one herr von tost to the effect quote, that for a proportionate pecuniary consideration i would assign over to him all i might compose or had already written in vienna for the term of three years to be his sole property during that time to give him the original scores and to keep myself even no copy of them after the lapse of three years he would return the manuscript to me and i should then be at liberty either to publish or sell them after i had pondered for a moment over this strange and enigmatical proposition i asked him whether the compositions were not to be played during those three years whereupon herr von tost replied oh yes as often as possible but each time upon my lending them for that purpose and only in my presence End quotes he desired such pieces as could be produced in private circles and would therefore prefer quartets and quintets for stringed instruments and sextets octets and nonnets for stringed and wind instruments spohr was to consider the proposition and fix upon the sum to be paid for the different kinds of compositions finding on inquiry that herr von tost was a wealthy man very fond of music spohr fixed the price at thirty ducats for a quartet thirty five for a quintet and so on progressively higher for the different kinds of compositions on being questioned as to his object von tost replied quote, i have two objects in view first i desire to be invited to the musical parties where you will execute your compositions and for that i must have them in my keeping secondly possessing such treasuries of art i hope upon my business journeys to make extensive acquaintance among the lovers of music which may then serve me also in my manufacturing interests End quotes. this singular bargain was duly consummated and faithfully carried out and the wealthy patron proved of great service to the spohrs in procuring their housekeeping outfit from various tradesmen with whom he had dealings and he would not suffer spohr to pay for anything saying only give yourself no uneasiness you will soon square everything with your compositions the most important of spohr's works is his great school for the violin published in eighteen thirty one he left also a vast amount of chamber music fifteen concertos for violin and orchestra nine symphonies four oratories of which the last judgment is perhaps the best ten operas many concert overtures etc in all more than two hundred works many of them of large dimensions 
his best operas are gesonda 1823 faust 1818 the alchemist 1832 and the crusaders 1845 his orchestral works are richly instrumented and the coloring is sweet and mellow yet at times extremely sonorous during his residence in vienna spohr met beethoven many times he was one of the first to introduce the earlier quartets in his concerts throughout germany and valued them properly but in regard to the beethoven symphonies he placed himself on record in a highly entertaining manner he says of the melody of the famous hymn to joy in beethoven's ninth symphony that it is so monstrous and tasteless and its grasp of schiller's ode so trivial that i cannot even now understand how a genius like beethoven could have written it End of chapter thirty chapter thirty one of a popular history of the art of music from the earliest times until the present by w s b matthews this librivox recording is in the public domain book fifth the period of the romantic weber paganini schubert berlioz meyerbeer mendelssohn schumann chopin liszt wagner the virtuosi music of the future chapter thirty one the nineteenth century the romantic music of the future in ordinary speech a distinction is made between the musical productions of the eighteenth century and those of the next following the former being called classic the latter romantic the terms are used rather indefinitely according to hegel whose teaching coincided with the last years of beethoven's life the classic in art embraces those productions in which the general is aimed at rather than the particular the reposeful and completely satisfactory rather than the forced or the sensational and the beautiful rather than the exciting the philosopher hegel who was one of the first to employ this distinction in art criticism took his departure from the famous group of laocoon and his sons in the embrace of the destroying serpents this group so full of agony and irrepressible horror belongs he said to a totally different concept of art than that of the gods and goddesses of greece in the beauty and freshness of their eternal youth these qualities are those of the general and the eternal the laocoon and its nature painful was not nor could be permanently satisfactory in and of itself but only through allowance being made by reason of interest in the story told by it according to more recent philosophers the romantic movement in literature and art for they are parts of the same general movement of the latter part of the eighteenth century has its essential characteristic in the doctrine that what is to be sought in art is not the pleasing and the satisfactory so much as the true everything they say belonging to life and experience is fit subject of art to the end that thereby the soul may learn to understand itself and come to complete self-consciousness the entire movement of the romantic writers had for its moving principle the maxim nihil humanum alienum a me puto i will consider nothing human to be foreign to me yet other writers make the romantic element to consist of the striking the strongly contrasted the exciting and so at length the sensational whichever construction we may put upon this much used and seldom determined term its general meaning is that of a distinction from the more moderate writings and compositions of the eighteenth century individualism as opposed to the general is the key to the romantic and in music this principle has acquired great dominance throughout the century in which we are still living 
moreover if the principle of individualism had not been discovered in its application to the other arts it must necessarily have found its way into music for music is the most subjective of all the arts having indeed its general principles of form and proportion but coming to the composer if he be a genius as the immediate expression of his own feelings and moods or as the interplay of his environment and the inner faculties of musical fantasy in this sense there is a difference between the music of bach and mozart on the one hand and that of beethoven and schubert on the other beethoven was essentially a romantic composer especially after he had passed middle life and the period of the moonlight sonata from that time on his works are more and more free in form and their moods are more strongly marked and individual this is true of beethoven in spite of his having been born as we might say under the star of the classic he writes freely and fantastically in spite of his early training the mood in the man dominated everything and it is always this which finds its expression in the music the romantic therefore represents an enlargement of the domain of music by the acquisition of provinces outside its boundaries and belonging originally to the domains of poetry and painting and so by romantic is meant the general idea of representing in music something outside of telling a story or painting a picture by means of music the principle was already old being involved in the very conception of opera which in the nature of the case is an attempt to make music do duty as describer of the inner feelings and experiences of the dramatis personae nevertheless while leading continually to innovations in musical discourse for almost two centuries it was prevented from having more than momentary entrances into instrumental music until the beginnings of the nineteenth century when the general movement of mind known as the romantic was at its height in france the writers of this group carried on war against classic tradition the idea that every literary work should be modeled after one of those of the ancient writers subjects of tragedy should be taken from greek mythology or history and the characters should think like the classics and speak in the formal and stilted phraseology of the vernacular translations out of the ancient works these writers also were those who upheld the rights of man and produced declarations of independence in short it was the principle of individualism as opposed to the merely general and conventional for we may remember that the conventional had a large place in ancient art plato says that the egyptians had patterns of the good in all forms of art framed and displayed in their temples and new productions were to be judged by comparing them with these and when they contained different principles they were upon that account to be condemned and prohibited in farther evidence of the correspondence between the musical activity in this direction and the general movement of mind at this period including the shaking up of the dry bones in every part of the social order the french revolution being the most extreme and drastic illustration we may observe that the composer through whom this element entered into the art of music in its first free development was franz schubert who was born during the years when this disturbance was at its height namely in seventeen ninety seven moreover the manner in which his inspiration to musical creation was received corresponded exactly to the definition of the romantic given above for it was always through reading a poem or a story that these strange and beautiful musical combinations occurred to him many instances of which are given in the sketch later it is curious furthermore that the general methods of schubert's musical thought is classical in its repose save where directly associated with a text of a picture building character or of decided emotion thus while it is not possible to separate one part of the works of this composer from another and to say of the one that it belongs to an older dispensation while the other part represents a different principle of art both parts alike having the same general treatment of melody and the same refinement
refined and poetic atmosphere it is nevertheless true that if we had only the sonatas chamber pieces and the symphonies of schubert no one would think of classing his works differently from those of mozart as to their operative principles but when we have the songs the five or six hundred of them the operas and other vocal works in which music is so lovely in and of itself yet at the same time so descriptive so loyal to the changing moods of the text we necessarily interpret the instrumental music in the same light especially when we know that there are no distinct periods in the short life of this composer concerning which different principles can be predicated almost immediately after schubert there come composers in whom the new tendency is more marked mendelssohn entered the domain of the romantic in eighteen twenty six with his overture to the midsummer night's dream and directly after him we come to schumann with a luxuriant succession of deeply moved imaginative quasi descriptive or at any rate representative pianoforte pieces schumann indeed did not need to read a poem in order to find musical ideas flowing in unaccustomed channels the ideas took these forms and channels of their own accord as we shall see in his very first pieces his papillons intermezzi david's spundlertenze and the like so too with chopin there is very little of the descriptive and the picture-making element in his works nevertheless they chimed in so well with the unrest the somewhat byronic sentiment the vague yearning of the period that they found a public without loss of time and established themselves in the popular taste without having had to find a propaganda movement for explaining them as the four tokens of a music of the future this representative work in music has been very much helped by the astonishing development of virtuosity upon the violin the pianoforte and other instruments which distinguishes this century beginning with paganini whose astonishing violin playing was first heard during the last years of the eighteenth century we have talberg chopin liszt rubinstein joachim Dausick, leonard and a multitude of others through whose efforts the general appreciation of instrumental music has been wonderfully stimulated and the appetite for overcoming difficulties and realizing great effects so much increased as to have permanently elevated the standard of complication in musical discourse and the popular average of performance nor has virtuosity been confined to single instruments there have been two great virtuosi in orchestration during this century who have exercised as great an influence in this complicated and elaborate department as the others mentioned have upon their own solo instruments the first of these was hector berlioz the great french master whose earlier compositions were produced in eighteen thirty five when the instruments of the orchestra were combined in vast masses and with descriptive intention far beyond anything by previous writers in his later works such as the damnation of faust and the mighty requiem berlioz far surpassed these efforts every one of his effects afterward proving to have been well calculated directly after his early works came the first of that much discussed genius richard wagner who besides being one of the most profound and acute intelligences ever distinguished in music and a great master of the province of opera in which he accomplished stupendous creations was also an orchestral virtuoso coloring when he chose with true instinct for the mere sake of color and massing and contrasting instruments in endless variety and beauty the activity in musical production during the nineteenth century has been so extraordinary in amount and in the number of composers concerned in it and so ample in the range of musical effects brought to realization 
as to fully illustrate the truth of the principle enunciated at the outset of this narrative namely that the course of musical progress has been toward greater complication of tonal effects in every direction implying upon the part of composers the possession of more inclusive principles of tonal unity and upon the part of the hearers to whom these vast works have been addressed the possession of corresponding powers of tonal perception and the persistence of impressions for a sufficient length of time in each instance for the underlying unity to be realized as an incident in the rapidity of the progress on the part of composers we have had what is called the music of the future namely productions of one generation intelligible to the finer intelligences of that generation yet music of the future to all others but in the generation following these compositions have gone into the common stock through the progress of the faculties of hearing and of deeper perceptions of tonal relations meanwhile there has been created another stratum of music of the future which may be expected to occupy the attention of the generation next ensuing to whom in turn it will become the music of the present in the nature of the case there is not nor can there be a stopping place unless we conceive the possibility of a return to the conservatism of plato and the ancient egyptians and the passage of statute laws permitting the employment of chords and rhythms up to a certain specified degree of complexity beyond which their use would constitute a grave statutory offence it is possible that the ideal of art might again be reformed in the direction of restriction from the uncomely the forced and the sensational and in favor of the beautiful the becoming and the divine nevertheless it is the inevitable consequence of a prescription of this kind to run into mere prettiness and tuneful emptiness protection is a failure in art the spirit must have freedom or it will never take its grandest flights and it is altogether possible that the needed corrective will presently be discovered of itself through the progress of spirit into a clearer vision a higher aspiration and a nobler sense of beauty this we may hope will be one of the distinctions of the coming ages which poets have foretold and seers have imagined when truth and love will prevail and find their illustration in a civilization conformed of its own accord to the unrestricted outflowing of these deep eternal divine principles end of chapter thirty one chapter thirty two of a popular history of the art of music from the earliest times until the present by w s b matthews this librivox recording is in the public domain schubert and the romantic the first two great figures of the nineteenth century were those of karl maria von weber whose work will be considered later and the great songwriter franz peter schubert seventeen ninety seven eighteen twenty eight this remarkable man was born of poor parents in vienna or near it his father being a schoolmaster earning the proverbially meagre stipend of the profession in germany at that time amounting to no more than one hundred or two hundred dollars a year the family was musical and the sundays were devoted to quartet playing and other forms of music the boy franz early showed a fine ear he was soon put to the study of the violin and the piano while still a mere child being furnished with a small violin upon which he went through the motions of his father's part he had a fine voice and this attracted the attention of the director of the choir in the great cathedral of st stephen's as it had in haydn's case and he was presently enrolled as chorister and a member of what was called the convict a school connected with the church where the boys had schooling as well as musical instruction early he began to write among his first works being certain pieces for the piano and violin composed when he was a little more than eleven in the convict school there was an orchestra where they practised symphonies and overtures of haydn mozart kotzeluk cherubini mehul cromer and occasionally beethoven 
here his playing immediately put him on a level with the older boys one of them turned around one day to see who it was playing so cleverly and found it a little boy in spectacles named franz schubert the two boys became intimate and one day the little fellow blushing deeply admitted to the older one that he had composed much and would do so still more if he could get the music paper spaun saw the state of affairs and took care thereafter that the music paper should be forthcoming in time franz became first violin and when the conductor was absent took his place the orchestral music delighted him greatly and of the mozart adagio in the g minor symphony he said that quote, you could hear the angels singing close quote among other works which particularly delighted him were the overtures to the magic flute and figaro the particular object of his reverence was beethoven who was then at the height of his fame but he never met the great master more than once or twice once when a few boyish songs had been sung to words by klopstock schubert asked his friend whether he could ever do anything after beethoven his friend answered perhaps he could do a great deal to which the boy responded perhaps i sometimes have dreams of that sort but who can do anything after beethoven the boy made but small reputation for scholarship in the school after the thirst for composition had taken possession of him which it did when he had been there but one year one of his earliest compositions was a fantasia for four hands having about thirteen movements of different character occupying about thirty-two pages of fine writing his brother remarks that not one ends in the key in which it began he seems to have had a passion for uncanny subjects for the next work of his is a lament of hagar of thirteen movements in different keys unconnected after this again a corpse fantasia to the words of schiller this has seventeen movements and is positively erratic in its changes of key it is full of reminiscences of haydn's creation and other works the musical stimulation of this boy was meagre indeed not until he was thirteen years of age did he hear an opera and not until he was fifteen a really first-class work spontini's vesto in eighteen twelve three years later he probably heard gluck's iphigenie en torride a work which in his estimation eclipsed them all during the same year there were the sixth and seventh symphonies the choral fantasia and portions of the mass in c and the overture to coriolanus of beethoven he was a great admirer of mozart and in his diary under date of june thirteenth eighteen sixteen he speaks of a quintet quote, gently as if out of a distance did the magic tones of mozart's music strike my ears with what inconceivable alternate force and tenderness did schlesinger's magic playing impress it deep into my heart such lovely impressions remain on my soul there to work for good past all power of time and circumstance in the darkness of this life they reveal a bright beautiful prospect inspiring confidence and hope o oh, mozart mozart what countless consolatory images of a bright better world hast thou stamped on our souls End quotes presently schubert entered his father's school in order to avoid the rigorous conscription and remained a teacher of the elementary branches for three years his first important composition was a mass which was produced honorably october sixteenth eighteen fourteen and many good judges pronounced it equal to any similar work of the kind excepting possibly beethoven's mass in c by eighteen fifteen the rage of composition had fully taken possession of the soul of schubert and thenceforth poured out from this receptacle of inspiration a steady succession of works of all dimensions and characters very few of which were performed in his lifetime 
among these works in the year eighteen fifteen there are one hundred thirty seven songs of which only sixty seven are printed as yet and in august alone twenty nine of which eight are dated the fifteenth and seven the nineteenth among these one hundred thirty seven songs some are of such enormous length that this feature alone would have prevented their publication of those published die burgschaft fills twenty-two pages of the litolf edition it was the length of these compositions which caused beethoven's exclamation upon his deathbed such long poems many of them containing ten others and this mass of music was produced in the interim of school drudgery among these songs of his boyhood years are gretchen am spinrade der erlkönig hedge roses restless love the schaefer's klaglied the ossian songs and many others all falling within the production of this year it is said that when the earl king was tried in the evening the listeners at the convict thought it of questionable success the music of the boy at the words my father my father seemed to be inexcusable for overwhelmed with fright he sings a half-tone sharp of the accompaniment at length after about three years schubert's services as a schoolmaster became less and less valuable an opening was made for him by schober who proposed that schubert should live with him he was now free to devote himself to composition and so thoroughly did he do this that in the year following eighteen sixteen he experienced the novelty of having composed for money a cantata of his having not only been performed upon the occasion of salieri's fiftieth anniversary of life in vienna but money was sent him for it one hundred florins vienna money about twenty dollars american he was already composing operas and in 1816 there was one die burgschaft in three acts in the same year there were two symphonies the fourth in c minor called the tragic and the fifth for small orchestra the songs of this year however were of more value among them were the wanderer's night song the fisher the wanderer and many others now known wherever melody and dramatic quality are appreciated the rapidity with which he composed songs was incredible october eighteen fifteen he finds the poems of rosgarten and between the fifteenth and the nineteenth sets seven of them everything that he touched says schumann turned into music at a later date calling upon one of his friends he found certain poems by wilhelm muller and carried them off with him a few days later his friend desiring the book called schubert for it and found that he had already set a number of them to music they were the songs of the schöne müllerin a year or so after returning from a day in the country they stopped at a tavern where he found a friend with a volume of shakespeare open before him schubert took up the volume turned a few pages became interested in one of the pieces took up some waste paper and scribbling the lines proceeded to write a melody this was the so-called shakespeare's serenade hark hark the lark the serenade in d minor is said to have been conceived in a similarly impromptu manner in eighteen sixteen the great tenor vogel made schubert's acquaintance having been brought by one of schubert's admirers at first the songs did not make much impression upon him later they grew upon him and he introduced them among the best circles of the vienna aristocracy vogel appreciated the value of these songs nothing said he so shows the want of a good school of singing as schubert's songs otherwise what an enormous and universal effect must have been produced throughout the world wherever the german language is understood by these truly divine inspirations these utterances of musical clairvoyance how many would have comprehended for the first time the meaning of such terms as speech and poetry and music words in harmony ideas clothed in music and would have learned that the finest poems of our greatest poets may be enhanced and even transcended when translated into musical language 
numberless examples might be named but i will only mention the earl king gretchen schwager kronos the minions and harper's songs schiller's pilgrim the burgschaft and the Zehnsucht. we are told that within the next two or three years schubert made a number of friends and the circle of his admirers was considerably extended the same remarkable productivity continued in the summer of eighteen eighteen he went to the country seat of count esterhazy where he remained several months this was in hungary and the hungarian pieces are supposed to date from his residence there it was not until eighteen nineteen that the first song of schubert was sung in public this was the shepherd's lament of which the leipzig correspondent of the allgemeine musikalische zeitung says the touching and feeling composition of this talented young man was sung by herr jaeger in a similar spirit the following year among other compositions was the oratorio of lazarus which was composed in three parts first the sickness and death then the burial and elegy and finally the resurrection the last part unfortunately if ever written has been lost he made attempts at operatic composition producing a vast amount of beautiful music but always to indifferent librettos so that none of his music was publicly performed it was not until eighteen twenty seven and eighteen twenty eight that his continual practice in orchestral writing resulted in the production of real masterworks in this year the unfinished symphony in b minor was produced in which the two movements that we have are among the most beautiful and poetic that the treasury of orchestral music possesses the other was the great symphony in c which was first performed in leipzig ten years after schubert's death through the intervention of schumann during all these years since leaving his father's school schubert had been living in a very modest manner with an income which must have been very small and irregular he was very industrious usually rising soon after five in the morning and after a light breakfast of coffee and rolls writing steadily about seven hours the amount of work which he got through in this way was something incredible whole acts of operas were composed and beautifully written out in score within a few days upon the same morning from three to six songs might be written if the poems chanced to attract him he scarcely ever altered or erased and rarely curtailed all his music has the character of improvisation the melody harmony the thematic treatment and the accompaniment with the instrumental coloring all seem to have occurred to him at the same time it is only a question of writing it down very little of his music was performed during his lifetime of the songs first and last many of them in private circles and the last two or three years of his life perhaps twenty or twenty-five in public a few of his smaller orchestral numbers were played by amateur players where he may have heard them himself but his larger works he never heard all that schooling of ear which beethoven had as an orchestral director in youth schubert lacked his studies in counterpoint had never been pursued beyond the rudiments and the last engagement he made before his death was for lessons with zechter the contrapuntal authority in vienna at that time in spontaneity of genius schubert resembles mozart more than any other master who ever lived his early education and training were different from those of mozart and musical ideas take different form with him while mozart was distinctly a melodist counterpoint and fugue were at his fingers ends and his thematic treatment had all the freedom which comes from a thorough training in the use of musical material schubert had not this kind of training he never wrote a good fugue and his counterpoint was indifferent but on the other hand he had several qualities which mozart had not and in particular a very curious and interesting mental phenomenon which we might call psychical resonance or clairvoyance whatever poem or story he read immediately called up musical images in his mind under the excitement of the sentiment of a poem or of dramatic incidents narrated strange harmonies spontaneously suggested themselves and melodies exquisitely appropriate to the sentiment he desired to convey he was a musical painter whose colors 
were not imitated from something without himself but were inspired from within schubert was a great admirer of beethoven and upon one occasion called upon him with a set of works which he had dedicated to the great master beethoven had been prepared for the visit by some admirer of schubert's and received him very kindly but when he began to compliment the works the bashful schubert rushed out of doors upon another occasion during his last illness beethoven desired something to read and a selection of about sixty of schubert's songs partly in print and partly in manuscript were put in his hands his astonishment was extreme especially when he heard that there existed about five hundred of the same kind he pored over them for days and asked to see schubert's operas and piano pieces but the illness returned and it was too late he said truly schubert has the divine fire in him schubert was one of the torch-bearers at beethoven's funeral in march eighteen twenty eight he gave an evening concert of his own works in the hall of the musik verein the hall was crowded the concert very successful and the receipts more than a hundred and fifty dollars which was a very large sum for schubert in those days for several months before his death schubert's health was delicate poverty and hard work a certain want of encouragement and ease had done their office for him he died november nineteenth eighteen twenty eight he left no will his personal property was sold at auction the whole amounting to about twelve dollars among the assets was a lot of old music valued at ten florins it is uncertain whether this included the unpublished manuscript or not in personal appearance schubert was somewhat insignificant he was about five feet one inch high his figure stout and clumsy with a round back and shoulders perhaps due to incessant riding fleshy arms thick short fingers his cheeks were full his eyebrows bushy and his nose insignificant his hair was black and remarkably thick and vigorous and his eyes were so bright that even through the spectacles which he constantly wore they at once attracted attention his glasses were inseparable from his face in the convict he was the little boy in spectacles he habitually slept in them he was very simple in his tastes timid and never really at ease but in the society of his intimates and people of his own station his attitude toward the aristocracy was entirely different from the domineering self-assertive pose of beethoven but he was very amiable and dearly beloved his place in the history of music aside from the general fact of his possessing genius of the first order is that of the creator of the artistic song while his pianoforte sonatas are extremely beautiful and very difficult and anticipate many modern effects his string quartets and other chamber music worthy to be ranked with those of any other master and his symphonies exquisitely beautiful in their ideas orchestral coloring and in the entire atmosphere which they carry his habitual attitude was that of the writer of songs some of these are of remarkable length and range one of them extends to sixty-six pages of manuscript another occupies forty-five pages of close print a work of this kind is a cantata and not merely a song many of the others are six or eight pages long and in all the music freely and spontaneously follows the poem with a delicate correspondence between the poetic idea and the melody with its harmony and treatment such as we look for in vain in any other writer unless it be schumann who however did not possess schubert's instinct of the vocally suitable for with all the range which these songs cover their vocal quality is as noticeable as that of italian Italian cantilenas. End of chapter thirty two. Chapter thirty three of a popular history of the art of music from the earliest times until the present by W. S. B. Matthews. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The story of the pianoforte the popular instrument of the nineteenth century has been the pianoforte the result of an evolution having its beginning more than six centuries back 
it is impossible in the present state of knowledge to trace all the steps through which this remarkable instrument has reached its present form in the assyrian sculptures discovered by layard there are instruments apparently composed of metal rods or plates touched by hammers upon the same general principle as the toy instrument with glass plates or the xylophone composed of wooden rods resting upon bands of straw in these the use of the hammer for producing the tone is obvious in the middle ages there was an instrument called the psaltery apparently some sort of a four-sided harp strung with metal strings the evidence upon this point is rather indistinct still later there is the arab santir this was a trapeze-shaped instrument composed of a solid frame sounding board and metal wires struck with hammers this instrument still exists in germany under the name of hackbrett or the dulcimer as now made each string consists of three wires tuned in unison it is played by means of leather hammers held in the hand the difficulty of adapting this instrument to the keyboard consisted in the fact that if the hammers were connected with the keys they would be under the strings instead of above them and this difficulty for a long time proved insurmountable figure sixty eight spinet showing the disposition of the strings bridges etc dresden fifteen ninety two forms of instruments were at length developed composed of a wire-strung psaltery played from a chromatic keyboard like that of the organ the first of these was one called in england spinet or in italy espinetto and in germany the clavier the essential characteristic of this instrument was the manner of producing tones upon the ends of the keys were brass pieces called tangents of a triangular shape of such form that when the key was pressed the tangent pushed the wire and so produced the tone as it remained in contact with the wire as long as the key was held down there was nothing like what we now call a singing tone the instruments were very small in shape like a square piano but of three or four octaves compass the wires were of brass and quite small in several representations which have come down to us from the seventeenth century the number of strings shown is smaller than the number of keys from which some writers have inferred that it might have been possible to obtain more than one tone from the same string through a process of stopping it with one tangent and striking it with another this however is highly improbable the discrepancies referred to are undoubtedly due to carelessness of the engraver the clavier or spinet was a better instrument than the lute which at length it superseded having more tones and a greater harmonic capacity besides which it was a step toward something much better still in england they made them with pieces of cloth drawn through between the wires to deaden the already small tones still further these were sometimes called virginals and seem to have been used as practice pianos where the noise of the full tone might have been objectionable the oldest form of the clavier known to the writer was that shown in figure sixty nine which was so small that it might be carried under the arm and when used was placed upon the table they were sometimes ornamented in a very elaborate manner figure sixty nine keyboard and fretwork of spinet shown in figure sixty eight figure seventy richly ornamented spinet made for the princess anna of saxony about fifteen fifty contemporaneously with the spinet and of almost equal antiquity was an instrument in the form of a grand piano called in italy the clavicembalo and in england the harpsichord in germany it was called the flugel or wing from its being shaped like the wings of a bird these also in the earlier times were made very small and were rested upon the table 
the essential distinction between the cembalo and the spinet was in the manner of tone production in the cembalo there was a wooden jack resting upon the end of the keys and upon this jack a little plectrum made of raven's quill which had to be frequently renewed when the key was pressed the jack rose and the plectrum snapped the wire the tone was thin and delicate but as the plectrum did not remain in contact with the string the vibration continued longer than in the clavier the cembalo was the favorite instrument in italy during the seventeenth century and in england it had a great currency under the name of harpsichord many attempts were made at increasing the resources of this instrument one of the most curious being that of combining two harpsichords in one having two actions two sounding boards and sets of strings and two keyboards related like those of the organ this form seems to have been exclusively english the form of the harpsichord is shown in figure seventy one figure seventy one mozart's concert grand piano now in the mozart museum at salzburg its compass is five octaves far back in the sixteenth century an attempt was made at a hammer mechanism to strike down upon the strings for this purpose the strings were placed in a vertical position the same as in our upright pianos of the present day mr b j lang of boston has an upright spinet of this kind which he bought in nuremberg it is a small and rude affair having about four octaves compass and a very small scale figure seventy two christophori's action according to his original diagram a is the string b the bottom c the first lever or key there is a pad d upon the key to raise a second lever e which is pivoted upon f g is the hopper christofori's linguetta mobile which controlled by the springs i and l effects the escape or immediate drop of the hammer from the strings after the blow has been struck although the key is still kept down by the finger the hopper is centered at h m is a rack or comb on the beam s where h the butt n of the hammer o is centered in a state of rest the hammer is supported by a cross or fork of silk thread p on the depression of the key c the tail g of the second lever e draws away the damper r from the strings leaving them free to vibrate parentheses hipkins the pianoforte proper was not invented until seventeen eleven when a florentine mechanic named cristofori invented what he called a forte piano from its capacity of being played loud or soft the essential feature of the pianoforte mechanism is in the use of the hammer to produce the tone and the necessary provision for doing this successfully is to secure an instantaneous escapement of the hammer from the contact with the wire as soon as the blow has been delivered while at the same time the key remains pressed in order to hold the damper away from the strings and allow the tone to go on these features were all contained in cristofori's invention the above diagram figure seventy two illustrates the mechanism employed it is from cristofori's published account of his invention dated seventeen eleven but there is in florence a pianoforte of his manufacture still existing dated seventeen twenty six in which the action is more perfect as shown in figure seventy three figure seventy three action of cristofori's forte piano date seventeen twenty six besides several minor improvements over his first idea the later instrument has a hammer check p and the hammer is more developed the invention of cristofori was taken up in germany almost immediately and a dresden piano maker silbermann became very celebrated it was the pianofortes of his manufacture in the palace at potsdam which frederick the great made bach try one after another 
the form of these instruments was the same as that of mozart's piano shown in figure seventy one the square formed piano began to be made about seventeen fifty but the instrument involved no application of new principles being merely a clavier with pianoforte mechanism the new form so much more compact and inexpensive began to be popular and was soon the standard form for private families as that of the clavier had been before and as the square piano remained until as late as about eighteen seventy when the inherent mechanical difficulties of the upright were for the first time satisfactorily overcome pepys in his diary tells of having purchased a virginal which pleased him very much it cost five guineas about twenty six dollars figure seventy four improved action of the erard concert grand eighteen twenty one c is the key d is a pilot centered at double d to give the blow by means of a carrier e holding the hopper g which delivers the blow to the hammer o by the thrust of the hopper which escapes by forward movement after contact with a projection from the hammer covered with leather answering to the notch of the english action this escapement is controlled at x a double spring i l pushes up a hinged lever double e the rise of which is checked at double p and causes the second or double escapement a little stirrup at the shoulder of the hammer known as the repetition pressing down double e at the point and by this depression permitting g to go back to its place and be ready for a second blow before the key has been materially raised the check p in this action is not behind the hammer but before it fixed into the carrier e which also as the key is put down brings down the under damper parentheses hipkins the instruments were still small and strung with small wires nevertheless there was a tendency toward increased compass which by the beginning of the nineteenth century led the broadwoods of london to attempt a grand piano with six octaves compass but they found that the rest plank in which the tuning strings are placed was so weakened by the extension that the treble would not stand in tune in order to strengthen the instrument he introduced the iron tension bar this like nearly all of the english improvements of the piano during the first quarter of the nineteenth century was in the direction of greater solidity and better resisting power to the pull of the strings upon the artistic side sebastian erard in eighteen o eight patented his grand action which with very slight improvements still remains the model of what a piano action should be figure seventy four shows this action and its parts figure seventy five the steinway iron frame showing the disposition of the sounding board bridges etc between eighteen o eight when the erard action was perfected and eighteen thirty two or eighteen thirty four when thalberg and liszt began to revolutionize the art of piano playing the instrument was the subject of a great number of improvements in every direction the damper mechanism was perfected between eighteen twenty one and eighteen twenty seven the stringing had been made heavier the hammers proportionately stronger and the power of tone had become greater thus the instrument had become ready for the great pianists liszt having made his first appearance in vienna in eighteen twenty three and within seven years after having become generally recognized as a phenomenal appearance in art meanwhile great improvements were continually carried on for the purpose of rendering the instrument impervious to the forcible attacks made upon its stability by these new virtuosi in the early appearances of liszt it was necessary to have several pianos in reserve upon the stage so that when a hammer or string broke which very often happened another instrument could be moved forward for the next piece 
the most important improvement in the solidity of the piano came from the iron frame which was introduced tentatively somewhere about eighteen twenty one in the form of what is now called a hitch pin plate or half iron frame about eighteen twenty five an american alpheus babcock of philadelphia patented a full iron frame but it was imperfect and nothing came of it conrad meyer of philadelphia in eighteen thirty three patented an iron frame and manufactured pianos with it which are still in existence in eighteen thirty seven jonas chickering of boston perfected the iron frame by including in the single casting the pin bridge and damper socket rail this improvement still remains at the foundation of the piano making of the world previous to this invention some of the american piano makers had constructed their cases upon a solid wooden bottom plank five inches thick in eighteen fifty five the firm of steinway and sons exhibited their first overstrung scale in which the bass strings were spread out and carried over a part of the treble strings thus affording them more latitude for vibration without interfering and bringing the bridges nearer to the center of the sounding board the idea of overstringing was not new at this time lichtenberg of st petersburg having exhibited a grand piano with overstringing at the london exposition in eighteen fifty one and theodore Böhm, the celebrated improver of the flute having invented an overstrung system for square pianos as early as eighteen thirty five in eighteen fifty three also jonas chickering combined an iron frame with an overstrung system in square pianos the instrument having been completed and exhibited after his death the steinway system of overstringing however was more extended and solved the acoustical difficulties of cross vibrations more successfully by spreading the long strings and this therefore is the system now generally followed the superiority of this principle was immediately acknowledged and it has since been applied to grands and uprights and few makers in the world but follow it in their work many minor improvements have been introduced in america by steinway and sons and others whereby the artistic qualities and the durability of the best american pianos are now generally acknowledged throughout the world the solidity of construction is such that with a compass of seven and one-third octaves the tension of the strings amounts to about fifty thousand pounds avoir du poids the hammers are larger and heavier the action more responsive and the singing quality and sustaining power has reached remarkable perfection perhaps the most curious and important of all american improvements in this direction is the so-called duplex scale of steinway and sons patented in eighteen seventy two in which a fraction of the string is made to vibrate sympathetically thereby strengthening the super octave harmonic and imparting to the tone a brightness and sweetness not so well secured in any other way at present known if space permitted it would be interesting to follow the course by which the difficulties of the upright piano have at length been surmounted and the tone of this form of instrument rendered nearly equal to that of the grand this was first accomplished by steinway and sons between eighteen sixty two and eighteen seventy eight by a succession of improvements having for their object first the solidity of the instrument then its prompt action together with as much of the tone quality of the grand as possible many other american builders have taken part in this development whereby the american pianoforte to-day is the strongest the fullest toned and the most expensively constructed of any in the world still later quite a number of more or less successful attempts have been made to increase the stability of the tuning of the pianoforte by a different system of stringing the tension of the strings being regulated by means of a tuning pin of set screw pattern working through a collar of steel instead of being thrust into a wooden rest plank where it holds fast by friction alone as has been the universal way previous 
access to these inventions end of chapter thirty three chapter thirty four of a popular history of the art of music from the earliest times until the present by w s b matthews this librivox recording is in the public domain german opera weber meyerbeer and wagner part one german opera reached an extraordinary development during the nineteenth century the distinguishing characteristics being an extremely full and dramatically conceived treatment of the orchestra and a mode of delivering the text partaking of the character of melody and recitative in about equal proportions the entire object being to present the action to the inner consciousness of the beholder in the most impressive manner possible in italian opera as we have seen there was a large development of arias and vocal pieces whose value lay in their beauty as melodies and as concerted effect the action of the drama being meanwhile delayed sometimes for an entire half hour while these pieces were going on in germany the effort to improve the delivery of the text and to bring it into closer union with the orchestra and to develop the music from a dramatic standpoint exclusively led to the vocal form known as arioso or to use wagner's term endless melody in which the successive periods follow each other to the end of the paragraph or the end of the piece without a full stop at any point until the end of the sense is reached the great master of this form of composition was richard wagner who may be regarded as the exponent of the extreme development yet reached by german opera wagner's endless melody proposed to itself the same ideal as that of gluck but it is only at rare moments that one will find in the music of the later master the symmetrical periods of the gluck and mozart epoch italian opera as we have already seen carried forward the dialogue mostly in recitativo seco that is to say in a recitative following more or less successfully the modulations of speech and accompanied only by detached chords marking the emphatic moments this form of vocal delivery has the slightest possible musical interest and the germans almost immediately endeavored to improve it as also did some of the italian masters the first result being recitativo strumentato or instrumented recitative viz recitative in which the text is accompanied by a flowing and more or less descriptive orchestral accompaniment this differs essentially from the descriptive recitative in the works of the mozart or gluck period or even in those of haydn's later time in the creation for example the descriptive recitative consists of vocal phrases with instrumental phrases interspersed in dialogue form the voice announces a certain fact and the orchestra immediately answers with a musical phrase corresponding to it as for example in the recitative describing the creation of the world where the phrase relating to the horse is immediately answered by an orchestral gallop that of the tiger by certain slides and leaps in the melody remotely answering it while the roar of the lion is immediately answered by a vigorous snort of the bass trombone this is by no means of the same nature as the dramatic arioso of german opera during the nineteenth century handel came nearer to this type of musical formation for example in the messiah at the recitative describing the appearance of the angels to the shepherds where after a phrase of unaccompanied recitative the appearance of the angels is signified by an accompanied and measured strain and lo the angel of the lord came upon them this development of opera in the nineteenth century has been carried forward by the successive efforts of a considerable number of masters among whom the three most important are weber meyerbeer and wagner each of whom created a type of opera peculiar to himself and left something as an addition to the permanent stock of musical dramatic ideas part two karl maria von weber 
1786-1826, was the son of a very musical family. He was born at Oiten and fulfilled his father's desire, which had always been to have a child who should correspond to the youthful promise of Mozart. The father was an actor and the director of a traveling troupe, largely composed of his own children by a former marriage this mode of life continued for a number of years while the future master was quite small in seventeen ninety four karl maria's mother was engaged as a singer at the theatre at weimar under goethe's direction presently however the boy became a pupil of heuschkel an eminent oboist a solid pianist and organist and a good composer under his careful direction weber developed a technique which very soon passed far beyond anything that had previously been seen still later he became a pupil of michael haydn a brother of joseph as early as eighteen hundred the boy gave concerts at leipzig and other towns in central germany at this time an opera book was given him das waldmädchen and the opera was composed and produced in november five years later it was highly appreciated at vienna and was performed also at prague and st petersburg young weber was of a most active mind and interested himself in all questions of art in eighteen o three he made the acquaintance of the famous abbe fogler and became his pupil fogler commissioned him to prepare the piano score of a new opera of his he still continued his practice as pianist but when he lacked some months of being eighteen years of age he was made director of the music of the theatre at breslau this was his first acquaintance with practical life as a musician he showed great talent for direction and organization and here he composed his first serious opera rubzal 1806 his next position was at stuttgart where he became musical director in 1807 after composing several short pieces he led a somewhat irregular life for several years concerting as a pianist writing articles for the papers at which he was very talented beginning a musical novel and at length in eighteen ten producing his opera abu hassan then followed about three years of roving life as a concert player and occasionally as composer until eighteen thirteen when he was appointed musical director at prague the opera here was in very bad condition and the company incapable but weber engaged new singers in vienna and entirely reorganized the affair and conducted himself so prudently that he gained the good will of nearly every one as an example of his quickness it may be mentioned that upon discovering that certain musicians in the orchestra who were not disposed to yield to his strict ideals of discipline were conversing with each other in bohemian while the music was going on he learned the language himself sufficiently to rebuke them in their own tongue his next position was at dresden in eighteen sixteen and here he remained nine years until his death his position at first was somewhat ambiguous there were two troops of singers in the opera an italian and the german the grand operas were given in italian by the italian company and the light operas in german by the german company it was weber's task to change this by producing new works of a distinctly higher character than the foreign works of the italian company the second year he was able to produce a few good operas of other schools in german versions but it was not until eighteen twenty one when his preciosa was produced at berlin and eighteen twenty two when der freischutz was produced in the same theatre that the reputation of the young master was established beyond question it is impossible at the present time to describe the enthusiasm which the latter work created it was a new departure in opera it united two strains very dear to the german heart the simple peasant life and the people's song are represented in the choruses and in the arias of the less important people agatha the heroine has a prayer of exquisite beauty which still is often heard as a church tune and in contrast with these elements was the weird and uncanny music of samiel 
the satanic spirit of the wood and the strange incantation scene in the wolf's glen at midnight where the magic balls are cast the story was thoroughly german and the music not only german and well suited to the story but distinctly original and charming of itself in this work perhaps first of any opera weber made use of what has since been known as leading motives characteristic melodic phrases appropriate to samiel and agatha the instrumentation was very graphic and as weber had been brought up on the stage there were many novelties of a scenic kind in fact the work marked as distinct an epoch as wagner's nibelungen ring and what is more to the point it was one of the operative influences affecting the young wagner as he tells with considerable care in his autobiography his next effort was a comic opera the three pintos which was never finished then came oiranta performed at vienna in eighteen twenty three with the most extraordinary success this work is said to have been the model upon which wagner created his lohengrin when it was produced in berlin in eighteen twenty five the enthusiasm was yet greater and more remarkable than in vienna in eighteen twenty five he composed oberon the first of the operas in which the fairy principle has prominent exemplification this was produced in london early in eighteen twenty six but by this time weber's health had become completely broken and he died there of overwork and fatigue he was laid to his rest to the music of mozart's requiem in the chapel at moorsfield in london weber was the first of the romantic composers the first at least to gain the ear of the public these operas with their beautifully descriptive music in which voices and orchestra cooperate with the action and scene as one were composed at the same time that the young franz schubert was improvising his beautiful songs in vienna from one end of germany to the other and in all europe these operas made their way der freischutz has lasted fifty years and is still presented with success more than that as already noticed weber furnished the model or point of departure for a multitude of smaller composers who developed the opera in various side directions and last but not least for richard wagner himself moreover in the department of piano playing weber was no less epoch marking than in that of opera in eighteen twelve his sonata in c opus twenty four was produced a work which is distinctly in advance of those of clementi or any other writer before that time the finale of this work is the well-known rondo perpetual motion which indeed contains no new principle of piano playing but is an elegant example of melodiousness and real musicianly qualities displayed at the highest possible speed his next sonata opus thirty nine in a flat eighteen sixteen is still more remarkable the piano playing here is of an extremely brilliant and picturesque description here also in the andante we have the tricks which he afterward made so effective in the concertstück of the legato melody accompanied by the chords pizzicati equally significant in this way is the sonata in d minor opus forty nine published in the same year as the preceding here we have very strong contrast and an enormous fire and vigor the romantic impulse however had been displayed yet earlier in his momento capriccioso opus twelve in b flat eighteen o eight this extremely rapid piece of changing chords pianissimo is like a reminiscence from fairyland and the second subject contrasts with it to a degree which would have satisfied schumann it is a choral like movement with intervening interludes in the bass upon which rubinstein must have modeled his carmenoi ostrov number twenty two but the most decided token of the romantic movement is seen in the invitation to the dance and the polaka brilliant both of which were published in eighteen nineteen 
two years later came the concert piece which for seventy years has remained a standard selection for brilliant pianists and for fifteen years was liszt's great concert solo it marks a transition from moschelis dussek and clementi to thalberg and liszt the invitation to the dance moreover was the first salon piece idealized from a popular dance form part three yet another distinguished name might well have been enrolled among those of the great virtuosi of the first part of the nineteenth century jacob liebmann bär better known as jacomo meyerbeer seventeen ninety one eighteen sixty four was born at berlin the son of a rich jewish banker the name meyer was prefixed to his own later as a condition of inheriting certain property from a distant relative as the boy showed talent for music at a very early age he was put to the study of the pianoforte and it was his ambition to distinguish himself as a virtuoso which his talent undoubtedly permitted if he had not been diverted from it by the success of his early attempts at opera he was taught by a pupil of clementi and for a while by clementi himself as well as by other distinguished teachers and if reports are to be believed concerning his playing he must have become by the time he was twenty years old one of the very first virtuosi in europe his studies in theory were carried on under abbe fogler at darmstadt where he was a schoolmate with Seem von weber and gansbacher and later with salieri at vienna at darmstadt he wrote an oratorio god and nature which was performed by the zing academy of berlin in eighteen eleven and an opera ali Melek the two caliphs which also was successfully given at munich in the grand opera house in the same year eighteen eleven both works were anonymous the opera made considerable reputation and was played in several other cities upon salieri's direction he went to venice where he arrived in eighteen fifteen to find rossini's star in the ascendant and all venice and italy as well wild over the bewitching melodies of tancredi meyerbeer having that vein of cleverness and adaptability so characteristic of his race immediately became a composer of italian operas and produced in venice romilda e constanza padua eighteen fifteen semiramide riconosciuta turin eighteen nineteen emma di resburgo venice eighteen twenty the latter also making a certain amount of reputation in germany as emma von leicester then followed margarita d'anjou milan la scala le zule di granata milan eighteen twenty two il crociato in egitto venice eighteen twenty four all of these were italian operas with melody in quite the rossini vein with the same attention as rossini to the light the pleasing and the vocal but with a certain added element of german cleverness of harmony and thematic treatment he now returned to berlin but his opera das brandenburgo tor which he had written for berlin was not performed owing to opposing intrigues nevertheless for about six years meyerbeer remained in his native city married and presently lost two infant children in eighteen thirty he took his abode in paris where already his il crociato had been performed in eighteen twenty six and in that city as the leading composer for grand opera he lived six Six years and finally died there for the paris stage he produced a succession of large and sensational operas following to some extent the footsteps of spontini in respect to the heroic the spectacular and the theatrical up to the time of his going to paris meyerbeer had figured as an italian composer in grace of melody german in his harmony and now he became a french composer in refinements of rhythm his first work in paris was robert le diable eighteen thirty one and it made his reputation and at the same time made an epoch in operatic construction it was followed by les huguenots 
1838 which played in berlin in 1842 so pleased the king friedrich wilhelm the fourth that he created meyerbeer general musical director for prussia and meyerbeer came to berlin to reside here in 1842 he wrote his das feldlager in schlesien which jenny lind made a great success later however he made over a great part of this music for his opera of l'etoile du nord 1854 for the opera comique in paris his remaining works were l'africaine performed after his death in 1865 le prophète 1843 and dinora 1859 he died in paris while superintending the production of his l'africaine in his will he left a fund of ten thousand thalers the interest of which to be used as a prize for the support of a young german composer during eighteen months study in in italy germany and france six months in each besides the operas above mentioned meyerbeer wrote a quantity of other music for orchestra cantatas and occasional pieces for festival purposes of which the schiller march is an example the music of meyerbeer is extremely sensational his instrumentation is rich at times bizarre and strongly contrasted his knowledge of stage effect such that he knew by intuition what would do and what not he was to some extent created by circumstances a striking instance of which is told in connection with the opera of the huguenots where the parting with valentine at the end of the fourth act was originally without important music but the tenor declined to take the part unless suitable music could be furnished him at this point whereupon meyerbeer wrote the impassioned duet since so celebrated and which in fact is generally recognized recognized as one of the most suitable not to say most effective incidents of the whole opera meyerbeer's operas follow the lead of spontini in their fondness for military glory and spectacle they partake of the virtuoso spirit of the other great geniuses mentioned in a later chapter all of whom wrote for the sake of an effect to be arrived at rather than from any inner necessity of carrying out their tone poems in such and such a way meyerbeer's influence about eighteen thirty to eighteen forty was supreme upon the stage it was to consult him that young wagner undertook his journey to paris bringing with him his splendid spectacular opera rienzi quite in the meyerbeer vein this feature in the work most likely was the one chiefly concerned in preventing its acceptance at paris under meyerbeer's direction wagner was very much influenced by meyerbeer in all his earlier works particularly in the matter of splendid appointments for the stage with all the splendid brilliancy of meyerbeer's music there is something insincere about it it rarely touches the deeper springs of feeling this is true of the greatest of his pieces no less than of the smaller numbers part four the most interesting story in the history of opera and one so resplendent that it is impossible not to regard the others as merely in some degree preparatory to it is that of richard wagner eighteen thirteen to eighteen eighty three this remarkable man was born in leipzig in eighteen thirteen the son of a superintendent of police his mother was a woman of refined and spiritual nature after the death of his father his mother married again an actor named geyer a circumstance having an important bearing on the future of the composer his brother albert and his sister rosalie became actors and wagner himself was familiar with the stage from earliest childhood he studied music while a boy but his ambition was to become a poet he translated the twelve books of the odyssey he made the acquaintance of shakespeare's plays first in german afterward in english he made a translation of romeo's soliloquy and began to compose music for it at the age of eighteen he copied beethoven's ninth symphony in score for the purpose of knowing it more thoroughly 
his musical progress was such that at the age of twenty-one he was able to accept a position as the conductor of the opera at magdeburg in eighteen thirty six this failed and he accepted a place at konigsberg he had then written one opera called the love veto in eighteen thirty seven he was much interested in boulevers rienzi and immediately made a libretto from it he was now musical director at riga and his wife had leading feminine roles in opera his favorite composer in opera just then was meyerbeer for some reason he lost his place at riga and resolved to visit london taking ship across the black sea it was a sailing vessel of small burden and they encountered a very violent storm he heard the legend of the flying dutchman and the next year made a poem of it and commenced to write the opera he spent some time in paris where he hoped to get his rienzi accepted at the grand opera this opera he had written on a large scale in the hope of pleasing meyerbeer whose influence at paris was very strong at this time this however he failed to do very possibly because his opera was too good he was reduced to great straits and had to write potpourri for the cornet and piano at a beggarly price in order to gain a living in eighteen forty three his rienzi was accepted at dresden through the influence of meyerbeer it was performed with great success and wagner was called there as conductor here he had an important position having to produce the best operas of all schools he brought out his own flying dutchman and had already finished tannhauser he read the arthur legends and conceived the idea of an opera upon a subject connected with the holy grail this was lohengrin completed in march eighteen forty eight it was in a fair way to have been produced under his own direction if he had had the good sense to let politics alone but in some way he mixed himself up in the revolutionary attempt of that year and was obliged to flee the country he went to zurich where he lived in great poverty at first but afterward with a certain moderate income for nearly ten years this circumstance was evidently providential as will appear in the sequel franz liszt was now conductor at weimar and he brought out lohengrin in eighteen fifty from this moment a friendship was established between these two remarkable men liszt sent wagner a handsome honorarium and from this time on was his financial guardian by this time wagner's art theories had become pretty well defined from his standpoint the three great arts of music poetry and drama had been independently explored to their limit music by beethoven poetry and the drama by shakespeare and goethe and the only remaining thing of importance to do was to unite them all in one homogeneous mass and by their combined operation accomplish a more profound and overwhelming effect than had been made before or in indeed would have been possible to them separately in his autobiography speaking of his early experiences as conductor he says the peculiar gnawing feeling that oppressed me in conducting our ordinary opera was often interrupted by an indescribable enthusiastic feeling of happiness when here and there in the performance of nobler works i became thoroughly conscious in the midst of the representation of the incomparable influence of dramatic musical combinations an influence of such depth fervor and life as no other art is capable of producing that such impressions which with the rapidity of lightning made clear to me undreamed of possibilities could constantly renew themselves for me this was the thing which bound me to the theatre much as the typical spirit of our operatic performances filled me with disgust among especially strong impressions of this character i remember the hearing of an opera by spontini in berlin under that master's own direction i felt myself too thoroughly elevated and ennobled for a time when i was teaching a small opera company mayhew's noble joseph 
and when twenty years old i spent some time in paris the performances at the grand opera could not fail by the perfection of their musical and dramatic mise-en-scene to exercise a most dazzling and exciting influence upon me but greatest of all was the effect produced upon me in early youth by the artistic efforts of a dramatic singer of in my eyes entirely unsurpassed merit schroeder de Vrian, the incomparable dramatic talent of this woman the inimitable harmony and strong individuality of her representations which i studied with eyes and ears filled me with a fascination that had a decisive influence upon my whole artistic career the possibilities of such a performance were revealed to me and with her in view there grew up in my mind a legitimate demand not for musical dramatic representation alone but for the poetic musical conception of a work of art to which i could hardly continue to give the name of opera soon after his removal to zurich he commenced to compose the libretto of the nibelungs ring this work was founded on the famous old german poem the nibelungen lied but with very important modifications of wagner's own it is divided into four works in the first das rheingold the gold of the rhine is stolen and a curse is laid upon it the second opera of the series is die valkyre in this work the remarkable character of brunhilde is the central figure she is one of the wish maidens of odin whose duty it was to conduct the souls of slain heroes to valhalla the dwelling place of the gods the entire conception of this character is unique and still more unique in the musical way in which it is worked out we find in this work also the mother and father of siegfried and the opera closes when brunhilde is thrown into the magic slumber with the fire around her the third opera of the series is that of siegfried the half divine half human hero who knows no fear who slays the dragon that captures the gold of the rhine awakens brunhilde from her magic sleep etc the fourth opera is called the twilight of the gods or the death of siegfried i will not consume space by describing this poem in detail since this material is easily accessible in every encyclopedia i have already treated it at considerable length in the second volume of my how to understand music these works are especially remarkable upon a musical side the opera of the rheingold is a little monotonous but the orchestral score contains many points of beauty and the valkyrie is beautiful throughout conceived in a very masterly and poetic vein the instrumentation also is extremely noble and beautiful in the whole of these two works there is scarcely a single piece which can be played apart from the rest as a concert number the drama moves straight on from one thing to another there are no melodies of the conventional type and the music is closely woven together like the effects of an april day with storm sunshine and shadows following each other without any perceptible break so great has been the advance in musical taste since these were first composed that the ride of the valkyries a famous descriptive piece for orchestra forming the prelude of the second act has been played in all parts of the world as also the magic fire scene which closes the opera these are given over and over again by thomas and arrangements of them are often played at the piano directly he had finished die valkyre wagner sent it to liszt and a letter with it in which he modestly admitted that he thought it was very fine or words to that effect liszt on his part was delighted with it he wrote a most beautiful and noble letter to wagner about it and a little later he speaks of hans von bulow having been with him when he could not refrain from giving him a sight of valhalla so he brought out the score and he said that hans pounded at the piano and he himself hummed and howled as well as he could and they had a great time over it wagner then set to work upon the opera of siegfried which interested him very much indeed this character also is a genuine conception of wagner's the wild forest boy who knows no fear who has the most marvellous strength and is described in music as wild and powerful as himself 
when sieglinda siegfried's mother was married an old man appeared at the wedding with an ashen staff his hat brim drooping over one eye and in the midst of the festivities he drew a mighty sword and with a great blow thrust it into the stem of the ash tree which grew in the centre of the house saying that it was the sword of a hero and that whoever was strong enough to draw it should wield it in the service of the gods all the strong men tugged at this weapon but none were able to draw it when siegmund siegfried's father comes there he draws the weapon amid a splendid burst of music this sword is broken on wotan's spear but the pieces are saved for siegfried and one of the great scenes in the opera of siegfried is where he welds anew the broken sword and at the end cleaves the anvil with one mighty stroke the opera of siegfried closes with the awakening of brunhilde and a splendid duet with siegfried the composition of this work was interrupted at the end of the second act and here we come to one of the most curious circumstances in wagner's career he says that he felt it necessary to stop now and write a practical opera for the stage as it then was in order to re-establish his connection with the german theatre for he did not believe that these works would be performed in his own time accordingly he wrote die meistersinger and the opera of tristan and isolde they were finished in eighteen sixty five and hans von bulow who was then director of the opera at munich took them both for rehearsal they had there about one hundred sixty rehearsals of tristan and isolde but gave it up as impossible the singers forgetting from one day to another the music they had learned the previous day the other work the meistersinger fared better they had sixty-six rehearsals and finally brought it to a dress rehearsal which was as far as they got toward performing it nothing shows the increased growth that wagner had made as well as his unconsciousness of this growth like this experience of his operas at munich under so enterprising and able a director as hans von bulow who was undoubtedly the most competent man in germany as well as the most courageous for the task of producing this kind of work although these operas were not successful at the time die meistersinger has since become highly appreciated upon large stages and it is in my opinion the most beautiful opera that has ever been written the music throughout is in a noble and dignified strain with melodies beautiful and highly finished almost suitable for church music yet comedy in the best sense of the term the famous prize song in this work is sufficiently well known there is a most delightful finale in the third act where beckmesser's serenade occurs as one of the incidents the other work tristan and isolde is the most difficult opera that has ever been written and will have to wait a generation yet most likely before its beauties are fully appreciated after composing these two enormous works wagner went on to finish siegfried and then completed the work by writing die goethe dämmerung the twilight of the gods or the death of siegfried as he had originally intended to call it this work contains one number which is stupendous in its pathos the funeral march of siegfried nothing like it exists elsewhere these four operas have a very remarkable peculiarity that throughout the four there are certain leading motives which repeatedly occur there is the motive of the magic fire which cuts a great figure in the first opera of the series where loki the fire god appears and is ushered in by this motive it occurs again in the magic fire scene at the close of die Valkyre, where wotan surrounds brunhilde with shrieking flames in order that their terrors may deter cowards from waking her there is the sword motive which is heard in the first opera when this sword is first spoken of it is finally developed where the sword is drawn and again in the opera of siegfried where it is freshly welded there is the valhalla motive 
the siegfried motive and the valkyrie motive and many others to the number of nearly one hundred these are woven together especially in the last opera of the series in a most astonishing and wonderful way yet without impairing the musical flow of the work the scores are also extremely elaborate from an orchestral point of view requiring a large number of instruments most of them having a great deal to do this great trilogy as wagner called it which was at first supposed to be beyond the ability of the public to appreciate has now been given in all parts of germany with great success and it is no longer beyond the ability of an audience to enjoy by the time he had completed this work wagner had conceived the idea of a national theatre to be completed regardless of cost and with appointments permitting it to produce great works in a faultless manner at first he thought of building it at munich but the munich public proved fickle he resolved to build it in an inland town where all his audience would be in the attitude of pilgrims who would have come from a distance to hear a great work with proper surroundings the sum required to complete this was about five hundred thousand dollars it is sufficient compliment to wagner's ability to say that he secured it king louis of bavaria having contributed more than one hundred thousand dollars large sums also were sent in by wagner's societies all over the world the house was completed at bayreuth it was a little theatre holding about one thousand five hundred people with a magnificent stage which at that time was far in advance of any other but has since been surpassed by many notably by that of the auditorium in chicago here he proposed to have what he called a stage festival the singers to contribute their services gratuitously the honor of being selected for this place and the advantage of the experience being regarded as ample compensation the orchestra likewise in great part was to be composed of virtuosi and also to play without pay all these expectations were realized leading the violins for several years was the famous virtuoso wilhelm and the singers of the bayreuth festival were the best that the german stage possessed the festival is now carried out upon a more rational basis the singers receiving something for their services wagner completed his achievements by the opera of parsifal a work nearly related to lohengrin in some respects more beautiful this is entirely like church music and the whole effect of the performance at bayreuth for it has never been given elsewhere is noble and beautiful it leaves an impression like a church service the peculiarities of wagner's operas are many the plays from a poetic side are in the vein of magic irresistible causes work together for irresistible ends they are sombre and primeval like the voice of the forest the music fits the poem exactly without making any attempt at being beautiful on its own account it is extremely elaborate and richly scored for orchestra and full of beautiful science not intended to be recognized as such by the average hearer from a dramatic point of view the works are very consistent and the stage effects are of a remarkable kind wagner was fortunate enough to make the acquaintance of a mechanic able to carry out some of his most impracticable suggestions wagner left a large number of pamphlets and treatises which are likely to remain among the classics of musical literature the most important is his opera and drama written in eighteen fifty one this is a full discussion in singularly vigorous and clear language of the entire nature of opera as poetically conceived and as practically carried out by the previous masters and as proposed to be carried out by wagner himself many of wagner's writings have now been translated into english his opera texts are highly esteemed by his admirers and respected by all 
as a poet the general opinion seems to be that he was given to magnificent phraseology rather than to delicacy of fancy or humor he is most at home with the grand the gigantic the superhuman and in nearly all that he writes the primeval undertone of the minor makes itself felt it is entirely uncertain whether opera will continue to follow the lines he laid down with the same severity but there can be no question that his influence upon the course of art will be very great in musical discourse especially in the harmonic side of it wagner has made very great variations from the practices of his predecessors even the most free of the instrumental writers schumann his modulations are carried into more remote keys and the tempered scale is taken as a finality of our tonal system all the keys are brought near as he treats them and in any key any chord whatever can be introduced without effecting a modulation provided it be so managed that the sense of tonality is not unsettled personally wagner was rather small very fastidious in his attire and surroundings in eighteen sixty nine madame cosima daughter of liszt and wife of von bulow left him and became the wife of wagner during the last ten years of his life they had an elegant residence at bayreuth where madame wagner still has her home wagner died in venice whither he had gone for the mild climate no musician in the entire history of art has occupied the attention of the whole contemporaneous world to anything like the same degree as did richard wagner from the performance of lohengrin in eighteen fifty until his death in eighteen eighty three end of chapter thirty four chapter thirty five of a popular history of the art of music from the earliest times until the present by w s b matthews this librivox recording is in the public domain virtuosity in the nineteenth century paganini berlioz chopin liszt part one strictly speaking there was no break in the continuity of art development represented in the virtuoso appearances recorded in chapter thirty and those with which we have presently to deal in point of chronology many of those recorded in the present chapter were contemporaneous with some of those in the former nevertheless the artists with whom we are now concerned represent principles more decidedly belonging to the romantic and hence to the nineteenth century than did those whose operations have already been discussed as part of the record of the eighteenth this is seen in the quality and the novelty of their playing and still more in the influence which they exercised upon the musicians who came after earliest of these in point of time and most influential in other departments than his own was the famous italian violinist nicolo paganini seventeen eighty four eighteen forty perhaps the most remarkable executant upon the violin who has ever appeared his father a clever amateur had him taught music at an early age and when only nine years of age he played in a concert at genoa with triumphant success he had already practiced diligently and with the intuition of genius had found out his own ways of accomplishing things so that when at the age of eleven he was taken to parma to the teacher rolla he was told that there was nothing to teach him returning home he continued his practice applying himself as much as eight or ten hours a day and producing a number of compositions so difficult that he alone could play them his first european tour took place in eighteen o five and astonished the world the most marvelous stories were told of him it was popularly supposed that he could play upon anything provided only the catgut and the horsehair were furnished him his first appearance in france was in eighteen thirty one and in the same year he played in london the height of his fame was reached in eighteen thirty four at which time berlioz uh, the french composer presented him with a beautiful symphony harold en italie 
notwithstanding the fact that paganini lost money in paris he presented berlioz with twenty thousand francs in order to enable him to pursue his career as a composer unhampered by financial distress this act was greatly to paganini's credit and entirely contrary to the prevalent opinion concerning him which was that he was very miserly among the works which paganini produced was a set of caprices for the violin which were essentially novelties for the instrument he enlarged the resources of the violin in every direction employing double stopping harmonics and the high positions with a freedom previously unknown notwithstanding spohr's modest remark that upon a certain evening when playing for some amateurs he delighted them with all the paganini juggles it is certain that he did nothing of the kind it is impossible after this lapse of time to realize the sensation which paganini's appearances made his tall emaciated figure and haggard face his piercing black eyes and the furor of passion which characterized his playing made him seem like one possessed and many hearers were prepared to assert of their own knowledge that they had seen him assisted by the evil spirit his caprices remain the sheet anchor of the would-be virtuoso the entire art of violin playing rests upon two works the bach sonatas for violin solo and the great paganini caprices everything of which the violin is capable or which any virtuoso has been able to find in it is contained in these works upon two composers of this century paganini's influence was extremely powerful schumann took his departure from the paganini caprices seeking to perform upon the piano the same kind of effect which paganini had obtained from the violin or to discover others equivalent to them and liszt set himself to do upon the piano the same kind of impossibilities which paganini had performed upon the violin both these masters accomplished more than they planned for schumann enriched the current of musical discourse by his experiments having their departure from paganini thereby accomplishing something which paganini did not for while the great violinist's works are of astonishing value for the violin they are not particularly significant as as tone poetry they are pleasing and sensational and at times passionate showpieces for the virtuoso part two hector berlioz eighteen o three eighteen sixty nine for whose genius paganini had such admiration was perhaps the most remarkable french personality in music during the nineteenth century and one of the most commanding in the whole world of music he was born at grenoble in the south of france his father a physician intended that the son should follow his own profession but when the young berlioz was sent to paris to study medicine at the age of eighteen music proved too strong for him and he entered the conservatory as a pupil of le sueur his parents were so incensed by this course that the paternal supplies were cut off and the young enthusiast was driven to the expedient of earning a scanty living by singing in the opera chorus at an obscure theatre la gymnase dramatique the daring originality of the young musician and his habit of regarding every rule as open to question rendered him anything but a favorite with the cherubini the director of the conservatory and it was only after several trials that he carried off the prize for composition the second instance of this kind occurred in eighteen thirty the piece being a dramatic cantata sardanapol which gained him the prize of rome carrying with it a pension sufficient to maintain the winner during three years in italy on his return to paris he found it extremely difficult to secure a living by his compositions their originality and the scale upon which he carried them out placing them outside the conventional markets for new musical works designed for public performance in this strait he took to writing for the press 
in the journal des débats for which his talent was little if any less marked than for musical production upon the largest scale as a writer he was keen sarcastic bright and sympathetic a man of the world and at the same time an artist he touched everything with the characteristic lightness and raciness of the born feuilletonist very soon in eighteen thirty four he produced his symphony Harold en Italie, which Paganini so much admired that he presented Berlioz with the very liberal, even princely douceur of twenty thousand francs, four thousand dollars. Meanwhile, Berlioz was unable to secure recognition in Paris. His compositions were regarded as extravagant and fantastic, and Parisians were curiously surprised at the reception the composer met with in Germany when he traveled there in 1842 and 1843 and again in 1852, bringing out his works. The Germans were by no means unanimous regarding his merits. Mendelssohn, who found Berlioz most most interesting as a man had no admiration for his music to him it appeared crazy and unbeautiful the sole recognition which berlioz had in france was the librarianship of the conservatoire with a modest salary and the cross of the legion of honor in spite of the small esteem in which this clever master was held by his countrymen during his life he produced a succession of remarkable works without which the art of music would have missed some of its brightest pages among these we may mention his dramatic legend of the damnation of faust for solos chorus and orchestra which marks one of the highest points reached by program music this great work is now generally accepted as one of the best of the romantic productions and the orchestral pieces in it have become part of the standard repertory of orchestras everywhere berlioz was above all the composer of the grandiose the magnificent this appears in his earliest works in eighteen thirty seven he composed his requiem for the funeral obsequies of general damremont this work is of unprecedented proportions it is scored for chorus solos and orchestra the latter occasionally of extraordinary appointment in the tuba mirum for example he desires full chorus of strings and four choirs of woodwind and brass the woodwind consists of twelve horns eight oboes and four clarinets two piccolos and four flutes the brass is disposed in four choirs as follows each at one of the corners of the stage the first consists of four trumpets four tenor trombones and two tubas the second of four trumpets and four tenor trombones the third the same the fourth of four trumpets four tenor trombones and four ophiclides the bewildering answers of these four choirs of brass give place at the words hear the awful trumpet sounding to a single bass voice accompanied by sixteen kettle drums tuned to a chord the movement of similar sonority is the rex tremende majestatis at other times the work is very melodious it is indeed singular that a young composer should commence his career with a piece so daring but to berlioz's credit it must be said he never makes a mistake in his calculations of effect when he desires contrast and blending effect of different masses these results always follow whenever his work is performed according to his directions all the music of berlioz belongs to the category of program music that is to say everywhere there is an attempt at painting a scene or representing something by means of music that something being habitually suggested and explained by the text if the work be vocal or by explanatory notes if the work be instrumental this is as true of his symphonies romeo and juliet and harold in italy as in the vocal works themselves the list of these contains an oratorio the childhood of christ eighteen fifty four the damnation of faust eighteen forty six the operas ben venuto cellini produced at the academie eighteen thirty eight the trojans eighteen fifty six beatrice et benedict eighteen sixty three 
the first was performed under the direction of liszt at weimar about eighteen fifty but with indifferent success berlioz instrumented several pianoforte compositions for orchestra the best known of them being weber's invitation to the dance and polonaise in e flat his treatise upon instrumentation published in eighteen sixty four remains standard until since the appearance of the elaborate and more systematic work upon this subject by f a Gevert the greatest of berlioz's works is his splendid te deum written during the years eighteen fifty four and eighteen fifty five for some kind of festival performance he planned this composition as part of a great trilogy of an epic dramatic character in honor of napoleon the first consul at the moment of his return from his italian campaigns he was to have been represented as entering notre dame where this te deum is sung by an appointment of musical forces consisting of a double chorus of two hundred voices a third choir of six hundred children an orchestra of one hundred thirty four an organ and solo voices the entire work was never completed and the te deum had its first and only representation in berlioz's lifetime at the opening of the palace of industry april thirtieth eighteen fifty five the work is full of splendid conceptions and is freer from eccentricities than any other of the author it is extremely sonorous and is destined to be better known as festival occasions upon a large scale become more numerous the whole effect of berlioz's activity was that of a virtuoso in the department of dramatic and descriptive music and in the art of wielding large orchestral masses it is curious that between him and wagner the relations should never have been cordial although the ends proposed by both were substantially identical and the genius of both incontestable berlioz had no confidence in wagner's endless melody and when he writes about music he does so in the attitude of a humble follower of the old masters part three the progress in piano playing in the course of the nineteenth century has been most extraordinary the music of beethoven and schubert composed during the first quarter of this century and the influence of the virtuosi prominent during that time whose activity has been told in connection with those of the century previous the operative principles of which were the ones mainly influencing them and the continual strife of the piano makers to increase the resonance singing quality and artistic susceptibility of the tone and the strength and elasticity of the action as recounted in the chapter devoted to the history of this the greatest of modern instruments were concentrating influences having the effect of calling attention to the new instrument in a very remarkable manner add to these causes the meteor-like appearance of paganini with his stupendous execution upon the violin and its novel possibilities all these together seem to have led four gifted geniuses at about the same time to make independent investigations into the tonal possibilities of the piano and the mode of producing effects upon it in the hope of creating a new art and of rivaling the weird successes of the highly gifted italian who apparently had exhausted the possibilities of the violin the artists thus occupied in developing the art of piano playing were chopin liszt thalberg and schumann and it is far from easy to determine exactly which one it was who first brought his influence to bear upon the public or which one it was who first arrived at the successful application of the principles of the new technique whose essential divergences from the old consisted in a more flexible use of the fingers hand and arm and the cooperation of the foot for promotion of blending and bringing into simultaneous use the tonal resources from all parts of the instrument in this case as in so many others of remarkable invention the improvements seem to have been made by several independent investigators acting simultaneously each one ignorant of the work of the others 
the impulse in the direction of greater freedom had already found expression in the pianoforte pieces of the great master von weber whose sonatas and caprices had been published between eighteen ten and eighteen twenty these contain several novelties which i have found it more convenient to discuss in connection with a personal history of the composer liszt has generally been held as a little the earliest of the four in point of time his arrangement of berlioz herald symphony having been published according to the dates in weizmann's history in eighteen twenty seven but according to more accurate information in eighteen thirty five while he had published his arrangement of the paganini caprices in eighteen thirty two one year after hearing paganini in these works liszt makes demands upon the hands which were not recognized as among the possibilities of the old technique but for all this it is apparently certain that the honor of having developed a style distinctly original and with peculiarities easily recognizable by the average listener belongs to the great virtuoso thalberg sigismund thalberg eighteen twelve to eighteen seventy one was the illegitimate son of prince dietrichstein a diplomat then living at geneva his mother was the baroness von wetzlar thalberg was carefully educated and accustomed to high-bred society from childhood his father intended him for a diplomatic career but the boy's talent for the piano was irresistible and so well had his education been advanced by his teacher the first bassoonist of the vienna opera that by the time he was fifteen he made a brilliant success at a concert in vienna his first composition in the style which he afterward made so famous was the fantasia on themes from Euryanthe which was published in eighteen twenty eight later in eighteen thirty five he entered upon his public career as virtuoso with concert tours to all parts of the world everywhere greeted with admiration and astonishment he appeared in paris late in eighteen thirty four or early in eighteen thirty five finding liszt there in the plenitude of his powers then there was a rivalry between them and opposing camps were instituted of their respective admirers the dispute as to their relative excellence ran high and as usually happens in personal questions of this sort victory did not belong entirely to either party nevertheless at this distance it is not easy to see why the question should have been raised since in the light of modern piano playing liszt's art had in it the promise of everything which has come since while thalberg's had in it only one side of the modern art thalberg had a wonderful technique in which scales of marvelous fluency lightness clearness and equality intervene between chord passages of great breadth and sonority so that all the resources of the piano were open to him but his specialty was that of carrying a melody in the middle of the piano playing it by means of the two thumbs alternately the other hand being occupied in runs and passages covering the whole compass of the piano crossing the melody from below or descending upon it from the highest regions of the treble and continuing down the keyboard with perfect equality and lightness without in the slightest degree disturbing the singing of the melody this of its own accord went on in the most artistic manner as if the pianist had nothing at all else to do than to sing it the perfection of thalberg's melody playing was something wonderful as well it might be for in order to master the art of it he studied singing for five years with one of the best teachers of the italian school the eminent garcia this however was later after he had located in paris this trick of treating the melody was not new with thalberg it had previously been done upon the harp by the great welsh virtuoso parish alvers eighteen o eight eighteen forty nine whose european reputation had been acquired by a succession of great concert tours and who at length closed his days in vienna where thalberg lived there was also an italian master giuseppe francesco polini seventeen sixty three eighteen forty six who in eighteen o nine became professor of the piano in the conservatory of milan Polini had been a pupil of Mozart and dedicated to that great master his first work. 
early after being appointed professor he published a great school for the pianoforte 1811 in which the art is fully discussed in all its bearings and minute directions given for touch and all the rest appertaining to a concert treatment of the instrument he was the first to write piano pieces upon three staves the middle one being devoted to the melody a proceeding afterward followed in some cases by liszt and thalberg Pollini surrounded his melodies thus placed in the middle of the instrument where at that time the sonority and singing quality of the pianoforte exclusively lay with runs and passages of a brilliant and highly ingenious kind this was done in his una de trenta due esercizi in forma di toccata but he had already in eighteen o one published several brilliant pieces in paris in which novelties occur i have never seen a copy of these works of pollini nor any other account of them than those in riemann's dictionary and in weitzmann's history of the pianoforte but it is altogether likely that when they are examined we shall find in this case as in many others of progressive development that the final result was reached by a succession of steps each one short and apparently not so very important the chain of technical development for the piano extended from bach in unbroken progress and the discovery of pollini who was less known in western lands than others of the great names in the list enables us to fill in between moschelis and thalberg pollini's work anticipates the clementi gradus by about six years to return to thalberg in eighteen fifty six he visited america where his success was the same as in all other parts of the world having accumulated a fortune he retired from active life and bought an estate near naples where he spent the remainder of his life there were reasons of a purely external and conventional kind why the playing of thalberg should have attracted more attention or at least been more admired than that of liszt in paris and in aristocratic circles everywhere his manner was the perfection of quiet whatever the difficulty of the passages upon which he was engaged he remained perfectly quiet sitting upright modestly without a single unnecessary motion moreover the general character of his passages which progressed fluently upward or downward by degrees instead of taking violent leaps from one part of the keyboard to another permitted him to maintain this elegant quiet with less restriction than would have been possible in such works for instance as the great concert fantasias of liszt it is to be noticed further that the peculiar sonority of thalberg's playing depended upon the improvements in the pianoforte made just before his appearance and during his career his method of playing the melody moreover while perhaps not distinctly so recognized by him employed a noticeable element of the arm touch while his passage work was a ringer movement of the lightest and most facile description his chords also were often struck with a finger touch and he was perhaps the originator of the peculiar effect produced by touching a chord with the fingers only but rebounding from the keys with the whole arm to the elbow a chord thus played has a delicacy peculiar to finger work but in the removal from the keys the muscles of the arm are called into action in such a way that the finger stroke is intensified to a degree somewhat depending upon the height to which the rebound is carried part four francois frederic chopin eighteen o nine eighteen forty nine was one of the most remarkable composers of this epoch and in some respects one of the most precocious musical geniuses of whom we have any record he was born at zela zowa vola a village six miles from warsaw in poland the son of a french merchant living there who had married a polish lady later in consequence of financial reverses his father became a teacher in the university 
the boy francois was brought up amid refined and pleasant surroundings and his education was carefully looked to although rather delicate in appearance he was healthy and full of spirits his precocity upon the piano was such that at the age of nine he played a concerto in public with great success from which time forward he made many appearances in his native city he early began to compose and by the time he was thirteen or fourteen had undertaken a number of works of considerable magnitude after having received the best instruction which his native city afforded he started out at the age of nineteen for a visit to vienna where he appeared in two concerts and to his own surprise was pronounced one of the greatest virtuosi of the day this however is not the point of his precocity when he started upon his tour to vienna he had with him certain manuscripts which he had composed his opus two consisted of variations upon mozart's air la ci darem la mano of which later schumann wrote such a glowing account in his paper at leipzig these variations were enormously difficult and in a whole novel style there were several mazurkas and three nocturnes opus nine of which the extremely popular one in e flat stands second the twelve studies opus ten dedicated to franz liszt and a concerto in f minor and all or nearly all of that in e minor these were the works of a boy then only nineteen the pupil of a comparatively unknown provincial teacher when we examine these works more minutely our astonishment increases for they represent an entirely new school of piano playing new effects new managements of the hands new passages beautiful melody exquisitely modulated harmonies in short a new world in piano playing was here opened so difficult and so strange were these works that for nearly a generation the more difficult ones of them were a sealed book to amateur pianists and even virtuosi like moscheles declare that they could never get their fingers reliably through them much pleased with his success in vienna chopin returned to warsaw and after some months set out for london by way of paris here his fortune varied somewhat at first he found it impossible to secure a hearing his only acquaintances being a few of his exiled fellow-countrymen who were there at length one evening a friend took him to a reception at the rothschilds and in this cultivated society he found appreciative listeners to his marvelous playing from that time on he remained in paris only leaving it when his health made it necessary to visit the south of france he very seldom appeared in public his touch was not sufficiently strong to render his playing effective in a large hall the whole of the chopin genius is summed up in his early works which he took with him on his visit to vienna all his later works are in some sense repetitions the ideas and the treatment are new but the principles underlying are the same and rarely if ever does he reach a higher flight than in some of these earlier works his most celebrated innovation was that of the nocturne a sentimental cantilena for the pianoforte in which a somewhat byronic sentiment is expressed in a high-bred and elegant style the name nocturne was not original with chopin the dublin pianist john field having published his first nocturnes in eighteen sixteen field himself derived the name from the prayers of the roman church which are made between midnight and morning the name therefore implies something belonging to the night mysterious dreamy poetic in fields there is little of this aside from the name the melodies are plain and the sentiments commonplace with chopin however it is entirely different in some instances the treatment for the piano is very simple as in the popular nocturne in e flat already mentioned but in other cases he exercises the utmost freedom and very carefully trained fingers are needed to perform them successfully this is the case for example in the beautiful nocturne in g opus thirty seven number two where the passages in thirds and sixths are extremely trying also in the very dramatic nocturne in c minor opus forty eight 
chopin's place in the pantheon of the romantic school is that of the popularizer of pianoforte sentiment his compositions by whatever name they may be called are essentially lyric pieces songs ballads and fanciful stories in rhyme the subjects are frequently tender or sad sometimes morbid in short byronic the treatment is always graceful and high-bred and the contrasts strong the melodies are embroidered with a peculiar kind of fioratura which he invented himself founded upon the italian embellishment of that kind a delicate efflorescence of melody which when perfectly done is extremely pleasing the names applied to the different compositions such as ballade scherzo prelude rondo sonata impromptu have only a remote reference to the nature of the piece occasionally the entire composition is morbid and unsatisfactory to a degree these belong to the later period of his life when he was in poor health he is a woman's composer in his strongest moments there is always an effeminate element in this respect he is exactly opposite to schumann and beethoven whose works however delicate and refined have always a manly strength chopin made the most important modifications in the current way of treating the piano in this part of his activity he seemed to realize the possibilities of the instrument in the same way that paganini had recognized those of the violin his passages while based upon those of hummel nevertheless produced effects of which hummel was totally incapable chopin is the originator of the extended arpeggio chord of the chromatic sequences of the diminished sevenths with passing notes and cadenza forms derived from them he is thoroughly french in his views of changing notes as for instance in the accompaniment to the impromptu in a flat opus twenty nine his influence upon the general progress of musical development is to be traced in the works of liszt especially in the later pianoforte works and in a large number of less gifted imitators like Döller part five aside from wagner the most remarkable figure of this century is that of franz liszt who was born at riding in hungary eighteen eleven and died at bayreuth eighteen eighty six his father adam liszt was an official in the imperial service and a musical amateur capable of instructing his son in piano playing at the age of nine he made his first public appearance with so much success that several noblemen guaranteed the money to enable him to pursue his studies for six years in vienna here he became a pupil of cerny salieri and randhartinger he made the acquaintance of schubert and upon one occasion played before beethoven who kissed him with the prophecy that he would make his mark his first appearance as a composer was in a set of variations on a waltz by diabelli the same for which beethoven wrote the thirty three variations opus one twenty liszt's variation was the twenty fourth in the set to which beethoven did not contribute it was published in eighteen twenty three when he was twelve years old the same year he went to paris his father hoping to enter him at the conservatory in spite of his foreign origin but cherubini refused to receive him so he studied with the other composers his operetta of don sanche was performed at the academie royale in eighteen twenty five and was well received at this time he was in the height of his youthful success in paris tall slender with long hair and a most free and engaging countenance with ready wit and unbounded tact he performed marvels upon the piano such as no one else could attempt his repertory at this time seems to have consisted of pieces of the old school in eighteen twenty seven he lost his father and being thrown upon his own resources he began his concert tour he appeared in london in eighteen twenty seven his piece being the hummel concert three years later he played in london again his number being the weber concertstück 
there was something weird and magnetic about his playing he was very tall about six feet two inches slender with piercing eyes very long arms but small hands he played without notes and amid the most frightful difficulties of execution kept his eyes fixed upon this that or the other person in the audience he moved about at the piano very much in the exciting passages not apparently on account of the difficulty of overcoming technical obstacles but simply from innate fire and excitement as for technical difficulties they did not exist everything that the piano contained seemed to be at his service and the only regret was that the instrument was not better able to respond to his demands in the fortissimo passages his tone was immense and his pianissimos were the most delicate whispers in these his fingers glided over the keys with inconceivable lightness and speed and the tone fell upon the ear with a delicate tracery with which no particular was lost by reason of speed or lightness this wonderful control of the instrument stood him in equal stead with his own compositions especially adapted to his own style of playing or with the works of the old school which he transfigured as they had never been played before or the last sonatas of beethoven which at that time were a sealed book to most musicians these indeed he did not play in public but in private the essential novelties of the liszt technique were the bravura cadenzas the other sensational features such as carrying the melody in the middle range of the piano with surrounding embroidery the rapid runs and the extravagant climaxes were all more or less common to the three representative virtuoso piano writers of this epoch liszt chopin and thalberg a careful study of the circumstances and influences surrounding liszt at the time leads to the conclusion that his ideas of the possibilities of the pianoforte were matured very gradually not reaching their complete expression in the operatic fantasies before about eighteen thirty four or eighteen thirty five his early appearances were in pieces of the old school and there is nothing more to be found in contemporary accounts of his playing than admiration for its superior fire and delicacy upon the appearance of paganini however this was changed the temporary eclipse which this brilliant apparition made of the rising list led him to new studies in original directions thus arose the transcriptions of the paganini caprices in eighteen thirty two and the composition of his own studies for transcendent execution in the same or the following year farther sensational improvements were probably the result of the talberg contest in paris during eighteen thirty five liszt's influence may be inferred from such incidents as the following in eighteen thirty nine there was a movement on foot to erect a monument to beethoven at bonn but after some months solicitation the committee found it impossible to realize the desired sum or anything approaching it whereupon liszt wrote them to give themselves no further uneasiness for he himself would be responsible for the entire amount about ten thousand dollars this large sum he raised by his own exertions and paid over and a monument was unveiled with brilliant ceremonies in eighteen forty five one of the performances upon that occasion was that of the beethoven fifth concerto which liszt himself played concerning this memorable performance berlioz himself writes the piano concerto in e flat is generally known for one of the better productions of beethoven the first movement and the adagio above all are of incomparable beauty to say that liszt played it and that he played it in a fashion grand fine poetic yet always faithful is to make a veritable pleonasm and there was a tumult of applause a sound of trumpets and fanfares of the orchestra which must have been heard far beyond the limits of the hall liszt immediately afterward mounted the desk of the conductor to direct the performance of the symphony in c minor which he made us hear as beethoven wrote it including the entire scherzo without the abridgment as we have so long been accustomed to hear at the conservatory at paris and the finale with 
with the repeat indicated by beethoven i have always had such confidence in the taste of the correctors of the great masters that i was very much surprised to find the symphony in c minor still more beautiful when executed entirely than when corrected it was necessary to go to bonn to make this discovery in eighteen forty nine a new epoch was opened in the history of this remarkable man the grand duke of weimar invited him to assume the direction of his musical establishment including the opera the salary was absurdly small eight hundred dollars or one thousand dollars a year this however cut no figure in liszt's mind for he had always been singularly open-handed yet at the same time prudent for his successful concert tours he had put by funds twenty thousand francs for his aged mother and twenty thousand francs for each of the three children he had by the countess d'agoul known in literature as daniel stern and he considered that the position would afford him an opportunity of developing his own talent for composition and at the same time of affording a hearing for important new works which on account of their novelty and originality were impossible of performance in the theaters of large cities the repertory of the weimar opera from this time on was most extraordinary here were produced for the first time wagner's flying dutchman tannhäuser and lohengren benvenuto cellini of berlioz schumann's genoveva and manfred and schubert's alfonso and estrella here were produced also the best of the operas of previous generations every master work of this sort liszt revised with the greatest care giving endless patience to every detail and supplementing the resources of the theater when insufficient by guests from the great operas in the capital thus the musical establishment at weimar became a sort of mecca to which all the musicians of the world gathered especially the young and energetic in the pursuit of knowledge and creative artists seeking a hearing our fresh inspiration from an artistic standpoint nothing more beautiful than the life of liszt at weimar could be desired besides these operatic performances and his symphony concerts he gathered about him a succession of young virtuosi pianists these had lessons more or less formally some of them for many years liszt never received money for lessons and took no pupils but those whom he regarded as promising or who were personally attractive to himself about eighteen fifty the american dr william mason was there and for two years following the class at this time contained the well-known names of rubinstein karl klindworth Bruckner, tausig joachim raff and hans von bülow from this time on there is scarcely a concert pianist in the world who did not spend a few months or longer with liszt at weimar nor did his influence stop there he produced a constant succession of important works and conducted concerts and festivals in hungary and in different parts of germany and france everywhere his inspiring presence and his keen insight were prized above all ordinary resources there is not space here to sketch in detail his singular and trying relations to that self-conscious genius wagner who when absconding to zurich sent the score of lohengrin to liszt it can be imagined with what force the elevated and noble beauty of this epoch-making work appealed to a genius so sensitive as liszt he not only produced the opera with great care but prepared the public for it by means of extended articles in important journals in leipzig berlin and paris from this time on liszt became the good angel of wagner there are few records in the annals of music more creditable than the letters of liszt to wagner he took charge of his business in germany exercised his wholly unique and commanding influence to secure performances of wagner's operas sent him money out of his own purse and secured some of his friends more than this he greeted every new work of wagner's with an appreciation as generous and noble as it was intelligent and fine about eighteen fifty two liszt commenced his symphonic poems in these he avails himself of two of wagner's suggestions much is made of the leading motive and the orchestration is handled in a sonorous and brilliant manner which berlioz and wagner first introduced 
the works are very effective and original certain ones of them have become almost classic like the preludes and tasso he also wrote a number of large choral works among them his legend of the holy elizabeth the grainer mass etc there is hardly a province of musical composition in which liszt did not distinguish himself the orchestral compositions number about twenty there are several important arrangements such as schubert's marches schubert's songs Rakotzi march and a variety of arrangements for pianoforte and orchestra including two concertos the weber polacca in e and the schubert fantasia the pianoforte compositions are extremely numerous of the original pieces there are perhaps one hundred of important arrangements such as the etudes from paganini the organ preludes and fugues from bach schubert marches etc there are thirty or forty of the operatic fantasias there are perhaps a hundred or more there are fifteen hungarian rhapsodies and a large number of transcriptions of vocal pieces of songs alone there are upward of a hundred of masses and psalms about twenty two oratorios several cantatas about sixty original songs for single voice and piano and very many other writings of a literary and musical kind in eighteen sixty five liszt left weimar for several years and resided in rome where he began to take holy orders in the closing years of wagner's life after the bayreuth festival theater had been inaugurated liszt was a central figure and there are few large cities in europe which he did not visit for the sake of encouraging important productions of the wagnerian works thus taken as a composer a performer a conductor and an appreciative friend of art his name is one which deserves to be revered as long as the history of music in the nineteenth century is remembered figure eighty four represents him as he appeared in the last years of his life the portrait of liszt as abbe is taken from grove's dictionary neither of these last pictures gives an adequate idea of the sweetness of his expression while the profile in middle life was sharp and clearly cut as we see it in the abbe picture and while in old age the mouth assumed a stern and set expression in repose his smile was extremely winning and the habitual expression of his face in conversation one of amiability and kindness end of chapter 35chapter 36 of a popular history of the art of music from the earliest times until the present by w s b matthews this librivox recording is in the public domain mendelssohn and schumann part one one of the most fortunate personalities among modern composers was felix mendelssohn bartholdi eighteen o nine eighteen forty seven who was born in berlin the grandson of moses mendelssohn the famous jewish philosopher the father of felix was a banker and his mother a woman of a very sweet and amiable disposition the children of abraham mendelssohn were baptized in the christian faith in order to escape in some degree the prejudice against the jewish race felix having a strong inclination to music at an early age made progress in it his first concert appearance was made at the age of ten in which he played the piano part in a trio by Wiffel and was very much applauded as early as his twelfth year he began systematically to compose and be naturally of methodical habits which were still further encouraged by his father and mother he kept an accurate record of his works which at the last filled forty-four folio volumes the most of the pieces being dated and the place given where they were written in the year eighteen twenty he composed between fifty and sixty movements of almost every sort songs part songs pieces for organ piano strings and orchestra as well as a cantata and a little comedy for voices and a piano in the summer of eighteen twenty the whole family made a tour of switzerland and a very large number of pieces were composed at this time 
in this same year he made a more important concert appearance with alois schmidt in which he played with schmidt a duet for two pianos this continued exercise in composition was not entirely of an abstract nature for the mendelssohn family were accustomed to have reunions on sunday evenings when these pieces were played for occasions like this he wrote several small operas and his talent was encouraged in every way by his parents and by his very judicious teacher the celebrated Zelter. when he was scarcely more than twelve years old Zelter had him play before goethe and a trio of the boys was also played after which he was sent to play in the garden while his seniors discussed his prospects thus the boy grew up under the most favorable circumstances possible his father being a wise and careful man who although not a musician thoroughly sympathized with the artistic aims of his son and his mother also encouraged him to more serious efforts even at this early age he was a prolific composer of orchestral music the year eighteen twenty four being that of the composition of the symphony in c minor now known as number one but in mendelssohn's catalogue marked the thirteenth of his compositions in this year moschelis passed through berlin on his way to london and made the acquaintance of mendelssohn at the sunday morning music in the mendelssohn house moschelis recalls the performance of felix's c minor quartet d major symphony a concerto by bach played by fanny and a duet for two pianos in the same year spohr came to berlin and a little later hiller both of whom speaking of mendelssohn's playing as something very remarkable his celebrated octet for strings opus twenty was composed in eighteen twenty five this was the first of his works which has retained its popularity the year following he composed the overture to the midsummer night's dream one of the most remarkable pieces of the early romantic school in this the fairy-like music of titania and her elves is charmingly contrasted with the folk songs and the absurd bray of the transformed bottom he had already written an opera camacho which had been submitted to spontini the musical director of berlin but it was never performed he entered at the university and attended the lectures of hegel and karl ritter the geographer but for mathematics he had no talent two folio volumes of notes of the lectures of hegel and ritter are preserved from the years eighteen twenty seven and eighteen twenty eight his overture to the calm sea and prosperous voyage was written in eighteen twenty eight in the year following he started on a long journey of three years carefully planned by his father in which all the countries of europe were to have been visited successively and observations made on civilization and society his first appearance before an english audience was at a philharmonic concert may twenty fifth eighteen twenty eight when he conducted his symphony in c minor and improvised on the piano he was received with the utmost applause five days later he played the concertstück of von weber and which was a great innovation at that time with no music before him his letters from london are very charming indeed at a concert later his overture to the midsummer night's dream was performed with great success this was the beginning of his english popularity lasting all the rest of his life the first of his songs without words was published in eighteen thirty having been originally composed for his sister fanny in this simple act he opened a new chapter of the literature for the piano the form of the song without words had already been given in field's nocturnes the first of which were published in eighteen sixteen but mendelssohn by giving it the title song without words put the hearer in a different relation to the composition that of seeking to find in the work a poetic suggestion in addition to the pleasing melody and finely modulated harmony this also is extremely characteristic of the romantic epoch in which music has its origin in poetry he had already written a number of those charming capriccios in which the piano is treated with light staccato changing chords 
such as von weber had suggested nearly twenty years earlier in his moment capriccio but which no writer brought to such perfection as mendelssohn these two styles of pianoforte writing the fairy-like scherzo and the song without words are mendelssohn's specialties in which no other writer can be compared with him he also wrote a number of concertos for piano and orchestra and one for violin in which these two elements are very strong features without having the effective passage work of thalberg liszt or chopin or the bold originality of schumann mendelssohn was an extremely original and pleasing pianoforte writer during his life especially in the later part of it he was somewhat overestimated but at the present time through the emergence of schumann from the obscurity into which mendelssohn's reputation cast him the works of mendelssohn are often underestimated he opened a new chapter in tone poetry popularizing pianoforte sentiment the famous g minor concerto for the piano was first produced in munich in eighteen thirty one in the same year he went to paris where many of his works were performed and others were composed the next year he was in london again when the hebrides overture was produced and the first book of songs without words was published he also played the organ at several of the churches and excited general admiration by his vigorous style he is said to have been the first to play a bach pedal fugue in england certainly the first to play any of the important ones in eighteen thirty three he was settled at dusseldorf as musical director of the church and two associations there he immediately instituted a reform in the music of the church and in the character of the selections for concert in the church there were masses by beethoven and cherubini motets by palestrina and cantatas by bach the next year his oratorio of st paul was begun in eighteen thirty seven he was married to a very charming lady miss cecilia jean renaud daughter of the clergyman of the reformed church at frankfurt very soon after the wedding he was in london and birmingham where he conducted st paul and commenced to prepare the libretto for his oratorio of elijah among the bach fugues which he played in london on the organ at this time were the d major the g minor the e major the c minor and the short e minor his pedal playing was very highly esteemed in eighteen thirty five he commenced to conduct the vagunthaus concerts at leipzig and the celebrated conservatory there was founded in eighteen forty three the first professors were hauptmann david schumann bolenz and c f becker ferdinand david eighteen ten eighteen seventy three was the greatest master of the violin during the third quarter of the century moritz hauptmann seventeen ninety two eighteen sixty eight originally a violinist was one of the most original theorists of this century his greatest work harmony and meter was published in eighteen fifty three soon afterward moscheles became associated with them the city of leipzig remained his home during the remainder of his life the founding of the conservatory may have been hastened by certain plans which mendelssohn had endeavored three years before to get adopted in berlin where there was a project for founding a royal music school upon a different basis from any at that time existing from some change in the ministry or temporary political disturbance the plan fell through but in leipzig it was carried out this famous school from that time forward for nearly fifty years exercised an influence greater than that of any other music school in the world among its graduates are a very large number of the most successful teachers and celebrated professional musicians they had been drawn to leipzig by the reputation given the conservatory by the possession of such masters as mendelssohn schumann hauptmann moscheles Pleidy, dr paul becker brendel reinecke and others 
after mendelssohn's death indeed the tradition of his ideas hampered the efficiency of the school to some extent but very thorough work has always been done there during his four years connection with the conservatory mendelssohn conducted the gewandhaus concerts and superintended the entire educational operations of the school in addition to this he conducted a succession of important festivals in all parts of europe producing new works of his own and the greatest works of the masters before him he made a great reputation as a concert pianist playing his own concertos and those of beethoven as well as the concertstück of von weber everywhere he improvised upon the organ or the piano and through all the admiration which he received remained the same simple unaffected sincere artist that he was when a boy his home life was very happy in ferdinand hiller's reminiscences many charming pictures of it are given the greatest of mendelssohn's works was elijah which was produced at birmingham august twenty sixth eighteen forty six staudigl the famous baritone of vienna was elijah the work went extremely well at the first performance better mendelssohn says than any former work of his the continual anxiety of producing the new work the travel and the many responsibilities belonging to his position finally undermined his health and at length november fourth eighteen forty seven he died at leipzig it is doubtful whether any musician ever left a warmer or a more distinguished circle of friends than mendelssohn in all parts of the musical world his death was regarded as a calamity in elijah and in the first part of st paul mendelssohn made an addition to the world's stock of oratorios scarcely second to any other works except handel's messiah elijah in particular had the advantage of an extremely dramatic and picturesque story and a text well selected from the scriptures there are many moments in this work of rare and exquisite beauty the choruses when contrapuntally developed have themes somewhat too short whereby the effect of the words is lost in the intermingling of voices coming in at later moments but there are other parts of the work which are extremely beautiful there is a lovely chorus he watching over israel in which the gentle mendelssohnian melody is accompanied by soft triplets in the strings whereby a most delightfully light and spirituel effect is produced near the end of the work there is a very graphic recitative to the words and one cherub cried to another then a soprano voice with grand phrase sings holy holy is god the lord three other soprano voices joining in the last words these are very lightly accompanied immediately thereupon the entire chorus orchestra and organ with the utmost power come in with the same melody holy holy is god the lord this antiphon being the full chorus and the female quartet continues in varying style throughout the chorus and the result is thrilling in the extreme extremely dramatic also is the great chorus thanks be to god for he laveth the thirsty land there are many solo numbers in the work all of them remarkable for the care with which the text is treated and the clearness with which the musical utterance expresses the words the famous tenor song if with all your hearts ye truly seek him the alto song o rest in the lord the angel trio lift thine eyes the great soprano song hear ye israel and the bass aria it is enough and especially the prayer of elijah lord god of abraham isaac and israel are scarcely surpassed in the entire range of oratorio music there is very remarkable instrumentation also in the scenes on mount carmel and especially at the series of choruses where god the lord passed by during his life mendelssohn was very highly esteemed as a composer of orchestral music symphonies and overtures 
while his works in this department contain many beauties and are carried out with elegant clearness of form and with that refinement and taste which characterized everything which mendelssohn did they have not maintained their reputation at the high level where it formerly stood it was mendelssohn's fortune to be one of the masters instrumental in introducing the romantic school but upon principle and education he was classical in his taste and instincts and while his works had a very important use in cultivating an appetite for novelty whereby the other masters of the romantic school profited later he went so short a distance in the new path that the march of events has since left him somewhat behind behind part two if it were asked to name the two masters most representative of the nineteenth century one could scarcely go amiss the names of robert schumann and richard wagner immediately occurring robert schumann eighteen ten eighteen fifty six the son of a very intelligent bookseller was born at Zwickau in saxony and was intended for the law he received lessons in music at an early age and his talent was unmistakable when he was about eleven he accompanied a performance of frederick schneider's weltgericht at home with the aid of some musical companions he got up performances of musical compositions and had a small orchestra he entered at the leipzig university as a student of law but devoted the most of his time to playing the piano and to reading jean paul for whom he had a great fondness he immediately attached himself to the musical circles entering himself as a pupil with wieck the father of his future wife a year later he transferred his attendance to the university of heidelberg attracted thither by the lectures of the famous teacher Thibaut, the same whose work upon the purity of musical art had only recently been published here as in leipzig his principal occupation was practicing upon the piano which he did to the extent of six or seven hours a day notwithstanding his fondness for music his mother was violently opposed to his entering the musical profession and as his father was now dead her wishes naturally had much weight he had already commenced to write songs quite a number of which belonged to the year eighteen thirty when he was living in heidelberg he made a tour to the north of italy and heard the italian musician paganini which fired him with so much ardor that he immediately set himself to transcribe his caprices for the piano and to accomplish upon this instrument similar effects to those which paganini produced upon the violin at length after much difficulty with his guardian and his mother it was agreed that he might fit himself for a musician so in eighteen thirty he was back again in leipzig studying diligently with master wieck in his ardor for great results in a short time he undertook some kind of mechanical discipline for the fourth finger of his right hand the effect of which was that the tendons became overstrained the finger crippled and for a long time he was utterly unable to use it in piano playing in composition he now entered upon regular instruction with heinrich dorn at that time conductor of the opera in leipzig dorn recognized the greatness of schumann's genius and devoted himself with much interest to his improvement in eighteen thirty two a symphony of his was produced in zwickau but apparently with little success for the work was never heard of afterward at this same concert wieck's daughter clara who was then thirteen years of age appeared as a pianist and Zwickau, schumann says was fired with enthusiasm for the first time in its life already he was very much interested in the promising girl and expresses himself concerning her with much ardor he seems to have been singularly slow in composition at this time eighteen thirty three he had written the first and third movements of the g minor sonata had commenced the f minor sonata and completed the toccata which had been begun four years before 
he also arranged the second set of paganini's caprices opus ten he found a faithful friend in frau voigt a pianist of sense and ability schumann usually passed his evenings in a restaurant in company with his friends after the german fashion but while the others talked he usually remained silent frau voigt told w talbert that one lovely summer evening after making music with schumann they both felt inclined to go upon the water they sat side by side in the boat for an hour in silence at parting schumann pressed her hand and said good day we have perfectly understood one another the immediate result of the musical associations of schumann in leipzig was the project for a musical journal devoted to progress and sincerity in opera rossini was then the ruling force at the piano hertz and hinton and musical journalism was represented by allgemeine musikalische zeitung published by breitkopf and hertel which praised almost everything upon general principles in eighteen thirty four the first number of the neue zeitschrift für musik saw the light the editors were robert schumann friedrich wieck ludwig schunk and julius knorr schumann was the ruling power and he proceeded to develop his literary faculty in a variety of forms he writes under many pseudonyms and has much to say about the quote, david league against the philistines close quote, a society existing in his imagination only one of the famous early articles in this paper was that upon chopin's variation la Cidaren greeting the work of the talented young pole as a production of rare genius schumann himself thought so well of this article that he placed it at the beginning of his collected writings it will be impossible within available limits to define the influence of this journal during the ten years when schumann was editor many of the most important productions of the modern school first saw light and all come in for discussion from a point of view at the same time sympathetic and intelligent as an example of the musical life at leipzig in this time moscheles mentions an evening in eighteen thirty five when mendelssohn conducted his first concert in the gavant house the day before this there had been a musical gathering at wix at which both mendelssohn and schumann were present perhaps the first time that these two great geniuses were brought together the next day mendelssohn schumann moscheles and bank dined together and the next day there was music at wix's house moscheles clara wick and l reitman from bremen playing bach's d minor concerto for three pianos mendelssohn putting in the orchestral accompaniments on the fourth piano with mendelssohn he contracted quite an intimacy in eighteen thirty six he found himself very much devoted to clara wieck and in order to secure a more favorable opening for his career resolved to transfer himself and the paper to vienna but after a year he returned again to leipzig and then the course of true love became more difficult for papa wieck was resolutely opposed to the match but after some months his consent was given and they were married in eighteen forty during this year he had an extraordinary activity as a song writer the woman's love and life the poet's love and various other cycles of songs were all produced under the stress of his happy prospects with clara it is not easy to ascertain the order of his compositions since as we have already seen the sonatas and some of the other works appearing late in the list of opus numbers were composed very early the romantic tendency is the most marked of all schumann's characteristics as a composer he is above all others the composer of moods his long pieces are invariably aggregates of shorter ones the typical forms of schumann's thought are two and two only the song and the fantasia he made diligent efforts to master counterpoint and fugue and manly attempts in these provinces can be found among his writings but counterpoint and fugue remained to him a foreign language 
the smoothness of mendelssohn the readiness of bach of beethoven or even mozart are impossible to him on the other hand when he follows his own inclination he creates forms that are clear concise and original one scarcely knows which to admire more the graphic correspondence of the music with the suggestive title placed at the head or the original style of the music itself which is entirely unlike anything by any former composer his opus two is a set called papillons butterflies or scenes at a ball consisting of twelve short movements in different style without explanatory titles some are fantastic others are sentimental all original and striking the eleventh number of this is a short but magnificent polonaise in d major an extremely spirited and beautiful movement which has since been very popular the transcriptions of the paganini caprices were undertaken as studies for the composer himself in the direction of unexplored pianoforte effects but schumann had also the intention of providing in music new discipline for piano students in my opinion the technical value of these works has not yet been realized and it is quite possible that a later generation may esteem them more highly than the present however this may be the practice of writing gave schumann a greater freedom the effect of which is seen upon the next set of pieces the six intermezzi these however are vague and mystical rather than clear with the david's league dances the schumann nature appears more plainly the style is freer and these new combinations are very charming although they must undoubtedly have been fatal stumbling blocks to the fingers of a pianist trained in dulcet and hinton the carnival a series of fanciful scenes belongs to an earlier period having been composed in eighteen thirty four and eighteen thirty five the different numbers of which there are twenty-one are provided with explanatory titles such as pierrot harlequin valse noble eusebius chopin etc of all the earlier works the fantasy pieces opus twelve are the most successful these eight pictures in the evening soaring why whims in the night fable dreams and the end of the song or peroration are extremely characteristic and beautiful and it is not easy to assign the preeminence of one number over the others of the same general class only upon a smaller scale are the scenes from childhood opus fifteen of which there are thirteen little pieces each with an explanatory title such as playing tag happy enough dreams parentheses traumerei in this direction schumann often composed at a later period of his life there is the album for the young opus sixty eight containing forty-three short pieces all with titles the twenty album leaves opus one twenty four and the forest scenes with titles like the entrance the hunter on the lookout solitary flowers prophetic bird hunting song etc schumann's greatness as a composer for the pianoforte both from a technical and poetic standpoint is shown in such works as the etude symphonique the kreisleriana and the concerto in a minor the first of these works is regarded by many as the most satisfactory of any of this author's works it consists of an air nine variations and a finale which is in rondo form the variations however are fantasies rather than variations the theme itself appearing very little in any of them and in some of them not at all it would be impossible to find within the same compass a similar number of pages covering so wide a range of beautiful pianoforte effects and highly suggestive and poetic music 
in the fantasia in c schumann's fancy takes on a more serious mood he treats the piano with great freedom requiring of the player a powerful touch and much refinement of tone color as well as a style of technique which he himself has largely created the second movement of this the march tempo represents schumann's imagination in a forcible light in two directions its bold strong moods and its deeply subjective meditative activity the kreisleriana consists of eight fantasies named after an old schoolmaster near leipzig noted for his eccentricities this work was coldly received when first produced but later has become very popular the best movements are the first and second but the entire work is strong the concerto in a minor is by no means a showpiece for the piano but an extremely vigorous and poetic improvisation in which the solo and orchestral instruments answer each other and work together in a furor of inspiration the entire art of modern piano playing is indebted to schumann for some of its most impressive elements he was fond of playing with the dampers raised and might well contest the honor with liszt of having originated the modern style of pedal legato as distinguished from the finger legato of chopin and all the early writers he seems to have discovered the touch which mason called elastic that made by shutting the hand and at the same time allowing the wrist to remain flexible in quite a number of his pieces this effect is very marked as the first number of kleiseriana the first of the night pieces and especially the fourth of these where the chords are purposely spread beyond the octave in order to necessitate their being struck with the finger and arm touch combined in the same manner as that illustrated on a larger scale in the eleventh study of chopin's opus ten indeed if one were to attempt to characterize the schumann technique by some one of its more prominent features the free use of the arm would be perhaps the one best representing the depth and sonority of tone required for these effects but while schumann demands broad deep elastic tone color for the stronger moments in his work there is no other writer so desirous as he of the soft full mysterious tone representing what he was fond of calling inikite parentheses inwardness there are many minor mannerisms which have been diligently cultivated by later composers the most prominent among them being perhaps what might be called the accompaniment upon the off-beat in many of his works schumann occupies the middle ground of the piano with soft chords which are felt rather than heard and which always come in upon the half beat or the quarter beat and rarely or never upon the full accented part of a measure the differentiation of the melody from its harmonic and rhythmic background is accomplished by this great master in a beautiful manner take for instance the romance in f sharp opus twenty eight number two the melody of the first strophe of this exquisite music might have been written for church it is a duet for baritones the voices being represented by the thumbs of the player against this melody the quarter notes and eighths there is an accompaniment in sixteenths covering two octaves and a third the entire effect being soft and distant in the second strophe the soprano voice takes the melody which is supported by rare harmonies and a lovely figuration in the alto the third strophe brings back again the principal subject and a splendid climax is made after which an elaborate coda concludes the work it is impossible to play this lovely piece with good effect without the schumann technique played with the mozart technique it would be simply insipid and with a beethoven technique it would still be dry and harsh it is only by the combination of the arm touch for the melody the very obscure unobtrusive finger touch for the accompaniment and the constant use of the pedal for promoting blending of tones that the vague and poetic atmosphere of this piece can be realized
schumann might also be credited with the invention of a new style of composition or of music thinking the element of canonic imitation occurs in his works in wholly new form a single phrase or motive is repeated through nearly an entire movement in a thousand different forms and transformations so that the whole movement is made up from this single germ and yet with such mastery of rhythm and of harmony as to conduct the thought to a powerful climax without any impression of monotony interfering with it one can hardly go amiss in the large works of schumann for illustrations of this style of composition take for example the novelette in b minor opus ninety nine the novelette in e major opus twenty one number seven the first of the chrysleriana and many other parts of the same work this style i have elsewhere called the thematic as distinguished from the lyric in which a flowing melody is a distinctive trait beethoven in a number of cases employs a style of thought development somewhat similar but the results accomplished are tamer than with schumann one of the most striking examples is found in the finale of the sonata in d minor opus thirty one number two and in the first movement of the sonata in c minor opus one eleven in this point of view schumann appears as the predecessor of wagner who almost certainly took his departure for thematic work from schumann if it were not for these numerous highly poetic and masterly compositions for pianoforte solo and for the chamber pieces the symphonies and other large works schumann would have been entitled to a very eminent place among composers by his songs alone these are as different as possible from those of previous writers excepting schubert and the voice itself is not always well considered in them but there are no other works in this department in which the poetic sentiment is so thoroughly reproduced in the music as schumann has done it in his woman's love and life and in poet's love and in many single songs of other sets the spring night being a very marked example if the future should chance to produce a race of poetic and intelligent singers these songs will be found among the most effective which the whole literature of music can show some of them are already well and favorably known in all parts of the world the excellencies of schumann as a songwriter are only in part reproduced in his larger works in the form of cantatas and in the opera of genoveva he was without the technique of chorus construction and writes injudiciously for voices in mass his instrumentation although graphically conceived is not cleverly worked out in consequence of which we find in such works as the pilgrimage of the rose paradise and the peri the faust music and the opera of genoveva some extremely brilliant suggestions and contrasts and occasionally fine moments intermingled with many others which fail for want of technical skill in the use of the performing material the same restriction may be applied to the orchestral and chamber works in spite of the inherent force and beauty of the ideas they contain in the symphony for example he writes badly for the violins the very soul of the orchestra the phrases are short staccato notes abound and scarcely in an entire score have the violinists the long sustained phrases where the singing power of this beautiful instrument appears the best of the chamber pieces are those in which the piano is the principal instrument especially the great quintet this is a master work of a very high order and while the strings do not have the consideration that belongs to them the pianoforte is treated with so much freedom and power as in a great measure to compensate for this lack 
of the schumann works as a whole the most striking characteristic is the spontaneous improvistic effect every schumann piece that is to say every successful schumann piece has the character of an improvisation in which the power and fancy of the composer are as marked as his deep tenderness and sentiment fine instinct for poetic effect and a delicate ear for tone color for this reason the popular appreciation of the schumann works upon a large scale is only a question of an educated generation there are many indications of progress in this direction on the part of musical amateurs the world over in schumann's lifetime and immediately after his death the neglect of his compositions was extreme dr william mason narrates that when he visited leipzig in eighteen fifty one of the first symphonies he heard was schumann's in b flat the first composition of this writer he had ever heard the beauty and force of the work took complete possession of him a new world of tone was opened to him he dreamed of the schumann symphony all night and at early morning went down to breitkopf and hertels to inquire whether this man schumann had written anything for the piano the salesman laid before him a few dusty compositions off the shelves the young american asked is that all more were produced is that all he asked again whereupon the salesman discovering that he had a schumann enthusiast to deal with took advantage of the moment and in the cellar showed him whole editions of schumann pianoforte pieces tied up in bundles exactly as they had come from the printers liszt in some of his earlier concerts attempted to patronize the schumann compositions their style however was so different from the sensationalism of his own pieces or the sentiment of chopin that the public failed to appreciate them and the pianist dropped them nevertheless there were reasons why liszt ought to have played these works the schumann technique is not sensational like that of liszt but it has with it one element in common already referred to the pedal legato and no pianist at that time was so well prepared to recognize and interpret this element as liszt if he had realized his opportunity in person schumann was of medium height inclining to corpulency with a very soft and gentle walk and a most invincible habit of silence old residents of leipzig remember his visits to the rehearsals at the gewandhaus where for a whole evening he would sit with his handkerchief held over his mouth never speaking a word to any one from the beginning to the end and going away as silently as he came nevertheless it was universally recognized that upon these occasions schumann heartily enjoyed himself and to use his own words again he and the music perfectly understood one another his mind was intensely active and fanciful this is seen in all his pieces the rapidity of the musical thought the strong contrasts of mood the proximity of remote chords and modulations are all indications of this mental trait it was this also which finally destroyed him his mind became unbalanced and after intermittent attacks of melancholy his life ended with two years almost entire oblivion of reason in spite of his comparative unpopularity in his own day no one of the romantic masters has left so strong an impression upon the composers who came after him in my opinion the four great names which have been most operative in establishing forms of musical thought and in creating wholly original and highly poetic and masterly tone poems by means of those forms are bach beethoven schumann and wagner and each one of the earlier masters has in his work the prophecy of most of the qualities of those who come after while each of the later reflects the characteristics traits of his predecessors end of chapter thirty six chapter thirty seven of a popular history of the art of music from the earliest times until the present by w s b matthews this librivox recording is in the public domain italian opera during the nineteenth century 
the strongest personality of the italian composers though by no means the loveliest at the beginning of the nineteenth century was that of gasparo spontini seventeen seventy four eighteen fifty one he was born of peasant stock in the roman states and educated at naples where his boyish successes were made in eighteen o three he went to paris where he composed several operas with very poor success nevertheless having full confidence in his own powers he was not discouraged and in eighteen o four his one act opera of milton was performed successfully at the theatre Fédo he had already begun his la vestale which was brought out in eighteen o seven and immediately achieved a remarkable success spontini was appointed compositeur particulier to the empress josephine in spite of which an oratorio of his was hissed from the stage in holy week of the same year that his vestale had been so favorably received the popularity of the vestal continued to grow so that it had been performed more than two hundred times in paris before eighteen twenty four in italy and germany where its career began in eighteen eleven its popularity was similar his next opera was fernan cortez eighteen o nine afterward materially improved these two works mark the highest point reached by spontini they are brilliant martial vigorous and spectacular and the legitimate predecessors of the meyerbeer grand operas spontini's smaller works failed and in eighteen nineteen negotiations were concluded with king william the third who had been impressed with la vestale when he had visited paris whereby for twenty years spontini was made director-general of the opera in berlin in this position he produced a number of other works the best being nurmahal eighteen twenty two alcidor eighteen twenty five and agnes von hohenstaufen eighteen twenty nine spontini was a vigorous director but unprincipled vain and narrow nevertheless at his concerts he produced the fifth and seventh symphonies of beethoven for the first time in berlin as well as parts of the great bach mass in b minor and much other great music opposition to his tyranny culminated in eighteen forty two by his dismission from the directorship meyerbeer being his successor his popularity paled from the production of weber's der freischutz in eighteen twenty one spontini died in his native town of majolitat the italian composer most famous in the earlier part of the century was joachino antonio rossini seventeen ninety two eighteen sixty eight a native of pesaro a small town on the adriatic after a short course at the conservatory of verona the boy commenced to compose and no less than thirteen short pieces preceded his first really popular opera tancredi which was produced at la fenice in venice in eighteen thirteen the success of this work led to many others among which the best known are the italian in algiers the turk in italy and in eighteen sixteen no less than five operas in one year torvaldo e dorlisca the barber of seville la gazzetta and otello his first serious opera he composed with the utmost facility the barber one of the most successful operas ever performed and one of rossini's works which bids fair to outlast the rest was composed and mounted within a month for this work he received eighty pounds sterling it was not at first successful in eighteen twenty three he brought out semiramide which was only moderately successful at first the next turn in rossini's fortune found him in london where he had accepted an engagement with the manager of king's theatre and here he produced a number of his former works with moderate success 
rossini himself appeared upon the stage and sang the solos in a cantata which he had composed in honor of the king george the fourth he turned many honest pennies during his london engagement by acting as accompanist at private soirees for a fee of fifty pounds at the end of five months he found himself in possession of seven thousand pounds with which he made a graceful retreat to paris where he accepted the the musical direction of the Théâtre Italien at the salary of eight hundred pounds per year. This was in 1826. After the expiration of his engagement at this theater, several of his works were produced at the Grand Opera, among which were the Siege of Corinth and Moise march twenty seven eighteen twenty seven this work which is given in england as an oratorio was a revised edition of his opera of mose which he had written for naples five years before the most taking number in it is the famous prayer which has been played and sung in every form possible for a popular melody the operatic career of rossini ended in eighteen twenty nine with the production of his opera of william tell at the paris academie with a brilliant cast in this work he forswears florid writing and makes a serious effort at dramatic characterization the opera is extremely melodious and a very great advance over any of his former productions having now accumulated a fortune he retired from the stage and lived the remainder of his life near paris in elegant leisure composing a solemn mass and a few other sacred works but no other operas in reviewing the career of this singularly gifted italian melodist it is impossible to resist the conclusion that his talents were worthy of a nobler development among his sacred works the stabat mater is the most popular it contains some very beautiful chromatic writing and is really an artwork of a distinguished merit his latest work was the mes solonel eighteen sixty four rossini was fond of good living very witty in conversation and his house was frequented by the most brilliant wits and the best artists of the thirty years between william tell and his death upon the whole the most brilliant master of italian opera during this period was gaetano donizetti seventeen ninety seven eighteen forty eight who was born at bergamo and educated at naples his first opera was produced in vienna in eighteen eighteen but his first complete success was anna bolena which was written for milan in eighteen thirty the principal parts having been taken by pasta and rubini soon after this followed l'elisir d'amore eighteen thirty two lucia di la marmor naples eighteen thirty five lucrezia borgia eighteen thirty four belisario eighteen thirty six poliuto eighteen thirty eight la fille du regiment eighteen forty la favorita linda di chamouni eighteen forty two don pasquale eighteen forty three besides these well-known works there were many others the total number reaching sixty-three brought out in various italian theaters and in paris donizetti's traits as a composer are pleasant melody effective concerted pieces as for instance the sextet in lucia which is perhaps the best concerted piece in italian opera and a good constructive ability like rossini he was a writer of florid music and lucia remains one of the favorite numbers of coloratura singers to the present day which considering that more than fifty years have intervened since it was composed is a great compliment vincenzo bellini eighteen o two eighteen thirty five was born at catania in switzerland the son of an organist he was educated at naples under zingarelli his first opera having been composed in eighteen twenty six while he was still a member of the conservatory it was bianca e fernando produced at san carlos his next work il pirata was written for la scala in milan the tenor part having been especially designed for the celebrated rubini 
among the other successful operas of this composer were i capuletti e i montecchi in eighteen thirty la sonnambula eighteen thirty one at la scala norma and i puritani it was this latter work which contains a brilliant duet for two basses suona la tromba of which rossini wrote from paris to a friend at milan it is unnecessary for me to write of the duet for two basses you must have heard it bellini was essentially a melodist a lyric composer of idealic naivete of dramatic power he had very little his orchestration is simple although frequently very sonorous if he had lived to the age of donizetti or of rossini it is not impossible that much greater works would have emanated from his pen for in his next great successor we have an example of such a growth under conditions less favorable than those promised in bellini's case the most vigorous of all the italian composers of this epoch is giuseppe verdi who was born at roncoli october ninth eighteen thirteen his father having been a small innkeeper the boy was of a quiet melancholy character with one passion music and when he was seven years of age his father purchased a spinet for his practice when he was ten years old he was appointed organist of the church in his native town at this time his necessary expenditures amounted to about twenty two dollars per year and his salary as organist seven dollars and twenty cents which after many urgent appeals was increased to eight dollars in addition he had certain perquisites from weddings and funerals amounting to about ten dollars per year in this way he continued until he was sixteen having by this time become conductor of a philharmonic society and the composer of quite a number of works at the little town of Duceto he went to milan where he was refused admission to the conservatory on the ground of his showing no special aptitude for music nevertheless he persevered in his chosen vocation receiving lessons from rolla the conductor of la scala he studied diligently for two years mozart's don giovanni being a part of his daily exercise after this he returned for five years to his country life and by the time he was twenty-five he was back again in milan in the hope of securing the performance of his opera oberto this for quite a long time he was unable to do but at length in eighteen thirty nine it was performed at la scala the moderate success of this work secured him an engagement to produce an opera every eight months for milan or vienna but his first work a comic opera which the managers demanded un giorno di regno was a dead failure and disgusted the composer to such a point that he declared that he would never write again at this time verdi was the victim of most severe affliction in addition to poverty within the space of about two months he experienced the loss of his two children and of his wife to whom he was devotedly attached after living some time in milan he received a copy of the libretto il proscritto and in eighteen forty two it was performed it was well staged and achieved an unqualified success then followed i lombardi eighteen forty three ernani eighteen forty four i due foscari eighteen forty four attila eighteen forty six macbeth eighteen forty seven rigoletto eighteen fifty one il trovatore eighteen fifty three la traviata eighteen fifty three les vepres sicilienes eighteen fifty five un ballo in maschera eighteen fifty nine la forza del destino eighteen sixty two don carlos eighteen sixty seven aida eighteen seventy one otello eighteen eighty seven in addition to these works he has written a great requiem mass and many smaller works besides the operas above mentioned there were several others now mostly forgotten the total number being twenty-nine and there is not one of them that does not contain more or less of striking melody with effective concerted pieces and choruses verdi's melody was much more vigorous than that of either of his predecessors 
in trovatore there are ten or twelve numbers which have become famous in the barrel organ repertory his instrumentation was very full and sonorous and his dramatic instinct excellent we do not find the long roulades and ornamental passages according to the taste of his predecessors but instead of them clear sharp concise manly melodies unfortunately however they are so near the line of the vulgar that only a refined treatment on the part of the singer can save them for poetry and beauty beginning with aida a very important change can be seen in verdi's style by the time this work was undertaken the wagnerian theories were attracting general attention and it was impossible that a man of verdi's intellectual force should have failed to be affected by them aida is much more refined and dramatically truthful than any of those before it as the composer was now an old man nothing farther was expected from his pen nevertheless in otello he has given the world a masterpiece of a still higher order the music throughout being subservient to the story while the dramatic handling of the work is masterly in the extreme for this he was in part indebted to his librettist the distinguished poet and composer signor arrigo boito the strangest thing in regard to verdi is that at the present writing eighteen ninety one he is engaged upon a comic opera falstaff a subject which he says has interested him for about forty years but which until now he has never had time to undertake as a man and a patriot verdi is held in the highest possible honor in italy and for his own original genius as displayed in his works and especially in his aptitude for progress no less than for his dignified and simple private life he deserves to be admired as the foremost italian master of the present century one of the most earnest among italian composers and musicians is arrigo boito eighteen forty two who from an origin which is german from his mother's side possesses an earnestness and force in music not usual in southern lands after composing two cantatas which had a good success his grand opera of mephistophele was produced at milan in eighteen sixty eight and later in other leading cities two more operas hero and leander and nero are not yet published m boito is equally celebrated in his own country as musician and as poet in the latter capacity he prepared his own librettos besides furnishing that of otello to verdi and la gioconda to poncielli he has published several books of poems and other operatic works as composer he partakes much of the spirit of wagner he has yet another opera nearly completed but in eighteen ninety one little is known of it it is called orestiade amilcare poncielli eighteen thirty four eighteen sixty six is generally regarded in italy as having been the most distinguished italian composer after verdi he was educated at milan but his early triumphs were made elsewhere his famous i promessi sposi having been performed there only in eighteen seventy two his principal works are the preceding which was composed in eighteen fifty six la savoyarda eighteen sixty one roderico eighteen sixty four la stella del monte eighteen sixty seven la gioconda his masterwork produced at la scala eighteen seventy six and marion de lorme eighteen eighty five his music occupies a middle ground between the melodiousness of the italian composers of the early part of the century and the seriousness of later german opera in spite of the few examples reaching foreign countries there is a continuous and rather abundant production of light and serious operas in italy every principal theatre making it a point to bring out one or more new works every season the best of these after a long interval become known abroad it is a great mistake to suppose that the few italian operas of recent date performed in england and america adequately represent the present state of italian art End of chapter thirty seven
chapter thirty eight of a popular history of the art of music from the earliest times until the present by w s b matthews this librivox recording is in the public domain french operatic composers of the nineteenth century in the earlier part of the nineteenth century the operatic stage of paris shared with those of berlin and dresden the honor of producing brilliant novelties by the best composers in france there had been a persistent cultivation of this province of musical creation and many talented composers have appeared upon the scene of the grand opera and that of the opera comique french opera has developed into a genre of its own rhythmically well regulated instrumented in a pleasing and attractive manner and staged with considerable reference to spectacular display the oldest of these masters to achieve distinction and the one most successful in gaining the ear of other countries than france was daniel francois esprit Aubet seventeen eighty two eighteen seventy he was born in caen in normandy of a family highly gifted and artistic in temperament nevertheless his father intended him for a merchant and sent him to england in eighteen o four in the hope that the study of commercial success there might wean him from his love of music but the boy came back more musical than ever after composing several pieces a little opera a mass etc his first opera to be publicly performed was le Séjour militaire during the fifteen years next following he wrote a succession of light operas for the smaller theatres of paris most of them with librettos by scribe no one of these works had more than a temporary success and the names are not sufficiently important to be given here at length in eighteen twenty eight he produced his masterwork la muette di portici otherwise known as masaniello which at once placed its author upon the pinnacle of fame this was an opera upon the largest scale and was the first in order of the three great master works which adorned the paris stage during this and the three years following the others were rossini's tell in eighteen twenty nine and meyerbeer's robert in eighteen thirty one the subject was fortunately related to the spirit of the times masaniello having been leader of the insurgents in naples the work well deserved its success since for melody and pleasing effects it has rarely been surpassed the overture is still much played as a concert number but the opera itself has nearly left the stage excepting in germany where it still has a distinguished place all his later works were lighter than masaniello they were la fiancée eighteen twenty nine the extremely melodious and popular fra diavolo eighteen thirty and many others for more than twenty years still among them were the bronze horse in eighteen thirty five le domino noir in eighteen thirty seven and the crown diamonds eighteen thirty one obey was elected member of the institute in eighteen twenty nine and in eighteen forty two succeeded cherubini as director of the conservatory he was an extremely witty and charming man beloved by all contemporaneous with obey but more allied to the genius of boieldieu was louis joseph ferdinand Hérold, after studying at the conservatory and composing a number of operas which failed or had but moderate success he brought out zampa in eighteen thirty one this work had an extraordinary success and its overture is still often heard another work le pre au clair eighteen thirty two is generally esteemed in france more highly than zampa but outside his native country public opinion universally regards the latter as his best work Hérault's operas are extremely well conceived from a dramatic point of view and his melody has much of the sweet and flowing quality of the best italian his concerted numbers also are well made and in all respects he is to be regarded as a master of high rank within the province of light opera verging indeed upon the confines of the romantic type like that of weber 
the true successor of boieldieu with perhaps somewhat less of originality was adolphe charles adam 1803-1856, son of a piano teacher in the conservatory at Paris. His most lasting work was Le Postillon de Longjumeau, 1836, in which the German tenor Wachtel made himself so famous. Most of the other productions of this clever but not deep composer are now forgotten. In their day they pleased the most important work of the last half century of french opera was the faust of charles francois gounod eighteen eighteen produced in eighteen fifty nine gounod was born and educated at paris took the prize of rome in eighteen thirty seven after composing quite a number of works of a semi-religious character in which direction he has always had a strong bias his first opera was produced in eighteen fifty four la nonne sanglante in eighteen fifty two he was made director of the orpheonistes the male part singers of paris numbering many thousands somewhat answering to the organization of the tonic sol fa in england faust made an epoch in french opera its rich and sensuous music its love melodies of melting tenderness and the cleverness of the instrumentation as well as its pleasing character combine to place it in a category by itself this was the beginning and the end of gounod for in his other works while there is much cleverness and melodiousness there is also much reminder of faust perhaps the best of his later operas are romeo et juliette eighteen sixty seven and mireille eighteen sixty four among the others were saint mars polyeucte le tribut de zamora he has also written an oratorio the redemption produced at birmingham in eighteen eighty two many numbers in which are truly imposing as a whole the work is mystical and sensuous rather than strong or inspired a continuation of this work morse et vita was given at birmingham in eighteen eighty five and the following year several times in america under the direction of mr theodore thomas in this work a part of the text of which consists of the latin hymn dies ire gounod contrives to repeat certain of the sensational effects of berlioz's work both these oratorios belong to an intermediate category in oratorio sensational effects possible only in the concert room intervening with others planned entirely in a devotional and mystic spirit as a composer gounod has two elements of strength he is first of all a lyrical composer of unusual merit as can be seen in his oh that we two were maying nazareth there is a green hill far away etc his second element of greatness is his talent for well-sounding and deliciously blending instrumentation in which respect he is one of the best representatives of the french school this quality is happily shown upon a small scale in connection with the other already mentioned in his famous ave maria with violin and organ obligato superimposed upon the first prelude in bach's well-tempered clavier unfortunately his structural ability is not equal to the strain of elaborate dramatic works in which the interest greatly depends upon the music following the complications of the drama in faust and in all his other operas the songs are the main attraction the songs and the choruses the finales are poorly constructed with little invention and less progress of dramatic intensity among the better composers of the later french school was felix marie victor massé eighteen twenty two to eighteen eighty four who experienced the usual fortunes of the better class of french composers having taken the prize of rome in eighteen forty four and produced his first opera la chanteuse voilée in eighteen fifty which was followed by his galatea in eighteen fifty two and the marriage of jeannette in eighteen fifty three 
encouraged by these successes he produced a large number of operas in italy of which the best were la reine topaz eighteen fifty six and les saisons eighteen fifty five in eighteen sixty he became chorus master at the academy of music and in eighteen sixty six professor of composition at the conservatory in eighteen seventy two he was elected to the institute as successor of Aubé in addition to the works already mentioned he produced paul and virginia eighteen sixty six and several others besides a number of songs his last opera le mort de cleopatre was written during his long sickness and on the whole was not a success another pleasing french composer is jules emile frederic massenet eighteen forty two who took the prize of rome in eighteen sixty three and in eighteen sixty seven produced his first opera la grande tante in addition to this he composed a number of operas le roi de laure eighteen seventy seven marie madeleine eighteen seventy three an oratorio and eve in eighteen seventy five he has also written a number of orchestral suites which have been very popular in all countries his latest work l'hommage was produced at the grand opera paris march eighteen ninety one one of the most brilliant and versatile of the french musicians of this generation is m camille saint saon eighteen thirty five a virtuoso upon the piano and organ and an orchestral tone poet of very rare quality educated in the conservatory he composed his first symphony when he was sixteen and was organist of the church of st marie at the age of eighteen in eighteen fifty eight he became organist at the madeleine he has produced a number of operas of which le timbre d'argent eighteen eighty seven samson and delilah eighteen seventy seven and etienne marcel eighteen seventy nine henry the eighth eighteen eighty three and ascanio produced in eighteen ninety at the grand opera in addition to these saint saon has produced a large number of orchestral pieces including le mouet d'onfal le danse macabre and other symphonic poems of the programme character he has also written several oratorios of which the deluge is the most important and a large amount of chamber and pianoforte music he is a brilliant writer about music he is favorably known in germany and all the rest of europe as a virtuoso upon the piano and organ his second concerto for piano is one of the best virtuoso pieces for that instrument in his melodie et harmonie a collection of newspaper essays he discusses many interesting questions his fame with posterity is more likely to rest upon his orchestral pieces which are extremely clever and interesting than upon his operas personally he is said to be very witty and entertaining he has been a member of the institute since eighteen seventy four another french composer versatile and well gifted in orchestral composition is clement philibert leo de libre eighteen forty eight after his education at the conservatory and his service as an accompanist at the grand opera he received in eighteen sixty six a commission to compose a ballet la source in which he displayed such a wealth of melody and such fortunate rhythm that his talent was henceforth unmistakable he has since composed a large number of ballets many of which are known in all parts of the world such as sylvia also a large number of songs his principal opera was lacme eighteen eighty three he is a professor at the conservatory a member of the legion of honor and the successor of victor massé at the institute still another very talented composer of orchestral music is edouard victor antoine lalot eighteen twenty three who was originally a violinist in a favorite string quartet he has composed a large amount of orchestral music a violin concerto in f eighteen seventy four symphonie espagnole eighteen seventy five for violin and orchestra a rhapsody norvegienne and many other orchestral works besides several operas of which the roi dix eighteen eighty eight is the most important 
he received the cross of the legion of honor in eighteen eighty and is one of the best of the french composers many of his works have been played by theodore thomas georges bizet eighteen thirty eight eighteen seventy five is best known as the composer of carmen eighteen seventy five he had previously produced a considerable number of smaller works which had been but moderately successful in carmen however he showed qualities of rhythmic and harmonic coloration which promised brilliant results in the future his career was prematurely cut short by death he was a fine pianist the nestor of still living french composers is m charles amboise thomas eighteen eleven born at metz in the same year as liszt and only one and two years after schumann and chopin this venerable and highly gifted master early succeeded in catching the ear of the french public and between eighteen thirty seven when his la double echelle was performed at the opera comique until eighteen forty eight he produced a succession of charming light pieces in the taste of the day there was a sort of middle period in which he wrote several very witty works for the same stage but the time of his greatest career dates from the production of mignon eighteen sixty six hamlet eighteen sixty eight and francesca da rimini eighteen eighty two he was elected to the institute in eighteen fifty one and at aubey's death in eighteen seventy one was made director of the conservatoire in which important position he has accomplished much toward systematizing and deepening musical education m thomas is a highly cultivated man of the world tall slender fond of physical exercise he has retained the faculties of an active and very versatile mind to an old age his opera of mignon is probably the one of his productions which will last longest a french opera as a whole during this century the general characterization may be made that it has gained in cosmopolitan quality nearly all the composers mentioned in the present chapter having gained a world-wide fame the distinguishing feature of this class of opera is its sprightly rhythm and the clearness of the melodic forms the instrumentation also is generally clever the music is pleasing rather than deep and the popularity of french opera in germany for example is mainly due to its value as a relief to the often undue elaboration of the original german article End of chapter 38chapter thirty nine of a popular history of the art of music from the earliest times until the present by w s b matthews this librivox recording is in the public domain later composers and performers before summing up the remaining names of musical history a brief retrospect over the present century may be in place the first quarter of the nineteenth century was distinguished by two composers of the first order beethoven and schubert and by a large number of highly gifted lesser artists some of whom such as spohr and weber bid fair to remain long enrolled in the list of immortals the second quarter of the century was made memorable by the rise and blossoming into full glory of the romantic school all the works of this school excepting a few of the earlier of mendelssohn having been produced during this period mendelssohn schumann chopin and the young wagner were the active spirits of this time and their productions not only enriched the store of the world's tone poetry but changed the general direction of musical ideals in many ways the great feature of the third quarter of the century was the conception and execution of the wagnerian music drama with its wealth of sense incitation and its somber appeal to accumulated experiences of the race the ring of the nibelungen was completed during this period and received its first performance at bayreuth in eighteen seventy six during the same period franz liszt had conceived a modification of the symphony form bringing its four movements into a single one or uniting the different movements if such there were by means of motives common to all or several of them 
in this way a certain novelty was attainable in the most important province of instrumental music and while the new compositions generally acknowledged their indebtedness to external incitation by titles such as what one sees from a mountain the battle of the huns romeo and juliet and the like there was nothing to prevent them being in the fullest sense musical works having a musical life as such wholly independent of the suggestion given by the title berlioz had been the founder of program music and his leading works had been produced during the second quarter of the century but their full force was not recognized until later it was a follower of liszt the brilliant frenchman camille saint saon who stated the central thesis of the whole romantic school when he said that a composer had the same right to affix a title to his work in order to give it a pleasing standpoint for judging it as a painter had to name his picture and in the case of music he added as in that of painting the real question finally was not whether the suggestion of the title had been fully satisfied but whether the picture were good painting and the composition good music if it were good music no flaw in the title and no disagreement between the title and the work could impair its value and lasting quality when carefully scrutinized the progress of music during the present century has been governed by certain leading principles which are not contradictory although at first glance they might appear so since the time of the netherlandish contrapuntists the primary impulse in musical creation has been the musical ideal the creation of tonal fancies novel inspiring musical satisfactory out of this desire has arisen the entire fabric of fugue sonata symphony and the whole world of free music and at every period there have been those also who sought to connect these tonal fancies with the inner life of the spirit to awaken feeling inspire imagination deepen dramatic impression in short to give us in place of irresponsible tonal crystallizations a poetically conceived discourse operative upon the feelings and stimulative to the entire mind this was the ideal of the new movement in italy at the beginning of the seventeenth century and opera has steadily worked along this ideal sebastian bach had moments when he himself attempted the program music and beethoven made many attempts of the same kind some of which are significant and lasting hence the romantic impulse was not something new in the history of music but the blossoming of buds from seeds planted long before the program music of berlioz was simply larger and more flamboyant than the little exercises of bach in the same direction wagner's idea of bringing together the entire resources of musical dramatic and scenic art into a single highly complex work was merely the idea of the unity of all the arts upon which aeschylus worked two thousand years earlier and upon which jacopo peri and claudio monteverdi worked at the beginning of the seventeenth century in short the art of music while in this century being enriched by a multitude of new creations representing a variety of subordinate ideals is nevertheless still a unity constantly becoming more elaborate and masterly upon the tonal side and continually more and more in touch with the deeper springs of duration in art the intuitively realized correspondence between certain art forms and modes of expression and human feeling the composers of the last quarter of the century are very numerous indeed so numerous that a catalogue even of their names would occupy too much space moreover their proximity to our own times brings them too near for successfully estimating their places in the pantheon of art or even for the much simpler task of deciding upon certain names which undoubtedly should occupy places in the list for present purposes it will be more convenient to notice them by nationalities since every racial stock has certain individualities and ideals which the national composers eventually bring into art as we see brilliantly illustrated in the case of the russians both in music and in painting there are however certain names which stand out above all others and at the present writing appear destined for place among or very near the immortals of the first order these great names are those of johannes brahms camille saint saon p 
peter ilich tchaikowsky antonin dvorak and edvard grieg part one music in germany in germany very naturally the activity in the higher departments of music remains more intense than in any other country and the seat of musical empire may be said to still abide in southern germany where it was established by haydn mozart and beethoven the most eminent living composer in the higher department of the art johannes brahms resides at vienna since these many years there also max bruch long resided and there the greatest of the light opera composers the strauss family and von suppe have lived and worked it is in the provinces of the austro-hungarian empire moreover that the bohemian composer dvorak has his home in johannes brahms eighteen thirty three we have still living a musical master of the first order whose quality as master is shown in his marvelous technique in which respect no recent composer is to be mentioned as his superior if any can be named since bach his equal this technique was at first personal at the pianoforte upon which he was a virtuoso of phenomenal rank but this renown great as it is in well-informed circles sinks into insignificance beside his marvelous ability at marshalling musical periods elaborating together the most dissimilar and apparently incompatible subjects and his powers of varying a given theme and of unfolding from it ever something new these wonderful gifts for such they were rather than laboriously acquired attainments brahms showed at the first moment when the light of musical history shines upon him it was in eighteen fifty three when the hungarian violinist eduard remenyi found him at hamburg and engaged him as accompanist and having ascertained his astonishing talents brought him a young man of twenty to list at weimar with his first trio and certain other compositions in manuscript the new talent made a prodigious effect upon liszt who needed not that any one should certify to him whether a composer had genius or merely talent the liszt circle took up the brahms cult in earnest played the trio at the chamber concerts and the members when they departed to their homes generally carried with them their admiration of this new personality which had appeared in music johannes brahms was born at hamburg may seventh eighteen thirty three the son of a fine musician who was player upon the double bass in the orchestra there the boy was always intended for a musician and his instruction was taken in hand with so much success that at the age of fourteen he played in public pieces by bach and beethoven and a set of original variations at the age of twenty he was a master and it was in this year that he accompanied remenyi made the acquaintance of joachim and liszt and had a rarely appreciative notice from a master no less than robert schumann himself who in his new journal of music said he has come a youth at whose cradle graces and heroes kept watch sitting at the piano he began to unveil wonderful regions we were drawn into more and more magical circles by his playing full of genius which made of the piano an orchestra of lamenting and jubilant voices there were sonatas or rather veiled symphonies songs whose poetry might be understood without words piano pieces both of a demoniac nature and of the most graceful form sonatas for piano and violin string quartets each so different from every other that they seem to flow from many different springs whenever he bends his magic wand there when the powers of the orchestra and the chorus lend him their aid further glimpses of the magical world will be revealed to us may the highest genius strengthen him meanwhile the spirit of modesty dwells within him his comrades greet him at his first entrance into the world of art where wounds may perhaps await him but bay and laurel also we welcome him as a valiant warrior the next few years were spent by brahms in directing orchestra and chorus at detmold and elsewhere and in switzerland which has always had great attraction for him in eighteen fifty nine he played in leipzig his first great piano concerto most of the criticisms thereon were however such as now excite mirth 
lately he has played in leipzig again conducted several of his works and was greeted with the reverence and enthusiasm due the greatest living representative of the art of music in eighteen sixty two brahms located in vienna where he has almost ever since resided mr lewis kestelborn in famous composers and their works says about thirty years ago the writer first saw brahms in his swiss home at that time he was of a rather delicate slim-looking figure with a beardless face of ideal expression since then he has changed in appearance until now he looks the very image of health being stout and muscular the noble manly face surrounded by a full gray beard the writer well remembers singing under his direction watching him conduct orchestra rehearsals hearing him play alone or with orchestra listening to an after-dinner speech or private conversation observing him while attentively listening to other works and seeing the modest smile with which he accepted or rather declined expressions of admiration the most important works of brahms aside from his german requiem are four symphonies for orchestra two concertos for piano a concerto for violin and cello with orchestra a violin concerto many songs a variety of compositions for chamber embracing a number for unusual combinations of instruments such as clarinet and horn with piano sonatas for piano solo etc in the songs he attains a simple and direct expression not surpassed in musical quality since schubert and schumann in the concertos he is more for music than for display which is merely to say that in conceiving the display of his solo instrument he has sought rather to display it at its best in a musical sense than to exhibit its peculiar tricks of dexterity as a symphonist he follows classic form and is more successful than any other writer in the slow movements a department in which most of the later writers are distinctly weak since in an idealized folk song which is the essential ideal of the symphonic slow movement poverty of imagination cannot be concealed by dexterity of thematic treatment and modulation as a writer for the pianoforte he has made important enlargements of the technique not alone in his arrangement of easier compositions by earlier writers but still more by original demands upon the fingers as illustrated in his great sets of variations distinguished among german composers is max bruck eighteen thirty eight who was born at cologne and educated there and almost everywhere else in germany bruck is best known by his works for chorus with orchestra of which fritjof a roman song of triumph the song of three kings odysseus armenius are best known his concerto for violin is also played in all parts of the world but his opera of hermione made but a moderate success at berlin in eighteen seventy two riemann considers his greatest works for mixed chorus to be odysseus and armenius the song of the bell and for male chorus fritjof salamis and the normans his style is closely wrought musical full of deep and natural musical expression and well-colored instrumentation anton bruckner eighteen twenty four a highly gifted organist and composer has written seven symphonies in which the style is very modern and shows the influence of the theatrical style of wagner he is a composer of considerable vigor part two music in russia the awakening of musical art has been remarkable in all parts of the civilized world and in many countries not previously distinguished in music composers have arisen who have embodied the rhythms and spirit of the national songs in their works composed dramatic works upon national subjects and so have created a national school of music in some cases the works of these men have proven of world-wide acceptance in others they have set in operation musical life in their own country and have been followed quickly by younger composers working in a more cosmopolitan vein who have created works which have been taken into the current of the world's music and bid fair to hold an honorable position in the pantheon 
one of the most brilliant cases of this kind is russia that country so vast so powerful so mysterious the first composer in russia to distinguish himself and to create a national opera was mikhail ivanovich glinka eighteen o three eighteen seventy seven readers note another source shows the dates as eighteen o four to eighteen fifty seven born near selna his first schooling was at the adels institute in st petersburg where he distinguished himself in languages but presently under the teaching of Böhm upon the violin and karl meyer in pianoforte and theory he showed the musical stuff which was in him leaving russia for his health he resided four years in italy constantly studying and incessantly composing on his way back to russia he placed himself for a time under the teaching of the distinguished s den in berlin in theory den recognized his originality and encouraged him to write russian music his first opera a life for the czar december ninth eighteen thirty six was a great triumph the subject was national the contrast between polish and russian subjects in the music was brilliant and actual or simulated folk songs gave a local coloring highly grateful to the russian audience the work received innumerable repetitions and still remains one of the most popular operatic works upon the russian stage his next work ruslan and ludmilla was also successful and liszt who happened to be in russia at the moment of its production accorded the young composer distinguished praise berlioz took up the pen in honor of glinka and his new russian school of music and so the composer's powers were widely celebrated during the remainder of his life glinka made long residences in the south especially in spain and several orchestral works with spanish coloring represent this portion of his creative career his last years were spent in rural life near st petersburg busy with new opera projects and especially seeking some rational manner of harmonizing the russian popular songs riemann calls glinka the berlioz of russia in the originality of his invention and his clever technique and something more namely that he created a national school of music for his country the list of his works is very long embracing compositions in almost every province there are two symphonies both unfinished several dances for orchestra a number of chamber compositions of various combinations of instruments a tarantella for orchestra with song and dance la kamarinskaya etc his operas however are his lasting monument anton von rubinstein the next great name in the role of russian music is that of the pianist anton von rubinstein eighteen thirty eighteen ninety five who was born at vekvotinyes in bessarabia his father presently removed to moscow where he carried on a manufactory of lead pencils the boy anton showed such talent for music under the skillful and affectionate teaching of his mother that at the age of ten he was brought before various musical authorities in paris for opinions concerning his talent his concert life began almost immediately from this period his mother went with him and wherever there were pauses of a few days the studies were resumed exactly as had been the case with mozart long before in eighteen forty eight he found a friend and appreciative companion in the princess helene and then he wrote several operas upon russian subjects of which two were published dmitri donskoy and toms der Nar the success of these works was such that in eighteen fifty four the composer was given a subvention for further foreign study by the princess helene and count wilhorsky upon which followed four brilliant years of incessant activity as virtuoso pianist and composer extending as far as london and paris rubinstein had already lived some years in berlin where he was as well known as at home returning to russia in eighteen fifty nine he received important appointments as musical director founded the st petersburg musical conservatory of which he remained the director until eighteen sixty seven when ensued a new series of concert journeys 
covering europe and in eighteen seventy two eighteen seventy three extending to america where he had a wonderful success carrying back to russia as proceeds of the american tour the at that time unprecedented sum of fifty four thousand dollars as pianist rubinstein was distinguished for his grand style broad and noble mastery of the instrument and his consummate sympathy and innate musical quality he was a player of moods at times playing like a god at other times his work disfigured by many errors but always interesting commanding and noble he played best the compositions of beethoven and schumann their innate depth and intense musical expression appealing to his richly gifted musical nature irresistibly his personality was commanding and attractive saint saon relates how rubinstein played in paris the concertos of beethoven and of rubinstein while saint saon conducted the orchestra at the close of the concerts rubinstein desired to give yet another in which he himself would direct the orchestra while saint saon should play it was for this occasion that the saint saon second concerto was written in his later life rubinstein lived like a prince in a beautiful estate near st petersburg the list of his works is something enormous of operas and dramatic works there are twelve several of which such as the tower of babel paradise lost and moses are biblical operas a type of dramatico mystical work created by rubinstein it contains the gravity and depth of oratorio combined with the intense realism of the stage there are six symphonies of which the famous and several times enlarged ocean symphony is perhaps best known a heroic fantasia for orchestra three character pieces for orchestra faust don quixote and ivan three concerto overtures a quantity of chamber music compositions for piano songs and the like in everything of rubinstein beautiful melodies are found his weakness lies in the development which occasionally is carried too far and with insufficient vitality of thematic work even greater than rubinstein as composer was the brilliant peter ilich tchaikovsky eighteen forty eighteen ninety three tchaikovsky was intended for the profession of the law in which he took his degree but his love for music asserted itself and after a short career as pupil in the st petersburg conservatory he was appointed teacher of harmony in that institution and entered upon his career as composer here he remained but a short time resigning in eighteen seventy seven after which he lived by turns at st petersburg in italy and in switzerland tchaikovsky was of a lyric musical nature and in his early life his taste was entirely for italian music this shows to a remarkable degree in all his earlier productions even if he had not himself published the fact so often and unmistakably in eighteen sixty nine he produced his first russian opera der voivode which was followed by eight others of which the best known are eugene onegin and macula the smith several of these are now played throughout europe it was in his orchestral compositions however that tchaikovsky most illustrated his unexampled powers besides a number of brilliant and highly sensational overtures he composed six symphonies of unexampled sonority rich coloring and strange musical expression the fifth symphony of tchaikovsky met with almost universal recognition at the hands of the leading orchestral conductors of the world and the last the so-called tragic only deepened the impression of the composer's powers several points are unusual the themes themselves are original forceful and lend themselves easily to elaboration the harmonic treatment is highly original as if the author had found as bulow said new harmonic paths the instrumentation is richly colored and the climaxes are of vast power and effect the whole is a grandly composed tone poem which even if regarded as surpassing the proper reserve of symphonic form must nevertheless be counted as one of the most valuable enrichments of the world's orchestral repertory 
in several places in his works tchaikovsky introduces peculiarities of russian folk music as for example in the movement in five four measure in the fifth major symphony nevertheless the works belong to the world's music being in no sense provincial narrow or limited aesthetically considered they illustrate the quick technique and overmastering energy of the race to which the composer belonged part three music in bohemia another country in which a notable musical revival has taken place during the latter part of the present century is bohemia where two names are to be mentioned bedrich schmettena eighteen twenty four eighteen eighty four is to be remembered as the creator or at least the awakener of bohemian music after short education at the prague university schmettena entered diligently upon the study of music becoming a brilliant pianist and as such forming one of the circle of enthusiastic and advancing souls surrounding liszt at weimar between eighteen fifty and eighteen sixty his first position as musical director was at gothenberg eighteen fifty six here he lost his wife the brilliant pianist katharina kolar in eighteen sixty one he made a long concert tour to sweden in eighteen sixty six he was appointed director of the music at the national theater in prague a position which he held until obliged to give it up on account of loss of hearing in eighteen seventy four schmettena wrote eight operas upon bohemian subjects with music in the bohemian spirit one best known is the bartered bride which was the last composed he also wrote about ten symphonies or symphonic poems and a great variety of chamber music of his symphonic poems those most often played are in wallenstein's camp moldau zarka and visegrad in all these the titles are mainly suggestive although in sarka a program is quite closely followed schmettena was a brilliant composer but his value lies in his awakening of the bohemians to musical creation anton dvorak the most brilliant name in bohemian music and the one most valued by the world in general is that of anton dvorak who was the son of a butcher at mulhausen the boy early applied himself to the violin and after some years playing in small orchestras found a place as violinist in the orchestra of the national theater at prague this was at the age of nineteen about ten years later he first attracted attention as composer by means of a hymn for mixed chorus and orchestra the attention of his countrymen thus gained dvorak fastened still more by a succession of compositions of varied scope ranging from the slavic dances and slavic rhapsodies to symphonies chamber music and choral works of great brilliancy in eighteen ninety two dr dvorak was called to new york as director of the so called national conservatory of music in eighteen ninety five he returned to bohemia the choral works of dvorak were generally first written for english musical festivals the spectre's bride stabat mater saint ludmilla the list of his works includes five symphonies for full orchestra several concert overtures a very beautiful air and variations for orchestra and seven operas upon bohemian subjects dvorak is one of the most gifted composers of the present time especially in the matter of technique his thematic treatment is always clever his orchestral coloring rich and varied and his style elegant if deficiency is to be recorded concerning him it is in invention or innate weight of ideas during his residence in america he promulgated the idea that an american school of music was to be created by developing the themes and rhythms of the negro melodies and he wrote a symphony from the new world in order to illustrate his meaning the second or slow movement of this work attained a distinguished success almost everywhere but the themes of the first and last movement are not sufficient for the treatment they receive this work has been more successful in europe than in this country 
perhaps the most notable quality of dr dvorak's personality is his naivete which shows well in his music he is quite like a modern haydn who has learned and remembered everything of musical coloration which has been discovered but who applies his knowledge in a simple and direct manner without straining after effect part four music in scandinavia foremost of scandinavian composers is edvard hagerup grieg eighteen forty three who was born at bergen norway he received his early musical education from his mother who was an excellent pianist and very musical by the advice of the celebrated violinist ole Bull, grieg was sent in eighteen fifty eight to leipzig for further instruction where he became a pupil of moscheles hauptmann reinecke richter and wenzel in eighteen sixty three he pursued further studies under gade at copenhagen in companionship with a talented young composer richard nordrak grieg set himself as he says against the faded scandinavianism of gade and mendelssohn intermingled and undertook to put into tones the real beauty strength and inner spirit of the northern folk's life he composed in many varieties of work and in eighteen seventy nine attained german recognition by playing his own piano concerto at the gavant house in leipzig grieg's works are full of poetry easy and natural expression and are pervaded by northern coloring so decided as in some cases to approach what in speech is called dialect nevertheless it is indubitable that his music has distinctly enriched the world's stream of tone poetry and introduced a new accent and voice he has distinguished himself in almost every department in songs choral work chamber music symphonies sonatas for piano and piano and violin and orchestral suites of which perhaps his two peer ghent are the most celebrated in person grieg is slight fair-haired with lovely deep blue eyes and a charming manner he is subject to pulmonary weakness and is compelled to reside much of his time in warmer climates than those of his native land an older composer than grieg is niels wilhelm gade eighteen seventeen eighteen ninety of copenhagen who after a thorough musical education received in his native city attracted wider attention in eighteen forty one by taking the prize for his concert overture night sounds from ossian the judges being f r period schneider and spohr the violinist this gave gade a royal stipendium with which he immediately betook himself to study at leipzig where he came under the personal influence of mendelssohn an influence which he never outgrew at the death of mendelssohn he was appointed director of the gavant house but not proving in all respects satisfactory he held the position only a part of one season after the death of glaser in 1861 gade was made royal music director at copenhagen a position which he filled many years he was active as composer in every direction his published works embracing eight symphonies five overtures two concertos for violin and orchestra three violin sonatas several cantatas for mixed voices soli and orchestra and many other works the ultimate judgment of gade as a tone poet is likely to be that while distinctly talented he never attained imagination of the first order among the younger composers christian zindig eighteen fifty six is to be mentioned besides many works for chamber he has written one symphony which while not very original gives promise of better productions later part five music in england the relation of england to the higher art of music has been peculiar in the sixteenth century and earlier it was one of the most musical countries in europe but from the appearance of handel about seventeen twenty german music and german composers absorbed public attention to the exclusion of the natives no one of whom it may be added evinced creative powers of any high order 
england was a liberal patron of all the leading german masters from haydn who wrote twelve symphonies for the london philharmonic to beethoven whose ninth symphony was written for the same society mendelssohn whose elijah was written for the birmingham festival and wagner who received handsome compensation for conducting a series of concerts in london a little past the middle of the present century however more creative activity began to show itself among english composers until at the present time there are excellent english composers in all the leading departments of musical production the more celebrated names follow one of the most graceful and talented of english composers was sir william sterndale bennett eighteen sixteen eighteen seventy five who came of a musical stock and was duly trained as a choir boy in king's chapel and at the royal academy of music in eighteen thirty six he went to leipzig in order to profit by the gewandhaus concerts there and the friendship of mendelssohn here he produced a number of orchestral compositions which were so highly esteemed that in eighteen fifty three the directorship of the gewandhaus concerts were offered him after a short sojourn at leipzig he returned to london where he ever after lived highly honored as composer pianist teacher and man in eighteen fifty six he became the conductor of the london philharmonic concerts and in eighteen sixty six principal of the royal academy of music he was knighted in eighteen seventy one having previously been honored by degrees from cambridge and oxford he was professor of music in cambridge university from eighteen fifty six until his death as a composer bennett was influenced by mendelssohn but he had much delicacy of fancy and a certain originality of his own his compositions embrace four concertos for piano and orchestra several concert overtures for orchestra one symphony much chamber music a cantata the may queen eighteen fifty eight the woman of samaria eighteen sixty seven and a number of occasional odes anthems and part songs the successor of sterndale bennett as principal of the royal academy of music was sir george a macfarren eighteen thirteen eighteen eighty seven who although totally blind for many years before his death produced a greater number of important compositions than any other english composer of the century he was educated in london and in eighteen thirty four became one of the professors in the royal academy of music his first opera was produced in eighteen thirty eight devil's opera don quixote eighteen thirty six jesse lee eighteen sixty three and helvelin eighteen sixty four he wrote a number of cantatas for chorus and orchestra oratorios st john the baptist eighteen seventy three the resurrection eighteen seventy six joseph eighteen seventy seven and other works of less importance there are also many anthems several overtures and other pieces for chamber personally he was kind-hearted intelligent helpful and public-spirited the amount of work that he accomplished under the greatest of disadvantages is wonderful as well as its generally superior quality as a lecturer and teacher he was the foremost musical englishman of his time his compositions are strong and respectable but not especially inspired the successor of sir george macfarren in the principalship of the royal academy of music was alexander campbell mackenzie eighteen forty seven the youngest eminent english composer but also the most successful and promising he was educated as a violinist and resided at edinburgh as a teacher of the pianoforte and violin until his compositions attracted the attention of his countrymen and induced his being called to london the most important compositions of dr mackenzie up to the present time are the operas colomba eighteen eighty three the troubadour eighteen eighty six and the oratorio the rose of sharon eighteen eighty four there are several cantatas jason the bride the story of said eighteen eighty six and a considerable number of orchestral pieces of which two scotch rhapsodies and the overture to twelfth night are the best known he has also produced a violin concerto played by mr sarasate and much chamber music and songs on the whole dr mackenzie seems the most gifted english composer who has yet appeared
end of chapter thirty nine end of a popular history of the art of music from the earliest times until the present reading by tony oliva albuquerque new mexico may two thousand thirteen